the public comments today, are they written or are they videos? Good afternoon. Thank you and welcome to our July 14th biz business uh, meeting. We are holding it virtual. I want to say thank you to all of our students, staff, and the families and MTPS community that has joined us today. We hope you all continue to stay safe and healthy. As you know, we continue to meet via Zoom due to the continued guidelines associated with the pandemic. The meeting is being held live and is being streamed on the website, and you can also go to MCPS TV. We have also provided a phone number so our public can go and um, listen on the phone, and we will mute your line. And we have suspended public comments, and we are holding um, a meeting to address essential business items. At this time, before we get started, I will call roll to ensure that we have quorum. And I will start with our vice president, Ms. Wolf. Just acknowledge your presence. I'm here. Mr. Asante. I'm here. Ms. Dixon. Here. Dr. Daka. Here. Ms. O'Neill. Here. Ms. Silvestre. Here. Ms. Mondrowski. Sorry, the sheet said we were going to be unmuted um, here. <laughs> okay, and I will allow the superintendent and deputy superintendent to introduce, introduce, introduce themselves and also acknowledge who's here. Good afternoon, this is Jack Smith, superintendent, and I want to start by saying welcome to Mr. Asante for his first official board meeting. Uh, really happy to have you here, looking forward to working with you. And I will turn it over to Dr. Uh, McKnight, the Deputy Superintendent, uh, to introduce herself. Good afternoon, board members. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Monifa McKnight, Deputy Superintendent. Thank you all for joining us for our board meeting today. And again, welcome, Nick. Thank you. We have a number of members of our staff with us today as we go through the agenda items, and they will introduce themselves as they come forward and join their part of the meeting. Okay. So again, welcome, Mr. Sante. We are so happy to have you as our 43rd student member of the board. So I will um, call on board members one at a time for questions or comments. And if board members have additional comments or questions, they can let me know in the chat or let one of our staff members know that you want to speak again. We just want to do this so that we can maintain some order. And at this time, I would like to ask to get approval of the, of the revised agenda. Move approval. Is second. Is second. Is second. second. Judy. Okay. It's been moved and seconded. All in favor by a show of hands. And that is unanimous. At this time, Dr. Smith, I will turn it over to you for item um, three, human resources and development. And I will ask everybody to allow Dr. Smith to move all the resolutions and we'll do it in block at the end. Thank you, Ms. Evans. Uh, today, first of all, we have the monthly human resources report uh, that we are recommending adoption of today. Uh, so that is the first item. Um, would you like me to just go ahead with all of them first? So, yes. Okay. We also have uh, several um, resolutions that uh, remember staff members who have passed away since we uh, last met or in the last month. And I will, I will uh, recognize each of those staff members and then if, if the board would like to vote in block. And then we have an appointment uh, of one administrator that probably should be voted on individually. Right. At that time. Uh, first of all, the death uh, of Ms. Rebecca Perlman, Perry educator from Thomas Wooten High School, has saddened the staff, students, and the members of the Board of Education. Ms. Perlman worked for us for one year in the school system. She was a positive addition to the staff at Thomas Wooten High School, and she understood the impact of her position on student success. Ms. Perlman was kind and considerate. She was a team player. She worked with teachers in her department to ensure that the students received an excellent education and were college and career ready at the end of their high school uh, experience. The members of the Board of Education the Superintendent of Schools expressed their sorrow at the death of Mrs. Perlman and extend deepest sympathy to her family. We're also pausing today to remember Mr. Joseph Sanders, building service worker, 
He was at the Interagency Coordinating Board um, and Thomas S. Wooten High School. Uh, his passing has deeply saddened the staff, students, and members of the Board of Education. Mr. Sanders worked for Montgomery County Public Schools for eight years. He was a dedicated member of the Building Service Interagency Coordinating Board team at Wooten. He ensured that the building was available for use on weekends so the facility would be prepared for students for all of the activities and for all community members. Mr. Sanders was always demonstrated a kind and caring demeanor. He was available to fulfill the requests of staff, students, administrators, and community members who used the facilities. So therefore be it resolved that the members of the Board of Education and the superintendent of schools express their sorrow at the death of Mr. Sanders and extend deepest sympathy to his family. We also want to pause today and remember Ms. Letitia Cotman, a pupil personnel worker in the alternative uh, program system. Uh, her passing has deeply saddened the staff, students, and members of the Board of Education. During the 14 years that Ms. Cotman worked for Montgomery County Public Schools, she demonstrated an unwavering commitment to students through her collaborative work and her work with families, colleagues, and community partners. Ms. Cotman always communicated with families, administrators, teachers, and other stakeholders in a positive and respectful manner. These interactions fostered cooperative relationships that supported students' safety and well being. Therefore, be it resolved that the members of the Board of Education and the Superintendent of Schools express their sorrow at the death of Ms. Cotman and extend deepest sympathy to her family. We also today want to remember Mr. Matthew P. Riley, a science teacher at Newport Mill Middle School. His passing has deeply saddened the staff, students, and members of the board. During the three years that Mr. Riley worked for Montgomery County Public Schools, he clearly communicated classroom expectations to his students, and that resulted in their willingness to learn and meet the goals and objectives of the class. Mr. Riley deeply cared for the young people he taught. He created a warm and inviting classroom environment where his students felt safe and, and excited to learn. Therefore, be it resolved that the members of the Board of Education and the Superintendent of Schools express their sorrow at the loss of Mr. Riley and extend deepest sympathy to his family. We also want to remember today, Ms. Marilyn C. Richards, paraeducator at Clopper Mill Elementary School. This has deeply saddened the staff, students, and members of the Board of Education. During the eight years that Ms. Richards worked for Montgomery County Public Schools, she was a dedicated member of Clopper Mill Elementary School. She assisted students during lunch and recess, as well as in classrooms. She went above and beyond her responsibilities during the school day. She volunteered to support the school musical and handcrafted many costumes for students. Ms. Richards displayed an exceptional ability to communicate well with students. She clearly cared for them, and her kindness continued. Uh, her kindness contributed to a positive school environment. Therefore, be it resolved that the members of the Board of Education and the Superintendent of Schools express their sorrow at the death of Ms. Richards and extend deepest sympathy to her family. Ms. Crystal L. Boone, Special Education, education Bus Attendant in the Department of Transportation uh, passed on June 5th, 2020. Her passing has deeply saddened the staff and students, the members of the Board of, and the members of the Board of Education. During the 17 years that Ms. Boone worked for Montgomery County Public Schools, she performed her duties in a professional manner. She was courteous and respectful with parents, guardians, and school staff. Ms. Boone exhibited a kind, positive attitude. She made students feel safe and welcome and contributed to them arriving to school, happy, settled, and ready to learn. Therefore, be it resolved that the members of the Board of Education and the Superintendent of Schools express their sorrow at the death of Ms. Boone and extend deepest sympathy to her family. We offer these resolutions today in memory of uh, our valued employees that uh, we've lost and we expressed our deepest sympathy to their families. And we also recommend the monthly human resources report. Thank you. Um, and I did, I, in the very beginning, I did not ask for a motion to approve the uh, monthly human resources report. We can do that and then we'll do the resolution just so we can, for the record. Okay, <clears throat> move approval of the human resources report. Carla. I second. Moved and seconded by a show of hands, all in favor. And that is unanimous. And then Mrs. Evans, can I can I just say, I'm sorry to interrupt, but I just wanted to ask, say something about the uh, resolutions um, that uh, Dr. Smith just read. Um, sure. Becky Perlman was a dear friend of mine and it was a very sudden and um, heartbreaking loss. Um, and 
until you know somebody and you're listening to what you're saying, you don't really realize the um, impact, the powerfulness of the fact that we do take the time to do this and recognize these things. And I just, um, I know it would mean a lot to her family. So I'm not sure if families are told ahead of time that we're doing this type of thing, but um, I just wanted you all to know that I know her family would very be very appreciative. So um, I'm sure all of our families are, but you know. We appreciate that that you acknowledge that, uh, Mrs. Spondrowski. No, no, not a problem at all. So at this time, we can get a motion to move all the resolutions in block. A uh, move in block, please. A second. The second by a show of hands. All in favor. And that is unanimous. Thank you. Thank you. We also want to bring to today forward a recommendation for the uh, uh, approval of the hiring of. Mr. Tomas Rivera Figueroa, Supervisor of Strategic Teacher Recruitment Department of Certification and Staffing in the Office of Human Resources. Can I get a motion? To just, I'm sorry, one second. Oh, okay. okay. <laughs> Mr. Rivera Figueroa has been employed with Prince George's County Public Schools as a diversity recruitment executive coordinator for six years. He is excited to be returning to Montgomery County Public Schools where he previously worked for more than 10 years as an assistant principal at Parkland Middle School. He looks forward to joining the Department of Certification and Staffing, and we recommend his appointment to you today. Thank you. Move approval. A second. It's been moved and seconded. It's been moved and seconded. All those in favor by show of hands. And that is unanimous. Congratulations. We can give him a clap. Okay. Thank you, Dr. Smith. At this time, our next item on the agenda is public comment. Given that we are conducting the meeting virtually, we ask the public to submit their testimony in a variety of ways. Our community has submitted testimony in writing, um, by video, and um, by audio. Public comments is one of our opportunities to hear the views and receive the advice of community members. Board members will take your comments into consideration, but it is not our practice to take action at, at a time um, on the issues that are raised. We encourage input on policy, program, and practices. This is not the proper avenue to address specific student or employee matters, so we encourage you to utilize the existing avenues of redress for your complaints. Please check our website for um, information about our upcoming board meetings, changes to our work meetings, as well as um, about our hearings and work sessions, and in, in any changes to our start time. We received eight written testimonies for today. You may view the written testimonies in full on Board Docs. That's where it is posted for this meeting, and I will go over a summary of the written testimony that we received. We received something from Christina Vivian. Ms. Vivian is an MCPS teacher who wrote to provide feedback regarding the MCPS recovery plan. She raised questions and concerns about dealing with the complexities of rotating schedules, potential prolonged exposure of teachers in the classroom, the protocol that will be used when students or teachers test positive for COVID and transportation for elementary and middle school students. She advocates for continued virtual teaching and learning this fall. Next, we have written testimony from Ernest Bim. Mr. Bim is a program manager with the Lawyers Committee for Civil Rights Under Law, who writes on behalf of the organization to urge the board to remove the regular presence of law enforcement from MCPS schools and to reinvest those resources in equitable student and family supports. His testimony outlines the function of the organization and, at, and an explanation in support of immediate suspension of the SRO program. Lisa Minter, Ms. Minter is an MCPS teacher and mother of a rising MCPS second grader. Ms. Minter expresses concerns about the recovery plan, including the lack of fresh air circulation in classrooms and the difficulties associated with wearing masks. She advocates for keeping school-based staff involved in the planning for the 2021 school year and putting the safety of staff, students, and families first. We next have written testimony from Alan Prunier. Mr. Prunier, as an MCPS alum and current MCPS teacher at Powell Middle School, he wrote to express his concerns about the pandemic and the MCPS recovery plan. 
Mr. Pugne advocates for continued remote learning in the fall in order to protect the health and safety of MCPS, of the MCPS community. And Neil Tawdry, um, Mr. Tawdry um, is an MCPS parent, a former candidate for the at-large seat on the Board of Education. Mr. Chaudhry advocates for a recovery plan and framework that prioritizes the in-person delivery of education, especially for students and families who need it. He includes detailed reasons for his position and outlines a plan to demonstrate how he believes this can be done safely. Eric Cothery, Mr. Cothery's testimony raises several questions and concerns about how the recovery plan might affect the high school student experience. He specifically asks about the high school cont continuity of education, the phasing in of college bound juniors and seniors as a priority and the role of high school athletics, arts and clubs. We have written testimony from Daniel Herschler. Mr. Herschler's testimony raises several concerns about the return of students to school in the fall. He advocates for continued remote education or making it an option that families can choose. He believes that this time is this, that this is the safest option for the entire community. And the last written testimony is from Sunil Desgupta. Dr. Desgupta's testimony expresses concerns regarding the MCPS recovery plan. He, he specifically raises concerns about how staff and students will be protected from COVID, from the COVID virus. Dr. Jaskupta offers several solutions, including strategies for funding, online learning, improvements in data collection to help MCPS effectively recover. So now we will um, go to the audio testimony. We have just one person submit their um, audio testimony and that is from Jane Learman and I will allow MCPS TV to, to this Good afternoon, Dr. Smith and members of the Board of Education. My name is Jane Learman and I'm the Poolsville Cluster Coordinator. My testimony describes transportation concerns of our out-of-cluster students who attend Poolsville High School. I reviewed the plans for reopening and noted the effect it will have on transportation. Approximately 60% of Poolsville High School's enrollment is out of cluster, but we are hardly unique. I'm here to advocate for more clarity regarding transportation for all students and choice programs. Many, if not most of us, do not have the luxury of driving our children to school, especially those that live many miles away from a choice program. Moreover, carpooling is a less viable option because of fears of COVID exposure. I respectfully request more specific transportation guidance for families with students in choice programs. I also want to inform you of a change in ride-on bus transportation, transportation that will profoundly affect Poolsville High School students. Many students commute to and from PHS using the Route 76 ride-on bus which travels along Route 28 in Gaithersburg. This bus is a convenient and free way for many students to travel home or simply get picked up by parents closer to home. As of July 5th, the ride-on Route 76 bus has stopped service to Poolsville. This is a huge problem for students who rely on this service, especially those who can travel by ride-on instead of the school bus. Also note that the elimination of the Route 76 ride-on bus to Poolsville will further burden the transportation network of Montgomery County Public Schools to Poolsville High School. MCPS and the Department of Transportation are different agencies, but I hope you can help the Poolsville community reestablish this important mode of transportation. I would also appreciate any specific advocacy channels to the Department of Transportation. To repeat, our high school students urgently need the ride on bus to Poolsville. Thank you for this chance to speak and for all the work you've done during these difficult times. Thank you. So now we have seven video testimonies. First up is Dylan Hayden. He's a student from Rocky Hills Middle School. Board of Education members and Dr. Smith. My name is Dylan Hayden. I'll be a sixth grader at Rocky Hill Middle School this upcoming school year. I am speaking to you today about the current plan for school in the fall. I think it is too soon for us to go back to school grounds. The reason I am against going back to school at this time is because I think bringing students back to school before a good majority of COVID cases are resolved would put us at risk. 
This is because it only takes one case to cause an entire major outbreak. This will also be harder to avoid because the plan for everybody to be back in social distancing will be hard because schools are not built to handle the capacity of everyone being six feet apart in every classroom. On top of major safety issues, this will be expensive and inconvenient. The fact that more buses will need to be bought and drivers will need to be employed will be expensive and a solution to a temporary problem. Once this is over, we won't need the buses and the people will lose their jobs. It will be extremely inconvenient due to the need to parent, for parents to alter their work schedules to match the schools. The fact that we will be wearing masks and following strict rules to stay safe, th it will be most likely a distraction to some students, and there won't be a solution if the masks become a distraction. For example, if a student is distracted by their mask, the teacher wouldn't be able to take the mask away. That would be unsafe. If students are distracted or feeling unsafe, they aren't learning. In conclusion, I think it is too soon to go back to school grounds. Thank you for the opportunity to speak to you today. Next, we will hear from Kevin Daughtry. Good afternoon. My name is Kevin Daugherty. I am the parent of two elementary age children entering grades five and three. To begin, I want to thank you for taking the time to hear from the community on the return to schools. I know this is an emotionally charged topic with many stakeholders and there's no easy solution. I'm speaking today to strongly recommend that the board consider reconsider option two to allow blended learning to begin immediately with different considerations by grade level, specifically allowing elementary age students to begin to return sooner than the high school age students. I agree that we must put the safety of the children and staff first. However, we must also have a fact-based conversation in assessing the health risk to students. It's clear that children do not suffer the most severe symptoms of this virus. In Maryland, we've had one death of a minor out of over 70,000 cases and no deaths of any elementary age children. It's also become clear that children shed the virus differently than adults. In other countries that have both flattened the curve and instituted contact tracing systems, they found that child to adult transmission is incredibly rare, as is child to child transmission. Children do not transmit the virus to others, nor do they experience the most severe symptoms of COVID-19. Simply put, it's safe for our children to return to school. We must, however, protect teachers and staff from transmission of the virus. However, it's much easier to ask those adults to wear the mask, to distance themselves, and to engage in frequent hand washing. That's why I re recommend deferring the return of school for high school age students. It's more likely that a high school age student would transmit the virus to the teacher due to their age. However, it's safer for an elementary age teacher to return to the classroom given the additional safety precautions I just mentioned. An elementary school teacher wearing a mask and kept largely in their classroom is safe. We must also consider the risk to these students of not returning to school. The American Academy of Pediatrics has recommended a full return to school, although they have recently modified their recommendation to consider additional safety precautions for teachers and staff. However, their initial concerns about the risk to students is valid. There is consensus that remote learning for elementary age students is not effective. It pales in comparison to face-to-face -face instruction. We must also consider the negative social and mental health impacts to elementary age students in staying at home. Many of these students do not have the same social media networks or technology available to them to engage in the type of digital socialization that we have as adults. They feel isolated and alone. I've seen it in my own two children. Imagine for a second a student staying at home for the duration of the day. They're not familiar with technology and they don't have any guidance at home because both of their parents are working. They struggle to log on to their classes, and once they're on, they struggle even more to stay engaged. Or even worse, this student may be in an abusive household, and the brief time that they have at school interacting with their peers and teachers is the only break they have. We must not deny that student their right to an education. We here in Montgomery County should be very proud of the response that we have had to the coronavirus. We listen to the experts, and we flattened the curve. And now we must continue to listen to the experts domestically here in regards to our children's health and the experts overseas in how to open up schools safely. It can be done, and it can be done in a way that protects both teachers and students alike. And it can be done without having any remote learning to start the year. Next, we will hear from Lisa Ng. Good afternoon, everyone. 
My name is Lisa Ng, and I'm a parent of an upcoming fifth grader and second grader at Poolsville Elementary School. I have read the draft plan, Considerations for MCPS Fall 2020 Recovery. I want to first thank the board for giving me time to speak today, but also for the board and their thoughtful planning for reopening, especially highlighting equity as a key priority when finalizing plans. While I have seen and heard the discussion on social distancing, masks, and scheduling of in-person sessions, I would like to ask the board if they've considered how school buildings will be operating in the fall. Many institutions have developed reports and checklists, checklists for properly reopening schools, including the Harvard T.H. Chan School of Public Health, Johns Hopkins Center for Health Security, and the U.S. Environmental Protection Agency. I have included a letter with this video with the appropriate links. I ask that the board check out these links because all of these documents promote adequate or increasing ventilation in schools and improving filtration when possible. This can reduce the number of possibly infectious aerosols in the air. Also, if MCPS will be increasing the frequency of cleaning, I can only imagine how our schools will smell if proper ventilation is not provided. In addition to the smell, Teachers, administrators, and students may also start to suffer irritation in their nose, suffer headaches, coughs, and dizziness when there's a high concentration of these cleaning chemicals in the air. Again, I thank the board for their diligence and time. I truly hope that you can address my concerns on building ventilation. The only way our children can go back to school is if they are safe. While social distancing, masks, and staggered scheduling can aid in accomplishing that, if the air they breathe is not safe, then we may be causing more harm than good. Thank you. Next, we will hear from Orchid Dargahi. Hello, my name is Orchid Dargahi. This will be my fifth year teaching in MCPS, teaching Spanish, and I'm a product of Montgomery County Public Schools myself. I attended Chris McAuliffe Elementary School, Roberto Clemente Middle School, and Seneca Valley High School in Germantown. After being a long-term substitute for one year, I spent three years teaching at North Bethesda Middle School, one year at Queens Orchard High School, and now I'm returning to middle school to be at Sligo in Silver Spring. I'm here today to address the reopening plan for this fall of 2020. Last night, I attended an educator focus group with Sunil Dasgupta, candidate for Board of Education member at large, where something that a colleague said really stuck with me. Back in March, we had two weeks, just two weeks, to get a distance learning plan together to distribute over 50,000 devices to students who otherwise may not have been able to connect, to set up Wi-Fi spots, and to also set up meal distribution sites to make sure that our students got food. We did so much in two weeks, and that is because we had a plan. For that reason, I asked the Board of Education to implement this plan, an unwavering and wholehearted commitment to distance learning for the 2021, I'm sorry, 2020 to 2021 academic year not because it is, only, it is not only the safest option, but for the following reasons. The COVID-19 pandemic has taken away a lot from our society, but what if we use this time to reinvest resources into our school system and change things for the better? Another colleague last night pointed out that our school schedules, which really just grew out of a farm economy, are arbitrary times and arbitrary class lengths at this time. What if we reinvented the school schedule to morning, afternoon, and evening shifts? What if a high school student who works mornings as an essential employee can still come home and log on for an evening class? What if students and families do not have to choose between learning online that day or earning a paycheck? What if a parent who needs uninterrupted time to work from home in the afternoon can still support their child because an evening class affords them that opportunity? What if we started to have an actionable plan for mental health and trauma-informed practices? I know that I, for one, would volunteer to teach socially distanced outdoor mindfulness and meditation classes to children in my community and students at my school. We have bus drivers and building service workers who are threatened with real job insecurity right now. What if we reimagined their roles as staff members who could help us deliver materials and teach classes in their area of expertise? This is a time when we cannot afford to overlook any of our talent. As a national leader in education, what if we used our platform to truly, quote unquote, reimagine, reopen, and recover, as the draft of our reopening plan suggests, 
to number one, reimagine. Reimagine what effective education can look like. I can tell you right now that it does not look like 12 students on a bus, staggered arrival times, alternating weeks in school, temperature checks, masks, or social distancing inside of a building. Commit to a distance learning plan and what that entails for teachers, including teacher trainings and staff development relevant to an online learning model. Number two, reopen, not doors to buildings, but access to education. I ask for a task force to reach out to our families now, yes, in the summer, to make sure that their needs are met come the first day of school. We speak about inequities, opportunity and achievement gaps. Well, this is our time to deliver. And number three, recover. Recover the human connection that this pandemic has taken away. I ask that MCPS rethink our current school schedules and change them to what works for both staff and students through morning, afternoon and online, I'm sorry, evening online classes. Thank you for your time. Next, we will hear from Marjorie Cohen. Good afternoon. Thank you for the opportunity to speak with you today. My name is Marjorie Cohen and I'm a staff development teacher at Sligo Middle School. I'm about to begin my 20th year as a teacher in MCPS. I'm also the parent of two girls, one entering fifth grade at Cold Spring Elementary and one entering eighth grade at Cabin John Middle School. All employees are legally obligated to complete module trainings every year before they are allowed to interact with students. In the final module of the Employee Code of Conduct, there is a slide that I saw that made me stop and pause. It read, employees should refrain from any action that threatens the safety of students, fellow employees, or the broader community, undermines your own professional integrity, and or makes you unfit to perform your assigned duties. Given the current situation we are living in, I am afraid that returning to person in-person work in the fall would be an action I would have to refrain from. If any staff member walks through the doors of an MCPS school on August 24th, their safety will be threatened. If a student walks through the doors of an MCPS school on August 31st, their safety will be threatened. If schools are to reopen in a physical sense while COVID-19 is not under control, the broader community's safety will be threatened. My professional integrity has been undermined by the sheer fact that I am living in fear about how I am going to do my job in a physical sense and still worry about the risks that I may bring home to my family and children. Am I being asked to put my students' needs before my own children's? At the end of the module, it goes on to explain that in the event that an employee is to be faced with one of these actions, it should be reported immediately to your supervisor. Ultimately, you, the Board of Ed, are my supervisor. I work for you and the residents of our county. I am telling you that by having teachers return to work in any physical capacity while this virus is not under control is a direct violation of the Code of Conduct. I became a teacher because I truly love watching learning in action. I love seeing a child's face light up when they get something for the first time or learn something new. I love even more seeing a teacher's face after they just delivered an amazing lesson or had a breakthrough with the student. Every fall, I am excited to go back to work and start the year anew and engage in learning again. I know this coming school year will be different, but I know that I can see those faces and make those breakthroughs with distance learning. For the past 20 years, I have felt respected and safe every day I come to work. Please, I beg you, do not, me put, do not put me in a position where I will be torn between doing what is asked of me or doing what I feel is best for me. Take a moment and review the employee code of conduct. It is only 15 minutes and ask yourself if what we are demanding of staff aligns with the expectations outlined in this document. Thank you very much. Next, we will hear from Lynn Harris. Good afternoon, Dr. Smith, Board President Evans and members of the Board of Education. My name is Lynn Harris and I'm making my comments today in my capacity as a CTE instructor in Montgomery County Public Schools, I've just finished my fourth year teaching medical science with clinical applications at Thomas Edison High School of Technology. And through our two-year Academy of Health Professions program, we provide students the opportunity to earn both their National Certified Medical Assistant License and also their Maryland Board of Nursing Certified Nursing Assistant License so that they can right away as soon as they step out of our classroom, start working in very high demand fields right here in our county. 
But before I begin my comments, I want to first express my appreciation to central office staff and all of MCPS teachers and staff for the hard work that's taken place since March 13th to remain connected to students, to serve students, to teach students, and to make sure that we could end the school year as best we could in very difficult circumstances. And I'd also like to express my appreciation for the way that the planning for fall has included a strong community engagement piece as the individual design teams have been formed to look at various aspects of teaching, learning, and the business of schools. Parents, community members, stakeholders, teachers, students have been included on those work groups to provide their valuable perspective and expertise and experience. And I think that is crucial to making sure that we can make the best decisions that we can. And I would also put in a plug to make sure each design team is robustly represented by students. But in my comments around CTE instruction, I've reviewed the draft plan that's come out for fall and looked at the content um, area for each of the design teams, and I'm not seeing any direct focus on CTE education at this point. Many of our CTE courses and programs are amenable to delivery virtually or via distance learning as long as the students and teachers share the same technology and tools. But some of our courses and programs just aren't. I can't teach hands-on patient care skills and provide students the hands-on patient care experience required by our state licensing board virtually. Students can't rebuild a transmission virtually. They can't build a house virtually. They can't stand next to their certified professional chef instructor and learn how to construct and make all elements of a meal and run a restaurant virtually. I'm hopeful that many of my colleagues and I can join you in focusing closely on the CTE work of our schools to make sure that come fall, we can continue to do what we say we will, which is provide students a robust CTE opportunity. Our final video testimony comes from Allison Praisner Klump. Good afternoon, members of the Board of Education. My name is Allison Praisner Klump, and I am a 29 year veteran of the county and lifelong resident of Burtonsville, Maryland. I am here today to ask that you not follow the draft plan put in front of you. As a sixth grade teacher, I would be phase one and returning to the building sometime in September. I am in great fear of my safety my coworkers' safety, and more importantly, my students' safety during this pandemic. I do not feel returning to the building in September, even with the smallest number of students, will be acceptable for any of us. It will be extremely dis difficult to make sure students are constantly wearing their masks, to keep students socially distancing, especially in small classrooms and in the hallways and to make sure that building, the building is being disinfected to the degree of CDC guidelines. I strongly encourage you to allow students in Montgomery County to continue their remote learning via the draft plan in front of you until a vaccine has been developed. Students can get the adequate instruction they need by following that virtual model. We need our students to be learning. I fully agree with that, but it cannot be done safely in a building at this time. Do not put our lives at risk until it is determined to be acceptable via CDC guidelines for all students to enter the building that, like we did last year. I strongly encourage you again to not follow the draft plan and do not send any student back into our buildings until we have a vaccine. Thank you. That concludes public comments. I just want to take this time to thank everyone for submitting their written testimony along with their audio and video testimony. Our next board meeting will be held on Thursday, August the 6th and public comments will open on July the 31st. So at this time, if I don't, I don't see any um, board members' mics unmuted, we will go on to item five, item of discussion, and I will turn that over to Dr. Smith to introduce the topic. 
and the presenters. Thank you, uh, Ms. Evans. Uh, as we heard from many of our commenters today, both in writing and those who spoke to us through audio and video, there are many different views on this uh, issue of the recovery of, of the educational program. There are many different questions. In fact, there are literally hundreds of questions that all of us have been working together across our community, across our, our state and our nation. And there are many different perspectives. And we all uh, often uh, advocate for our own interests and our own uh, circumstances. And that's the way uh, that communities work. And we understand that. Uh, so we're going to continue on today talking about the many different needs, interests, and uh, questions that exist around the recovery for ed the educational program. Uh, you know, we've been planning and preparing for the 2021 school year since uh, more than a year ago. We're always planning about 18 months out. No one could have imagined even one year ago today that this is the school year would be working uh, toward. But since Governor Hogan and State Superintendent of uh, Salmon stood up uh, on March 12th and closed schools for a two-week emergency closure, and then on May 6th, set up and closed schools for the rest of the 1920 school year, our growing understanding of the complexity of this uh, has, has been a pervasive regular part of all conversations everywhere across the community. Uh, the work has been challenging. It's incredibly complex and complicated. Uh, we, have, we have looked at many different models for reopening. Uh, there is no one option that can address all of the instructional, operational, and logistical challenges that uh, the school system, uh, the staff members, 24,000 of them in dozens of different kinds of jobs from our support professionals to our teachers, teacher leaders, and administrators. Uh, none of the, the options are ever going to work for all of those people, all of our 165,500 students pre-K through 12. It's uh, certainly critical that we consider the health and, and safety of our students, families, and staff members. That's a critical part of it, and that's why we rely so heavily on both the state and local health officials, and they will be a, a very important part of whatever uh, we recommend to you, and I know whatever you ultimately decide to do. Uh, we are busy thinking about how to reorder and reimagine all aspects of the school experience. Um, and our goal is to make sure it's high quality instruction for students, whether it's remotely uh, in a socially distanced environment or a hybrid of the two. Uh, it is certainly the decision to reopen the schools will be a, a collaborative and joint decision among many people. Uh, the governor certainly has the authority and the responsibility uh, to close the schools, as he worked with Dr. Salmon on March 12th to do, and then continued that process through the spring. They rely heavily on the state health officials and our local health officials. And I have to give a shout out to Dr. Gales and Dr. Stoddard and Dr. Crowley for their uh, very good support of the community and the school system as we go forward with all of this. And uh, they uh, actually have a lot, uh, they had a lot of input on this very meeting we're going to have today. We're going to share some of the initial considerations uh, in our planning for the fall. We want to in reiterate, this is a draft. This is a framework. It was never intended to answer all the questions. There is always the issue of the timing of answering the questions. If we answer them too soon, we don't have all the information. If we wait too late, people can't respond to the answer. So we're constantly trying to, in a very iterative way, answer the questions that are so important. Uh, and we will continue to work on this and listen to our community, our staff, our students, and uh, work together with the Board of Education to come to the best solution in, in this time and then be willing to review that solution and come back to it on a regular basis as the circumstances and the context evolve. One of the things that has been um, the most, I think, uh, complex in this situation is uh, while we've dealt with the pandemic and the emergency closure and the ongoing use of the continuity of learning plan and standing up as one of our speakers said, uh, that 
plan very quickly and moving from face to face has been the simultaneous work that and thinking and action that's taken place across the society around racial justice and the way that we further the issue of equitable opportunity and access for all uh, individuals, and in our case, specifically for all children and students in Montgomery County Public Schools. That is our mission, to have an excellent school system and one that is equitable, because it is not possible to have excellence without equity. It is not possible to have excellence without equity in a school system. And the students across Montgomery County have had tremendous opportunities over decades. And students across Montgomery County have experienced disparities. And those disparities have been predictable based on race, culture, uh, learning supports through special education systems, language, and income. And we must think about how all of those pieces fit together. Uh, as we move forward with our decisions about the fall, uh, equity and the opportunity for every single student has to be at the forefront of our thinking, as well as the excellence of programming, uh, both remotely and in a socially distance and appropriately structured physical environment. We, we have worked over the last few years to develop the equity achievement framework. We've looked at the impact of schools through the equity accountability model, through how our students are learning, if they're learning enough, through the evidence of learning model, and at the way we use resources through the resource allocation model. We've also looked at their well being closely uh, through the Be Well 365 model, and we have all of these pieces coming together. At this point, we want to uh, continue that work uh, robustly in no matter what the context of school is or the methodology. And we think there is a very good rationale and this is the right moment to continue gathering information and better understanding what creates an equitable environment. Certainly, uh, many, many people in our society are talking about this right now. As I wrote in an op-ed in the Bethesda Beat over the weekend, implicit bias exists across the educational spectrum. It show, and, and, that, and research shows that the bias can contribute to disparities in academic outcomes for students of color and for students in poverty. People often talk about bias as a concept. We need to talk about bias and other racial and racist uh, concepts as they are actually implemented and as children experience them in the classroom, whether it is this model that we're all looking at one another right now, or it is a model where we're in the same room. We've got to be able to think about that. And when we do our work, we've got to be able to think about how do these concepts, this understanding, this knowledge, this professional learning, how does that actually play out in the environment of adults working together on behalf of children, of students working with adults, and of students working with one another? All of those relationships matter. And so we want to come to you to, uh, today and share some additional work we're going to continue to do in this area and that we think will continue to enhance the way we better understand as a school system the experiences to provide for our adults that work together in no matter what their role across 24,000 employees, for adults working with students and students working with adults and for students relating to one another. And so I'm going to ask Dr. McKnight now to walk you through a framework that we have been working on and, and thinking about and talking about for the past uh, uh, several weeks. And, and actually, it's just a continued outgrowth of all of the work I described before. But we've got to do our very, very best work, and it's got to be effective and implemented if we're really going to make an environment where all does mean all and all students are well cared for, their well-being is understood, and that adults work collaboratively and respectfully together on behalf of those students. So I will now uh, turn it over to Dr. McKnight for her to walk you through the framework. Dr. McKnight. Thank you, Dr. Smith, and good afternoon, board members. Um, as Dr. Smith stated, I work in addressing disparities in student outcomes with an emphasis on our focus groups representing African-American students, Latinx students in poverty have already been initiated and we worked through this in the system over the past year around developing the equity and achievement framework. 
It's important to acknowledge that, you know, we as a system, we've been on the forefront of disaggregating data and looking at student performance and really taking this stand on confronting things that have really allowed us to focus on achievement and access and the opportunity that it serves for all of our students and actually looking for ways in which there are systems that could negate that progress. So with that said, we also acknowledge that in that work, we have gaps and we've identified some of those gaps and we must continue to delve deeper into understanding why these gaps exist. Knowing why these gaps exist allow us as a system, a system to be much more intentional in how we problem solve and, and provide action that is appropriate for the exact issue. We know that another component in this work that addresses student physical, social, psychological well-being is the, three, the Be Well 365 initiative. Um, and I must say that also serves as a system that has to be a linchpin and how we help students achieve and maintain academic success. Our students have to be emotionally well and be in an environment where they can emotionally thrive to actually perform well academically. So that's a very big component of what we have to continue to focus on. And with that said, I mean, I think as we think about our current circumstance, it's really imperative that we continue to reevaluate and talk about ways to address both the social and emotional well-being and academic supports that are providing students and staff to thrive in these very challenging times that we've experienced over the last few months and are still planning for. And equally important, we must acknowledge how our students and staff feel despite our efforts to prioritize equity and cultural proficiency. So we acknowledge that this has been work that we've done in the system over years, and it's work that the system continues to be committed to. But we always have to look at our current circumstance and be willing to say, what have we been able to accomplish and what's left for us to continue to focus on to get even better at what we do? And I tell you, our employees have been, and our, and our staff and our students, the entire system have been really uh, personal in their touch to us just to share the impact that they've had over the past few months. Our employees, our students, our families, and our communities, I want to acknowledge, know that we hear the pain, anger, and fear that have really resonated with people over the past few months. And we also know that we must take action. However, we want our action to be intentionally thought out so that we're being very specific about how we address the issues that exist. And honestly, this level of intensity has been prominent in our school system and actually have manifested in a number of different ways for a variety of stakeholders. We've heard from testimonials from our past and present students. Some have commented throughout the year at the board table and public comments about how there are opportunities to be able to extend, expand on their learning experiences in school and how that suits their history and their contributions as it relates to race and, 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 and things over time. We've heard, let, we've got received letters from staff that have really pointed out to us how they have been able to navigate the work that is expected of them in these very different conditions that just require them to just self-process and think about what is the impact on me personally when I think about what race means and, and how it's being uh, addressed in our country or not addressed in our country in a meaningful way and how can I help support that. We've gotten requests of resources from our community to help support it. We also continue to look at the fact that we have to own our student data because that tells us a lot about what our overall climate in each of our schools are and that the students result in how they actually perform and looking at opportunity and achievement and looking at those disparities that have existed for African-American students, our Latinx students and students of poverty while understanding that also race is a very prevalent matter right now in the context of looking at all of these things. And so we think about race and then we say, you think about the acts of violence, COVID-19 related deaths and illnesses and how that's impacted many different communities in many different ways, the gaps in performance, you think about families struggling with unemployment and what that means for them, even in the context of recovery. And then you have on top of that, the public deaths of George Floyd and other African-Americans. And you think about the disproportionality that still exists and how we have to be so clear that race is a relevant factor that has to be explicitly acknowledged and confronted. 
And being very intentional in how we acknowledge it and confront it has to be at the forefront of our actions. So we've got to think about all of our current employees, all the new employees that we are currently onboarding into MCPS, and our parents who are entrusting us with their children to either support them remotely or in person, but at the end of the day, knowing that everyone has to have the best interest for every student on the other end of that experience. And so as I, I talk through this, it's really important that we think about our staff, our community members, and all be very reflective on how we stand with each other and all of the colleagues in all of our different groups really stand together and think about how do we stop racist inequities in our system and what are the neat resources that we actually need to help promote a climate where trust has to be established in order for us to be able to do this as a collective body. And with that, I'll say we're fortunate to have a Board of Education who has been committed to this always in the work that they do. Um, and we're fortunate for that. We have county government leaders, our superintendent, our council, all who recognize the need of this community and have always put this as a priority in their work. And so it's time for us to acknowledge the conditions and really think about what we have to do to meet the needs of our students, staff, and families at this current time, which brings us to looking at the components of the anti-racist system audit that we will do in MCPS. And in order to collectively own these issues and most importantly take action, the proposal that I'll quickly share with you goes over um, six focus areas in MCPS that we want this audit to be focused and based on to actually address the very things that I just described. The first is to analyze the workforce diversity. And that's critically important to make sure that we ensure that we're not only hiring for quality and expertise, but also for diversity in MCPS. This includes all positions within the system, including looking at diversity in leadership positions to leadership positions in schools and all areas of Central. To continue to think about how have we done over the last few years in this area, where are there are opportunities to expand, and what do we need to learn and do differently? That's the first area, analyze the workforce diversity. Secondly, we want to look at the area in which we identify the progress and barriers in work conditions in our entire organization. We acknowledge that the well-being of staff is integral in the education, in the education of our students. That's why the Be Well 365 initiative encompasses both staff and students in totality. Anyone who's had an opportunity to really look at the Waymaking series and see how those messages are focused specifically to the audience really gets down to why it has to be at the crux of everyone's really positive well being as a person that allows them to be able to contribute to others in a positive way. And we're responsible for ensuring that the work environment in every office, every division, and every school where we have staff working is one that must be astute to create an environment that acknowledges and addresses the complexities around race, diversity, and inclusion, and how these factors impact a person's physical, psychological, and emotional well being. The third area really focuses on us conducting the K 12 focus on curriculum review. And as you know, we've already started that process with our history and social studies review. So we've heard from students over time about how social studies is taught and it sometimes negates the full picture of the context that addresses African-American history particularly and many of the contributions made by African-Americans. We had actually students sit at the board table and talk to us about the meaning of Columbus Day. And they so eloquently came and spoke about how it resonates or does not resonate with them and the real historical story that we have to be responsible for sharing with them. We know that the, the impact of racism on mental health has also been deemed a public health crisis. So we need to analyze strategically how we're educating our students from K to 12 when they really develop a being of who I am as a person and what is my place in society and what value do I have to offer what value does my culture have to offer that really gets at them developing the beans of pride and self-worth at the elementary level? And I'll just take a quick side note to say we've been making some progress in how we do that in our social studies curriculum. Just a few weeks ago, we had a cross office uh, team meet together, you know, who was charged with creating a long-term plan to transform the curriculum and develop the interconnected and interdisciplinary learning experiences for students K through 12. 
to strengthen their sense of racial, ethnic, and tribal identities, help students understand and resist systems of oppression, and empower students to see themselves as change agents as early as possible. This plan is gonna have multiple components. It's gonna have an opportunity for us to be able to provide authentic learning across curriculum resources in digital and print format to get at all different types of learners and for students to acquire meaningful learning experiences and demonstrate learning. We'll incorporate the plan to address social emotional learning, especially for those students who have been deeply impacted by recent events. And most importantly, we have to include the professional development for staff that's differentiated by level. We had conversations about how we worked with our teachers at the elementary level to really help our students at, at the elementary level develop a sense of who they are as social beings is critically important and how that has to be differentiated from how we do that at the secondary level. We're gonna to continue to engage our community. They have been great partners in helping us with this work. In fact, last week, many of the committee members met with individuals who wrote the letter to the Board of Education about anti-racism education initiatives in MCPS. These community members are current students. Some are alumni of MCPS who shared their personal experiences and recommendations for educating our students and staff. And we're taking all of that to, into consideration in this third component of our curriculum review. The fourth area really focuses on analyzing progress in the components of the equity achievement framework. We've been talking about that in MCPS over the past year when we developed the equity and achievement framework model. But this is the opportunity for schools to continue to look at this data to acknowledge if progress is being made with students of color and populations we have not been making progress with to level the playing field. We must consider the impact that the pandemic has had on our focused students in order to plan for actions that continue to close the gap, even in our current context. The fifth area is focusing on community relations and engagement. I must say, as we have dealt with different things that have arisen in our school communities over the year, um, we continue to uplift how it has been so uh, great and meaningful for us to work with our community partners who have owned this work with us as a community. And so we've got to continue to engage our communities at the central level and at the school level. This often reminds me of an African proverb I'll share with you and it, it, it states, a child who is not embraced by the village will burn it down to feel its warmth. I say that because it's critical for every school to be tireless in the outreach and engagement with all communities to hear their needs and perspectives because they will be heard one way or another. And if we're proactive in how we allow their voices to be considered on the forefront of the work, then that allows all of us to be able to work in a meaningful way that addresses the concerns before they actually arise as concerns that we then have to be reactive to. Central Office will continue to be committed to doing this work while supporting schools to do this work in a very differentiated manner. The final area is evaluating school cultures to ensure a celebration of diversity and inclusion. Our students have been crying out for support as evidenced by the creation of multiple social media pages in which students have shared experiences with racism in their buildings, in our buildings. We have had the black at forums in which students have said, this is my experience here and I need for someone to hear me and help work through it. That is our responsibility. We've had multiple hate and bias incidents that have occurred um, over the year and, and we've talked about it. People have raised concerns in letters and communities. We've heard from our students, from our parents and our community members. This has included also students in our Chinese community feeling targeted as a result of the pandemic. We've had, to, you know, earlier this year, we dealt with many swastikas and other graffiti representing hate in our community that has to be addressed. We've got to begin to continue to be focused on ways to be proactive in our approaches to addressing this and really acknowledge that the hurt and harm that occurs with our students when every time one of these incidents occur, it impacts our entire community, which is why we have to own it. And so therefore the community engagement at each school is key because the schools cannot combat hate alone. It definitely takes a village and a partnership between the schoolhouse, central office and the community to combat this. So I just wanted to take a moment to just acknowledge that these are things that have been happening as a result of COVID-19, but these were also things that existed in different ways before COVID-19 came on. 
COVID-19 came on board that just added another layer. And so as we continue to think about the engagement of central services staff, leaders, members of our association leaders, our community stakeholders, and, and those who are big parts in our initial planning phase through the audit, really help us to develop an action plan as a result of phases that we can implement to address these areas that we learn from the audit. Past and present data and reports input from our student focus groups consultation with national experts is exactly what we're going to have to do to drive the action steps needed to address the things that we find in this audit. But the audit allows us a pathway to say, what is the problem in all of these different spaces? How can we acknowledge what we've done well and build on that? And how do we differentiate for things that cause these issues over time in all of the spaces? And most importantly, work on it together as a collective entity in the system. And so our equity of initiatives unit will be a key uh, office to help bridge this audit together for MCPS. I welcome them into the office and this is, will be a large body of work that we start out with together. Um, and our timeline for completing the audit, and this will be done in a number of different ways through a data analysis to look at how student learning is represented in, uh, in our reports when we look at how our students have been impacted in their learning by COVID-19 to even focus group sessions that we have with students and staff over the next few months in all offices and all schools to really get a good sense of what is happening to help our remedy and our action plans be strategic and purposeful to what we find from the audit. And this timeline will begin now and we'll continue to work on the audit through the fall and bring back findings in October when the recommendations will be presented that results in action plans that addresses the areas of needs and really find ways to continue moving forward the positive trends that we have in our system and build on areas in which we want to improve. So at this time, I've shared an overview of exactly what that framework is. Um, Ms. Evans, I'll turn it over to you for some board discussion or comments or questions at this time. Sure, um, thank you for that. Um presentation. It seemed like the perfect time to introduce the anti-racist audit. And um, thank you, too, for acknowledging um, the students and the staff that you've heard from, as well as community members, and just sharing this work um, with everybody. I will start with um, Dr. Daka. I'm not sure if she's there. Or So I'll go to Mr. Asante. I just want to start off by saying thank you for this effort with this audit. I know a lot of students have reached out to me about um, wanting to see MCPS take a stand on anti-racism efforts. And so it's great that we're working on that. I was just wondering if there are going to be any um, additional opportunities for community members to sort of give input on the certain aspects of the audit that they would like to see highlighted um, in the final report, like the certain um, areas of each broader category that they would like the audit to really focus in on. Absolutely. So following this presentation, thank you, Mr. Asante, for that question. Following this presentation, we're actually going to be working out a project plan to do just that. Um, we don't want to put an audit on people, but have them as a part of developing all of the things that we need to look at and how we need to look at it. Because every community, every group that have been impacted by this will have a different perspective. So that will be a key part of our project plan. Okay, thank you. Ms. Wolf. I wanted to thank you for the presentation and I just had one question. It, did I understand you correctly that the school culture aspect will include a student focus groups? And if so, how do you do a focus group with a K through second grader? I guess what I'm trying to understand is a lot of the achievement lapse, if you wanna call that occurs sometime before the third grade. What is, how are you going to get information to try to figure out if anything is going on for those grades? Because students, I mean, I'm not sure what a, a kindergartner through second grade student could say in a focus group that would be helpful and the parents aren't in the classroom to see what's going on. As you know, some of my concern is teacher responsiveness to children of color. Absolutely. Thank you, Ms. Wolf. So today was the big overview of the project. All of the details of exactly what we're going to do and how we're going to engage in all those processes 
is what we will be bringing back to the board because we want much of that to be informed through national experts and all of the focus groups like Mr. Asante just brought forward to help shape to make sure we're differentiating to elevate the voice and to differentiate for all of these different groups that we're talking about. And that could be differentiating from our getting the sense of what this experience like from a kindergarten versus a senior in high school who would have had many years of experience. So that I look forward to us coming back to talk about in terms of the details uh, of exactly how we are launching the differentiated pieces of this audit once we've had a chance to interact with those groups. Thank you. It's just something that I want you to keep in mind that whatever happens seems to happen by third grade. And so I want to be very clear that we're getting some useful information about K through 12 or even pre-K for our schools that have pre-K through second grade. Thank you. We will do that. Thank you, Ms. Wolf. Uh, I have um, Ms. Dixon. So thank you, uh, Dr. McKnight, uh, for the presentation. Um, forgive me if I missed something there. Zoom seems to uh, Zoom me sometimes to close my eyes, but I, I was listening. And um, I want to know how this initiative will relate to looking at curriculum. We've had lots of calls from our students um, who feel that we need to have uh, an anti-racism curriculum, frankly. And so I'm wondering how that will all work together. Well, those students that you're referring to, many of them are ones that we have been reaching out to and continue to be a part of building this actual project. For each of these six areas of focus, uh, our goal is to be able to have influence of uh, the student voice, not just the school culture, but actually have the student voice present in all of these areas, as well as community members and staff, uh, central and school, to actually address that. And our, this is actually a critical area in which our students will be key stakeholders because they are the ones who are experiencing it on, one, on, on the end of learning. And for them to tell us exactly why they feel like the anti-racist anti curriculum is needed versus what we have is key because there may be an opportunity to be able to bridge that. And if that's the curriculum that our students are saying we need it, what are we missing most importantly that makes them feel like this is something that we need? Because the goal is that if we actually build an anti-racist environment, we actually won't have to continue to look at how we are, um, we would see we would see it as it exists in every space. It wouldn't be something that we would actually have to react to as often as we do now, because as we build, its presence would be el eliminated over time. And so our students would be a, 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 a huge part in helping us to understand, and particularly from their experiences from, uh, from the elementary level all the way up to high school, when was it most meaningful for them to be able to differentiate um, what this context of historical perspective meant for them, for them to have an understanding of race and what it means for them and their colleagues and their peers around them? Okay. So uh, I've seen a lot of uh, comments from students on Twitter uh, regarding uh, the anti-racism uh, that they feel. Uh, you know, curriculum needs to address. Um, you know, I would just suggest that, um, you know, going forward, uh, whoever is in charge of this uh, initiative, have someone who looks at, um, you know, Twitter comments uh, every day, because I find I learned a lot. I learn a lot uh, from Twitter. And, uh, you know, I'm not such a huge social network person, but, um, you know, I do look to see who reads what, and, um, you know, I would hope that all of the leaders in MCPS have um, their Twitter accounts, and they are, whether they read them themselves or have someone on their staff who checks Twitter uh, every day. Um, you know, so for example, I think, you know, uh, 
admin should have someone on their staff who checks what board members say on Twitter uh, every day, those of us that are on Twitter, uh, because I think it gives a good window in terms of what people are thinking and, um, you know, uh, what, what suggestions they have uh, as well. So thank you for the presentation. And, um, you know, I, I think I'm perked up again now. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Dixon. And Twitter definitely is a space for our, our students to engage in be our daily news. <laughs> Mrs. Uh, Smondrowski um, had a question and then Mrs. O'Neill. Thank you. Um, so thank you for this presentation. I'm very excited about this work. Um, it's, it's high time that we do this. And um, all I wanna kind of add to that is, is that, um, you know, for it to really make a difference and make a change, it's gonna be about what we do with the information as we get it and really making sure that we're utilizing it to make a difference. We've been talking about the curriculum. We hear from our students um, about the curriculum. We gotta get that, you know, make it happen as quickly as possible. Um, I also just want to add in there that um, I think this is great, and, I, and I, I'm cautious about suggesting it because I don't want to take anything away from this particular topic. But in general, you know, we need to stop treating others badly um, based on race, culture, identity, um, gender. You know, and so at some point, um, once we've got this down, I'm very hopeful that we can include some of that. Um, in, in this type of overview as well, possible. Yes. Thank you, Ms. Podrowski. Mrs. O'Neill? Yes, this is incredibly important work. It's work that even though it's people have called out in the last month about curriculum um, and changes needed in MCPS, there are some Judy Daka, who have been calling for some changes for a very long time. And we as a board, there are some things that we need to do. One, we need to have our strategic planning committee look at the strategic plan from the lens of anti-racism and the policy committee to look at what policies do we need to put into place to guide the system to support the system in its efforts. So, I mean, those are actual responsibilities of the board. I hope that the work of this audit can also point to changes that are needed in those two arenas, the strategic plan and policies. Thank you, Mrs. O'Neill. Mr. Asante. Uh, so I think during the presentation you mentioned phases of implementation. And I know um, that's like not something that you'll be able to fully answer until you have all the results, but I was wondering if you could go more in depth about how those phases would work and how you would roll that out. Well, the audit is to be completed so that we can come back to the board with what we learned at our October 27th meeting. Um, and from there, when we go over that information, the phase will then move into the action planning. And so once we've spent this time to delve in to understand all of the, uh, the complexities in these areas of focus, uh, it will then be, how do we again approach that collaborative effort to bring all parties in to say, how do we collectively divine, design action plans to address what we find? And so that would be looked to be uh, planned and implemented just a few months after we've been able to find the findings. And there may be some that take longer and some that we can be able to implement immediately. Like for instance, there are some parts of this work that's already started, uh, you know, in terms of looking at uh, work conditions and progress and barriers in the workplace. Through OFSI, we've already started some of those conversations to really get a start on that work. And uh, with the curriculum review, we've already started the work with the project team around looking at uh, social studies and history from a K-12. So those, from K-12 perspective, those are things that we're probably gonna be able to implement in terms of action plans more quickly in areas in which the work has already started. All right, thank but again, you. We'll be able to map that out specifically uh, as we learn and then and develop the project plan and respond to what we find. Okay. Comments, questions? I saw Dr. Daka, I didn't know if she did, but she went. Oh, I'm sorry. I Something happened with my camera before. Okay, and, okay. Uh, yes. Yeah. So I'm, I'm back. 
Okay, so go ahead and ask your, do you have a comment okay. or question okay. about? Yeah, you've all heard this already. And uh, Okay, say it again. I, 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 what? You've heard this already, <laughs> but I thank uh, Mrs. O'Neill for bringing it up that I have been working on this forever. And I know I talked a little bit earlier about um, the, all the plans that we have. If people don't understand what implicit bias is or they don't understand what bias is anyway, then they're not going to be able to correct their behaviors to do a better job with the kids. So we've got to do some of that. And I was recommending that we tune in to um, Council Member Jawando, uh, who is speaking with Dr. Ibram Kendi, who teaches at AU, who's written books on how not to be a racist and stamped from the beginning. I think these are very valuable conversations. It'll be Thursday at 6.30. And uh, if you don't know how to get into that, I'm sure that we can get somebody in our office to tell you how to do that. The other thing that I was concerned about was another book called White Fragility. And I can't recommend it enough so that you understand how people are thinking and why they're thinking the way they do and that they don't realize some of the things that they're doing. Because if we don't get to that, we're not gonna be able to make that many changes in the classroom. And I wanna commend Dr. Uh, McKnight for uh, working on this with staff and to Dr. Smith, if you did not read his review or his opinion in Bethesda Magazine, please do that. And it just so happens that the history uh, organization in Montgomery County sent out a letter talking um, very extensively about the two lynchings that you mentioned in your opinion piece, Dr. Smith. And it talked about how it happened, where it happened, who the people were involved. So it just kind of coincided with that. But these are things that we really have to work on. And uh, it's not just a nice, enough to say would be nice. We have to think about what is it when we say, I bought my house so that my kids could go to this school or that neighborhood. I, I don't want to live in that neighborhood. And it happens to be all black and Hispanic. I mean, these are things that happen in our minds and sometimes we talk about them. And we just have to re-engage ourselves with that. And uh, you also, uh, I think it was uh, Ms. Wolf who mentioned expectations. In uh, the last conversation that we had, and expectations are what we're talking about. Because if teachers don't have expectations of the students to succeed, they're not going to. If they don't get the time to respond, if they're not called on equitably, if they do not get clues, then it's not going to really work for kids because then they're passed over and the student feels, well, that teacher just doesn't like me and that's the end of it. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Dr. Baca. Okay, Dr. McKnight, I think that um, is all of the board member questions. Okay, Ms. Sylvester, you want to answer a question? You want to ask a question now in the comment? I don't, I haven't had a turn yet, so. Okay, go ahead, yeah, go ahead. Can you hear me? Yeah. Um, so thank you, Dr. McKnight, uh, for the presentation. Um, I think something that is um, very important is when we use the term anti-racist, that we have some common understanding of what we're talking about. I think um, we are all in different places in our journeys to understanding anti-racism, our own bias, uh, the, the baggage that we come with. And so I, I think it's important um, that we uh, define it a little bit more so that we're all on the same page as uh, you move forward with this work. Um, as, I, as I see it, is um, these are areas of work that the system has been working on for quite a long time. Uh, the achievement gap, the diversity of our, of our uh, teacher workforce, for example. And so as I'm hearing you, I, I see this as a tool that say our principals and our school communities can use uh, to make sure that they're, they're building a community where uh, anti-racist practices are being implemented. So um, I hope that I am correct in that, in terms of how we're going to use this, um, this information. Um, I do worry about uh, launching this in our current climate of COVID and, and uh, online versus in-person hybrid models. So I hope it doesn't get uh, 
launched and then forgotten because we are so busy with uh, our current crisis. Um, I would, um, I do want to uh, piggyback on what Dr. Daka said about bias, uh, because I think that's a big part of this. And I wonder where in your six areas um, that would be tackled. Um, and I wrote here um, the date. Um, oh, and I, I know that our students have written us and testified a lot around um, anti-racist curriculum, staff diversity, and bias training. Those are some of the things that we heard over and over again. Um, and I, I believe that you're going to tell us more details about our secondary social studies curriculum, uh, but um, I, I'll stop here and uh, see if you have any response for me. Sure. Thank you, Ms. Silvestri. Um, I will first say that it's actually unfortunate that um, a public murder on video of George Floyd uh, is what pushed this to become everybody's problem. It was a problem before that, but it made it real for those who may not have had a lived experience or may not have made a personal connection to what all of this means. And so as we think about COVID-19 and what it represents, you have a health pandemic on top of racial tensions that already existed that just put certain groups of people, particularly of color, that in a more vulnerable place. And I say that because COVID-19 at this point should be nothing more than a motivator for this to be something that makes it not a nonstop effort for everyone. Um, and yes, I appreciate you raising the point of we're going to have to be very strategic as we are in our recovery plan, as we are even with connecting with one another about how we do this, because this work is very personal. It's about having a personal connection to it that makes it real for everybody. And we will have to be very thoughtful and lead on our internal expertise and external expertise to help us figure out how to exactly do that so that it doesn't get lost and it still is as real and prevalent as an impacting to everybody amidst what's going on. So I appreciate you raising that because uh, if nothing else, everyone should know this is a commitment of the system and it has to be now. Um, and then in addition to that, I, I continue to say, you know, we, we uh, discussed earlier about the progress in the secondary curriculum. I shared that when I actually talked about the curriculum audit and how we pulled in groups of community members and students to help inform where do we start with this work. And we'll continue to give updates to the board on that. Um, and that along with all of the other areas is we think about professional development. If we were to pull out every six of these areas, workforce diversity analysis, I would imagine there are gonna be implications that come out of that work group that says, how do we train and support our recruiters and our staffers to really do their job with the lens of how to do it around race and equity. When we think about uh, evaluation of school cultures, how are we working with our students to understand everybody's experience that's represented in their peer group outside of their own? That's professional development for our students. When we think about work conditions and progress and barriers, there are gonna be professional, implica professional development implications for every supervisor, every leadership level, including myself, that really says, how do I need to think about my own professional development and providing the professional development elders to make sure I'm, concrete, I'm creating the work conditions uh, as a supervisor within the system that has a lens or an anti-racist lens to make sure I'm creating the environment for everyone. So the professional implications I would imagine would be different in all of these areas and very focused on each of the areas so that it is differentiated to the need. So I, I appreciate you bringing that up because professional learning will be a big part of this. And I think when we, as we talk about professional learning, we've also got to reflect and said, what about our professional learning that has, that, that we've done that's worked, that's helped us make progress, but how do we also do that a bit differently? Earlier, Ms. Dixon was bringing, uh, you know, was talking about Twitter in terms of a communication tool for our students. Well, if we put them in a room and we just want them to talk, um, that may be how what appear what what may resonate with some of them, 
But what are the efforts and how we communicate them in spaces that are meaningful to them that we have to consider in this work? This plan is about differentiating for the needs of people and really taking a step back and looking at how do we differentiate and, and we're gonna take, it's gonna take everybody's effort to do it and to have that list. So I appreciate and, your questions, Mr. Sebastian. And I would just add that um, some school communities know some of this information already. Um, and so they will, maybe they, what they need is help tackling uh, some persistent problems at their school level. And so I think we, sh we should be very open to um, encouraging school leaders to ask for help because sometimes that's hard to do. But when you have, you know your data and you're, you're stuck, um, I think that we should be prepared to reach out and help in each of these areas. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, Dr. McKnight. You can continue on with the presentation if you, um, if you want. I don't see any more questions from board members. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Evans. And if it's okay with the board, I will then move on to our recovery uh, plan because that's our next, uh, next part in terms of how actually what I just framed leads into that. So as Dr. Smith stated earlier, this has been a monumental effort of many, many staff members and community members to be able to develop a framework around how we consider the impact of COVID-19 on our school community and how do we think about a plan to bridge those gaps and really think about how we continue to educate our students in a meaningful way while considering our current health conditions and guidance that's been uh, put out there for us to follow. So throughout the spring, summer, and now in the fall, we've engaged multiple stakeholder groups to collaborate around the best way to educate our students and maintain safety for everyone in our community, which always and will continue to be our priority. This includes uh, a variety of staff who have represented what this means for them in a number of different roles, parents, community members, local government agencies, um, many who have come together to have been a part of this work to help us problem solve around priorities in the framework. Throughout the continuity of learning plan that we initiated in the spring and the summer recovery efforts, as well as planning for the fall, we've continued to work collaboratively with the Department of Health and Human Services and the education mission area to implement the health guidance to ensure that our students' learning experiences will continue while maintaining the safety of our community. We're gonna to continue to work with Dr. Gales, our Montgomery County Department of Health and Human Services representative, and Dr. Earl Stardard, the director of Montgomery County Office of Emergency Management and Homeland Security, and their respective teams to help us find a path moving forward in the right way that again protects our health environment as we think about the learning environment that we have to create for our students and staff. So based on the guidance, the safest way that we have been advised throughout the planning of this process to return to school is to focus on three areas. And those three areas are to implement physical distancing, to wear face coverings, and to sanitize hands regularly in the environment. And so our goal has been to be able to reduce the risk as much as possible while providing students with a rich learning experience in person and remotely. Having said that, we recognize that we will need to address adaptations based on specific student needs. And that's where our differentiation will really need to come in and we'll lean in on much of our community members to help us form and fill in the pieces of a framework to address just that. So both the Department of Education, uh, the Board of Education, and Department of Health and Human Services have engaged in school walkthroughs so that they could experience what a school setup would be like and what the experience would be in the fall. And I must say those have been some very meaningful uh, tours. And in just a moment, you're going to hear from uh, our extraordinary team who have committed much time, attention, detail, and collaboration um, over the past few months to really develop this framework with as much meaning and consideration um, and, uh, like I said, collaboration with others. And that team consists of Dr. Wilson, our Chief of Teaching and Learning in Schools, Mrs. McGuire, our Associate Superintendent of Operations, who I might add have organized these tours for internal staff, media, everyone who's wanted to come through and get the experience from the school building. I wanna firstly thank Ms. McGuire for that. Um, our associate superintendent, she's our associate superintendent of operations. 
and Dr. Travis Gale is the County Health Officer and Chief of Public Health Services for Montgomery County Department of Health and Human Services. He's been involved um, and have really got, given us great direction. Ms. Hazel, our Associate Superintendent of Curriculum and Instructional Programs. Ms. Rubin, our Associate Superintendent of Student and Family Support and Engagement. And Mr. Turner, our Chief of Engagement, Innovation and Operations have all worked thoroughly together and with others to develop this framework. And throughout our presentation, you're gonna hear how they've engaged with the community, health officials and other educational entities in a collaborative effort and as collaborative partners. And they're gonna share how they work with those community members to actually build this framework. We'll conclude this presentation with a communication plan to ensure the community knows how we will engage with them after this presentation and throughout the summer, all the way to the opening of school, acknowledging that we know we're gonna to have to have much contact and on a regular basis to work, talk through, learn, and adjust as needed. We will ensure that we'll use various methods to hear feedback and answer questions. This feedback will inform any adjustments that we need to make to the plan so that we have the best plan possible in the fall. And so at this time, I'll turn it over to Dr. Wilson who will begin the presentation on the recovery framework. Thank you, Dr. McKnight. Good afternoon, board members and Dr. Smith. It's certainly a pleasure to provide you with this initial draft as we continue to plan for school year 2021. As you have heard, the draft recovery framework for MCPS has many moving parts. And as we consider and collaborate with partners and hear from you and our public, we must acknowledge the realities and the complexities of this planning now for an implementation that is seven weeks away. However, we must be prepared to react and respond accordingly. As we move, and as we've heard around the country, systems that released plans early are now reversing or reconsidering them within the context of safety concerns. I wanna thank those who submitted over 4,185 comments to our plan. As expected, some ideas are offered as well as criticism and praise, all of which is expected during this uncertain time. This plan is a starting point, providing ways of thinking about the range of implementation possibilities from a virtual only to a blended virtual learning model. The blended learning model is an optimum approach, which is intended to provide very important in-person learning time for every student provided the conditions are right. On a continuum, there are many other delivery models in between those two models, save being able to fully return all students to school. In this work, the uniqueness of each school comes into play as it always does. There will be new variables that will contribute to what a school-based teaching and learning model will look like in the fall and how they will go about planning for it. It would be, it would, it would, I would like to raise two of those variables and you will hear more variables a little later on in the presentation that will impact the school-based modeling. These variables are that schools must know staff availability and location, who will be available and how will they be teaching virtually or in person? And the second variable is that schools must know the desire their families have for their children. Who will learn in a virtual setting or what families would like their children to have an in-person in experience? Together, these variables along with safety guidelines will dictate the operational model at each school. In this presentation, we will provide initial thinking um, about several items that are here on our table of contents. We don't know what the future will bring, but we do know that it's important for us to have guiding principles, that we engage our community in our development activities, that we are mindful of MSDE's guidelines for opening schools and plan accordingly. Um, we also want to share with you today the, uh, some selected results from a parent and staff survey. Uh, we will be focusing on just a few of those results, but the entire survey will be available on our website 
on the main page as well as the, the fall recovery webpage. The presentation will also include operational considerations in terms of the student and staff experience in an in-person model. We will also provide information about the blended learning and virtual only models. We'll provide some sample academic schedules. Also, we'll be hearing about our preparations specific to Be Well 365, and you'll be hearing more about additional plan communication, our next steps, and our feedback strategies. Next slide, please. Our guiding principles for reopening school, certainly first and foremost, we have to ensure the safety and wellness of our students and staff. We must seek to deliver high quality instruction to students regardless of the delivery model. And as you've heard today, we must continue the emphasis on equity, ensuring that we continue to maintain an emphasis of all means all. We have to optimize the use of our resources, our space, We've done a considerable amount of capacity studies in terms of our buildings as we think about the models of delivery. And we also have prioritized community and stakeholder engagement in the ongoing development of the plan. Next slide, please. Our engagement approach has really three prongs thus far. The involvement of multiple officers, offices, the use of stakeholder groups, and the use of surveys. In addition to supporting our summer work, multiple officers are coming together to examine challenges, the constraints, the solutions, and a way forward so that we can bring to you policy implications at the August board meeting based on our delivery models. There's been very close coordination, as Dr. McKnight stated, with the Department of Health and Human Services throughout this whole process. We continue to model, model plans, if-then scenarios, if you will. What if conditions change? How does that provide for us to have additional options? Conducting building capacity analysis has been integral to understanding how many students we can serve in an in-person setting. And at the same time, be sure that we're being mindful of all safety precautions and reduce safety risks to the fullest degree possible. We're also planning for, of course, the necessary safety equipment. The other two prongs are the stakeholder engagement piece and last but not least, a parent and staff survey that was recently um, conducted. Next slide, please. I'd like to remind the uh, board and our viewers about the eight deliverable committees that have worked over the last several weeks and months to not only design the summer program, but also to think about our fall contingencies. Those teams are curriculum and instruction and assessment team, a professional learning de deliverables team, a, the Be Well 365 team, policy and review, technology innovation team, recovery communications team, and certainly our health and operations team, as well as our summer school design team. I wanna take a minute and acknowledge uh, the 320 representatives and the entities that they do represent in this planning. We certainly have our central office staff, the deputy superintendent, in all of our various offices. We have the school-based staff, our principals, teachers, paraeducators, and support staff, and also our employee associations, Montgomery County Education Association, Montgomery County Association of Administrators and Principals, and also our Service Employees International Union. We also have an array of community stakeholder involvement. Montgomery County Council of of Parent Teacher Association, Identity, Black and Brown Coalition, the 1977 Two Group, External Partnerships, Individual Parents. We also have our student achievement groups for our Asian, African American, Latino communities, as well as our Special Education Advisory Committee. Next slide, please. 
I'd like to also remind you that the considerations for the MCPS fall recovery plan in part are driven by some requirements from MSDE. And these are the requirements, these are newly revised uh, re requirements and guidance for phase two. We must develop and submit our local education plan with a plan for communication. We have to incorporate equity as a core component in the local recovery plan. We have to establish our local education recovery stakeholder groups, which are well underway. We have to identify learning gaps and instructional placement of our students. As they return to us, we have to understand the impact of COVID-19 has had on our students' learning and their progress. We have to follow and maintain curricular frameworks and the Maryland College and Career Readiness Standards. We have to adhere to all components of IDEA, the Section 504 and the Rehabilitation Act and ADA. We have to adopt and follow health procedures outlined for our students by MSDE, the Maryland Department of Health and the CDC. And we have to ensure safe transportation for all students and develop systems of tracking attendance. As you recall, the third prong was a parent and staff survey. I'd like to spend some time talking a little bit about the thoughts and the ideas that are coming across from our community. For our parent survey, we had over 55,839 responses submitted to an online parent survey. We offered the survey in seven languages. You can see the breakdown there. The majority, of course, was in English, preferred to answer in English, and then the breakdown of our community. I think it's extremely important to point out that when we administered this survey, we did so by zip code because we wanted to monitor along the way um, the participation rates of people who geographically reside in different areas of the county. In order to um, gather more input, we worked with our partners in communication and we did an abbreviated telephone survey start targeting those regions where we weren't getting the returns that we would like. So we uh, got additional 7,000 responses as a result of those efforts. The staff survey yielded 16,965 responses to an online survey. The results presented today will highlight four areas from the survey. And I wanna remind you again, the survey will be available on our website on the main page and also on the fall recovery in more detail. So we're going to look at the return to school, what people are saying about in-person learning or working in buildings, the need for transportation, access to devices for virtual teacher and or learning, and also the important factors for deciding whether or not parents are going to return their children to an in-person learning opportunity, provided we, that we can provide one, or um, our staff returning to the work site. First, we will examine the uh, in-person learning or virtual learning preference when we compare parents and, and what's with what staff had to say. I'm going to read these in a little different order than they're displayed on the screen for the purpose of comparing each of the like data points relative to staff and parents. When we surveyed our parents, 42% of the nearly 56,000 respondents to the parent survey indicated they plan to send their children for in-person instruction. That is compared to 25% of respondents to the staff survey indicated that they would like to return for in-person work. Looking at the second metric, 22% of respondents to the parent survey indicated that they plan to have their children complete virtual only instruction. And 52% of the respondents to the staff survey indicated that they would like to have the opportunity to work virtually. And the last question was 35% of respondents to the parent survey indicated they have not decided 
whether to send their children for in-person instruction or virtual only instruction. Whereas 22% of respondents to the staff survey indicated they were not yet sure about in-person work or working virtually. Next slide, please. On the parent survey, we ask whether their child requires school system or public transportation to get to school. 60% of the respondents to the parent survey indicated their child requires transportation. We recognize we need to follow up on this question to determine which families plan to have their child ride the school bus to school and will do so through a parent registration process to begin later in the month of July. Next slide, please. Included in both the parent and staff survey were questions about access to a device and internet access. 93% of respondents to the parent survey indicated their children have access to a device for virtual learning. We know in some households, there may be a need to share a device and wanted to know how many families may be in this situation. 87% indicated their child has access to a, a device that they can use anytime for virtual learning. We also ask about internet access with 89% indicating their child has reliable access to high-speed internet. For the staff survey, 96% of the respondents indicated having access to a device, 88% indicated having access to a device that they can use anytime, and 79% indicated they had reliable high-speed access. Next slide, please. In this slide, we do a forced identification. Respondents to the parent survey were asked to identify the three most important factors when deciding which schedule is best for their family. 70% indicated wanting a consistent schedule every week. 70% indicated wanting a schedule that allows for receiving live instruction from teachers. And 65% indicated wanting a schedule that allows for sufficient cleaning of the building. I believe that when you see some of the uh, schedule considerations and options, and again, these are just considerations at this point, you'll see some of these variables inside of those recommendations. Next slide, please. Respondents to the parent survey were asked to indicate importance of a number of factors in deciding whether to send their child to school in the fall. Here we highlight those that had at least 50% or higher marked as very important. You will notice that 92% indicated physical health and safety of their child as very important. 64% indicated maintaining social distancing in the classroom seating was very important and 55% indicated staggering recess and lunch times to reduce crowding. And 55% also indicated equity of student access and opportunity is very important. Additionally, 54% indicated a staggered school day option to reduce crowding of total students in the building as very important. I wanted to mention that the areas that did not hit the 50% for our parent survey included the child's social needs, transportation to and from school, and nutritional needs. And last but not least, we look at the same um, factors about st steady schedules and safety um, in our staff survey. Similar to the parent survey, respondents to the staff survey were asked to indicate importance of the number of factors in deciding to return their, to their work location in the fall. Here we highlight those that had 50% or higher as very important. 93% indicated health and safety as very important. 90% indicated plans for implementing safety practices and reporting and recording incidences was very important. 80% indicated equity of student access and opportunity as important. 
and 65% indicated a staggered schedule to reduce crowding of total numbers of students or staff in a building as very important. Areas that were less than 50% for as being very important included using a combination of face-to-face -face and remote working to ensure social distancing and returning to the classroom or work on a regular schedule with per personal protection equipment. And last but not least, transportation to and from work. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Wilson. So what we'll do now is we'll open it up for board comments and questions. And I will start with Mr. Asante. Ms. Evans, I'm sorry. I was wondering, oh, I know. Oh, hold on, Nick. I'm sorry, Dr. McKnight. We, we were moving to the operations part from Ms. McGuire. Oh, okay, okay, <laughs> okay, okay. You can hold your questions until a second. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Yes, as, um, as we think about um, returning to an in-person on-site experience. We do know that the framework of how we will implement the public health guidance that we receive from our federal, state, and local officials is key to understanding how students can re return to school. We have worked to develop the practices and processes that can be the foundation to build the in-person school day in our new environment. And what we would like to do now is highlight for you some of the central aspects of this work in regards to health and safety, transportation, food services, and of course the reduced capacity that we will need to observe in our school buildings and spaces. Next slide, please. As Dr. McKnight highlighted earlier, the primary elements of the health and safety measures that we will be need to be uh, mindful of implementing really relate to face coverings, hand sanitizing and hand washing, and physical distancing. And the measures that you see outlined here on this slide really stem from and support those primary measures. Um, we have other practices that relate to having fewer students in schools to allow more space between people in classrooms and in the buildings. We have increased our cleaning and our ordering protocols to reflect the health guidance related to high touch areas and to reduce sharing of materials. And then we also will be working towards visual reminders such as posters, signs, decals, and other materials that can really be helpful reminders in our schools. So next slide, please. Transportation is one of the most challenging services to implement while maintaining the required physical distancing. The guidelines for transportation do limit the capacity in a bus to approximately 25% of our typical service ability. Um, clearly, that's a, a very significant impact. And what we will really work to do is work with families to sign up for transportation so that we can understand very um, specifically the need of families for transportation and then allocate our school bus resources to make the most effective use of our buses to support families um, with transportation to school. Next slide, please. Food service is another uh, operational service that will look very different. And we anticipate students eating lunch in classrooms to really minimize the large group gatherings. Um, we, would, we would avoid uh, large group gatherings in cafeterias and other spaces. Um, we do have some practices now in certain areas um, related to providing food in classrooms. So we're familiar with that practice. And we certainly would continue all of our safe food um, no sharing, our allergy plans, all of our safe food handling practices in the classroom setting as well. The next slide, please. Implementing the physical distancing requirements will really affect every aspect of the school day. And in order to support this, we're creating materials to support training and communications that we want to be useful to our principals, our school teams, our staff, and also our students and families. We want to provide examples and approaches of how to implement this guidance, as well as help people understand what to expect that the school day may look like. Here's an example slide that you can see that talks about arrival practices, which of course we will have to manage in a way that minimizes the gatherings um, and minimizes students being in large groups outside of the building. 
We will, um, again, have practices that maintain that distancing and help students move into the building in some different ways than we do currently. You'll also notice on our example slides that we reinforce each time the importance of, of face coverings and, of course, the critical importance of staying home if you are sick uh, or have any symptoms. The next slide, please. Here's another training example slide that really talks about distancing in the classroom. Many of our elementary school classrooms use tables rather than desks, as I uh, am sure that folks are familiar with. And so what we need to do are talk through examples of how do we use that furniture? How do we use those configurations? And how can we stage the room in a way that supports instruction, supports our students, and also maintains the distancing that we know is important? The next slide, please. So in addition to tables, of course, we also have desks in our upper classrooms. Those, um, those can be a little easier to configure. The, dis the guidance does indicate that students should face the same direction. Um, and again, we would have that spacing within the building um, and, and really look to that six feet distancing for students. As we've been discussing, maintaining that distance does limit and following the guidelines does limit the number of students that we can have in classes and in the buildings at one time. And that capacity analysis has been very important to inform, again, how we can approach thinking about an in-person experience uh, for our schools. So at this time, we would like to share two types of video resource materials that we are preparing. And again, we're really looking at a range of multiple types of training, demonstration, communication, having resources to share so that folks can understand um, what to expect and how to uh, successfully uh, implement the day. The videos that we're going to look at here demonstrate the physical distancing aspects of organizing school spaces in the school day. And we have one that uses animation to illustrate that. And we have another one that provides some um, simulation experience in a school environment. School districts across the United States are making decisions about how to return to school safely during the COVID-19 pandemic. Safety is our primary concern as we think through and consider options for school this fall. Normal school operations and procedures now present significant difficulties, as are the directives we must follow from the State Board of Education and the Maryland Health Department. Getting to, getting into, and being in school have to be done in new ways. There are a multitude of challenges, complications, and constraints. Critical tools such as distancing, hand washing and personal protective equipment, such as wearing masks, are simple steps to keep students and staff safe. In addition, we must maintain a minimum of six feet between each other, which is a challenge to do in a school setting. If your child rides the bus, they will need to sit in a marked seat, alternating every other row. And when arriving at school, students will need to line up and enter the building, maintaining social distancing. If students are dropped off by car, their arrival will need to be staggered as well. School arrival and departure will take substantially more time, people, and planning. And once in the classroom, students will see a different setup with fewer desks and markers on the floor to help adhere to social distancing protocols. Students will not be allowed to share materials such as crayons or computers. In order to have the space necessary to socially distance, MCPS is considering a staggered schedule to alternate days of in-school learning with more robust online or virtual learning. This will reduce the number of students and staff in school per day. If families are uncomfortable with their students returning to campus, they may choose a full-time online distance learning option. For the most updated information about our fall recovery plan, please visit the MCPS website and search recovery. Regardless of the exact plan of action, MCPS, if necessary, is prepared to fluidly shift back to expanded online learning or a blended approach. MCPS is dedicated to providing a safe, welcoming, inclusive, and supportive environment where all children can reach their full potential. school bus every other seat. First, a whole lot fewer kids on the bus. The guidelines do say every other seat, and that takes our capacity 
to about 25% of our regular capacity. Arrive at school and social distance. Students arrive at the school and line up along the, um, the corridors and the, and the walkway. In a kindergarten classroom, room for just 12 to 15 students. These tables are six feet long, so if you have a chair at either end of them, they would be six feet apart. Higher grades, lunch in the classroom, and many fewer children. We do have desks, and the desks are configured again to be six feet apart. But if the tour of College Gardens Elementary in Rockville was designed to calm worried parents, Administrators still have a lot of work to do. I would say we're extremely concerned. I've yet to see evidence that things have changed in some significant way in terms of a vaccine or you know, effective treatment or rapid testing and tracing. Adam Tomaszewski has three daughters in Montgomery County Schools. His oldest is nervous too. You know, I'm kind of worried about going back because I don't feel like my school in particular is very small classrooms and hallways and I don't really feel like there's a way at least right now that we can do that safely. My seven-year-old even now it's like anytime I take her out to a restaurant or she touches everything touches her face no matter how many times you tell them that. We are still awaiting the results of a countywide parent survey that just closed. Helen Barold is a single mom. Our kids they need to go back to school. I strongly strongly believe this. You're a doctor, you're a cardiologist. Do you understand mm -hmm. infection control? And you think it can be done? I do think it can be done. Not everyone is convinced. Bruce Lashan, WUSA. As we return students to school in the new environment, it will be important to phase in that return gradually. And that is uh, an important feature that we want to think about. We want to allow everyone the time to adjust, to get used to their new school surroundings and the routines. Um, and it will also allow us to make any necessary adjustments as we move through our experiences and through the beginning of the school year. The school year will begin on August 31st and we will start the school year in an all virtual model. And this sequencing that you see here represents one possible approach to the gradual return. Of course, we will continue to refine and modify this as we continue to plan, as we continue to receive feedback, and as we continue to work with our colleagues um, in other agencies and across the system. At this time, I will turn back over to Dr. McKnight, uh, and I believe she will introduce Dr. Gales, who we are very appreciative of being here. Thank you so much, Ms. McGuire, for reviewing the operations of our recovery plan. And at this time, I'd like to first thank Dr. Gales, who have been a partner with MCPS from the beginning of managing this health pandemic to where we are right now. And we're excited to have him join us here today um, as he can share additional perspectives around uh, where we are as a county and his collaboration efforts with our school system. So at this time, I will turn it over to Dr. Travis Gales. Welcome, Dr. Gales. Good afternoon and good to be here with you all. Thank you for the opportunity. Uh, to speak with you all. Um, and I just want to echo what Dr. McKnight mentioned. Um, it's been a joy and a privilege working very closely with Dr. Smith, Dr. McKnight, and the rest of the MCPS team. And I know that uh, they've been put in a tough position, uh, well, we all are in terms of reopening things, and they've worked very hard to come up with strategies. Uh, this is all obviously pursuant if we are able to move forward with this. Uh, and if as the parents mentioned, as I'm sure you've talked about, if the data allows us to move forward. Um, so first I wanna share that there is a lot that we know about COVID-19 uh, and there's still a lot that we're still learning. Uh, and I think back to when schools were closed in March, uh, we had a certain level that we knew and we're continuing to grow our body of evidence and knowledge four months later. I also think it's important to provide a health conditions context um, framework uh, for you to hear in terms of how we have progressed. Uh, when you looked at the schematic, uh, the slide here, compared to national trends, the state of Maryland and Montgomery Co County are showing a distinct bell curve uh, because of the safety measures that have been put into place. Uh, the state acted and the, the local jurisdiction acted very quickly uh, in terms of implementing strategies to mitigate transmission, 
uh, such as closing schools and closing businesses. Uh, and this information is the type of information that's driving the guidance being provided to the school system for reopening so that we can continue to see a decline in cases. This data will also assist us in outlining the larger framework that will help determine how we respond moving forward. And I'd just like to provide some additional context. Again, no one today is saying we're going to move forward uh, in terms of moving to a new phase. It's just in terms of providing uh, additional context. So when we look at the number of cases, uh, we have had over 15,000 cases in, in Montgomery County, um, which is part of 73,000 cases. It's actually, according to this morning's numbers, right at 70, 74,000. Uh, and within that, we have we definitely saw a significant uh, number of cases in April and May, and those numbers have decreased significantly. In Montgomery County, in fact, we have tested over 11% of our population, and uh, we have conducted over 135,000 tests. In addition to that, our test positivity, which is a measure of how many folks we're testing, which we are now ha we have daily high totals of the number of folks we're testing. Um, and that's a function of how many who test on a daily basis come back positive. That percentage has dropped significantly, uh, whereas, and I think back in uh, May, we had a high test positivity of 40%. Currently, our test positivity throughout the county for all geographic areas and racial and ethnic groups and ages is 4.2%. It's actually lower than the state average of 46 as of this morning. So as many of you know, the governor has not moved us into phase three of reopening. In addition, Montgomery County has moved at phases at a slower rate than the governor's office as a result of our initial higher number of cases in comparison to other Maryland counties. This is, a, I think, a, a, a good reason why we're continuing to see positive trends and results currently in our data and why we will continue to utilize this method in terms of reopening activities in the county and providing guidance to reopen our schools. However, we know that these trends can change if we're not vigilant in adhering to the best practices for safety, and that includes wearing face coverings, we have a mandate requiring face coverings in our county and jurisdiction for individuals over the age of two, and we will continue to tweak that and adjust that per CDC guidance, as well as making sure that provisions are put into place with any individuals who have any type of medical condition that will complicate or make it difficult for them to adhere to that policy. We also wanna make sure that people continue to adhere to physical distancing when in spaces around others outside of their household and networks. And the one tried and true measure that I learned way back in kindergarten and continued through medical school and medical practice, and here we are in public health, is making sure that you wash your hands frequently and clean surfaces. Well, I've had the opportunity to engage with MCPS leadership as a part of the walkthrough of the College Gardens Elementary School last week. And we believe that MCPS has put forward a plan that leverages these best practices more from a risk reduction perspective, uh, because quite frankly, everything that we're doing is really risk reduction um, in terms of mitigating risk based upon the surveillance data and opening up activities based upon what we consider to be lower risk in terms of transmission. And again, I want to emphasize that the plan that MCPS has put forward uh, is an evolving plan. Um, and in terms of how to move forward, it's content. Their plan of reopening, you all's plan of reopening is contingent upon us as a larger society to be able to move forward uh, and be able to do activities, not only including schools, but other activities to be safe. We know that the landscape and safety guidelines are evolving um, and dozens of medical science and education based pro groups have provided input, uh, including the American Academy of Pediatrics, which I am a member um, as both a health official and a pediatrician. I understand the different sides of the argument from a developmental point of view that being in person at schools is the best way for children to learn and recognizing that for virtual learning that also may be impacted by disparities in terms of access to technology and other issues. However, from a public health as well as a pediatric perspective, we also need to keep and consider the balance of keeping children safe, not only children, but teachers and other staff as well. This is why we need to continue to be cautious about how we go about reopening schools. I've spoken with MCPS at length on my visit. 
uh, and in other conversations, and they raise the realities of children and the strict, the diff potential difficulty in adhering to the strict safety protocols at all times. We know that young children are going to have a difficult time with face coverings, as do most adults, really. We also know that kids will have to pull down their masks to keep classrooms, and we know that young students will struggle to keep their distance from one another. And I would say having a teenage niece, as well as being an adolescent physician, we know that teenagers also have a difficult time staying away from one another. Um, and as I've shared with them, our focus again is on reduction of risk, recognizing that um, as, as a lot of concerns say, you know, none of these activities will be 100% elimination of risk. Through the use of face coverings, physical distance, and hand washing, we can dramatically mitigate risk of exposure, however. Now, one thing I want to pivot to and, and end with before turning back over to Dr. McKnight is if things move forward and schools are allowed to reopen, and let me level set that and preface that by meaning that one, if we're in a space for schools to reopen physic, for physical in-person uh, instruction, that means we've made some more tremendous strides in terms of where we stand from a surveillance and a data perspective. And so schools would not be the only thing reopening per se. There would be a host of other activities where we have moved forward in reopening, which shows that we have driven the, even though yes, we have an average daily case now around 55 to 70 on a daily basis, it means we've driven that number down even more. And so we're seeing less evidence and burden of the virus in our community, uh, which means that as things open up, there's less risk of transmission of the virus from person to person. And as one of the parents who referenced in the video is, also, uh, a part of that is advancements of technology, and hopefully we'll be able to see continued improvements in treatment and the potential for vaccine opportunities as well to keep people safe. Now, if there were, again, in that setting, if there is a suspected case of COVID-19 within a school system, that we would work closely with the school to engage in the contact tracing process. So we do have opportunities to do large-scale testing now using self-collection mechanisms that are less invasive. And we also do have a robust contact tracing operation uh, that we partner with the state to be able to track cases that test positive quickly and to conduct contact investigations within those settings. The Department of Health and Human Services will make decisions or will help make decisions uh, in terms of closure and individuals who are identified to be at risk uh, of exposure who need to be quarantined and to get follow-up uh, testing. Those decisions will be made on a case-by-case -case basis based upon those specific facts. We'll continue to work collaboratively with MCPS in order to appropriately train staff on safety protocols, guidelines, and procedures as we move forward. So thank you again for the opportunity to speak with you all. I think we'll have some time for questions, but for now, I'll turn it back over to Dr. McKnight. Thank you again, Dr. Gales, for being here with us today. Uh, as you can imagine, Dr. Gales has uh, committed this hour to us, and I know he's due to be uh, in another uh, really important meeting at 3.30, so he will be here for uh, our, our question and discussion uh, part, which will probably start at three o'clock. We do have a few more slides to just uh, uh, tee up a few things around school reentry, BWL 365, and the overall communication and timeline plan. So with that, we're gonna wrap up with those areas and continue the presentation on the recovery of education plan. And next you're gonna hear from Ms. Hazel to talk about reentry. Then Ms. Rubin will discuss quickly BWL 365, all we're doing with that, which is such an important component of our work. And Mr. Turner will wrap it up with the communication and timeline to share our continued involvement with the community on this recovery plan. Thank you again to the staff. And I'll turn it over to Ms. Hazel at this time. Okay, thank you. Hello. If we can go ahead and show the slides, I'm going to go ahead and start by discussing the instructional models that we are considering as we move into the fall. Uh, you've heard them already mentioned, but I will again just share the blended virtual learning model is one model in which students would go to school for a couple of days during the week, actually in the building. And the other model is the virtual only model where students would be in their home learning virtually for the uh, five days a week. 
I do want to uh, stress that this is different than the continuity of learning plan that we had in the spring. We also want to just mention again that in the event that we have to move into full virtual learning, we are prepared to do that. Um, and we will work, of course, with our state and local officials to make that decision. Next slide, please. We want to share with you some of the considerations um, that we discussed as we were thinking through our plans for um, our learning models. First of all, we want to stress again that our goal is to provide high quality instruction and learning experiences for all of our students, regardless of their environments, whether they're in a school building or whether they are at home. We want to ensure that it is a high quality experience and our students are learning the new content that is expected from the Maryland State Department of Education. We also um, are working to make sure that um, not only our virtual plan is in place, but that we are working to have as many students as possible return to the building when it is safe to do so on a rotating basis. As uh, you've heard, we've had thousands of family members and individuals who have already shared feedback about the plan that we've shared. And uh, we are going to take that feedback into consideration make some adjustments. And then on July 27th through August 7th, families will have an opportunity to go and decide whether or not they want their child to be a part of um, the blended virtual model or the virtual only learning model. And so we will continue to keep, um, keep that opportunity for families to give us their feedback until this time. Next slide. We want to stress again that in both models, we want to have our students experience more teacher-led instruction, whether that is face-to-face -face with a teacher and student in the same space, or whether that is virtual. Again, we want to stress that this is not the continuity of learning model. Our expectation is that our students will be learning new content um, in a live format most of the time, and that there will be times, however, that there will be asynchronous instruction taking place as well. And I want to just stress that asynchronous instruction is not students um, completing worksheets, but asynchronous instruction is students learning new content at a time and space that is most convenient to, to them. And our teachers would be delivering that asynchronous learning opportunity through either pre-recorded video, through um, videos that may introduce new topics. It could be through introducing new reading content to students, or it could also be through some face-to-face -face interaction between the teacher and student through conferencing or through uh, small groups of students um, pairing and talking to one another. So we want to ensure that our students have a very engaging opportunity as they move into the fall. Next slide, please. The other thing we want to share in terms of our considerations um, are that we have um, our special needs students, students who receive um, services through their IEPs in special education. We want to share with you that in that phase one, all of our discrete programs and our special schools will be included in that phase. And we also want you to be, uh, for the community to be certain that all of our students who have special education services would have those services scheduled throughout the week, whether they are in a school building or in their home. In addition, ESOL students would also have their, their services scheduled throughout the week. It could be individual services, small groups, or co-teaching. Finally, we want to um, prioritize those students who are transitioning to new levels. That's our pre-K K students, our sixth graders, and our ninth grade students. As they are entering new levels, we want to ensure that they have a smooth transition. Next slide. So at a very high level, we want to share with you 
uh, our thinking around the blended virtual model for those elementary and middle school students. These are the students that would be going into the building for two days a week. We would uh, put students in two groups based on last name, and we recognize that not every family member has the same last name, so we would also use the address. And they would be grouped in an A, a group or B group. Students in the A group would go to school physically in the building on Monday and Tuesday, while the students in the B group would be home learning virtually. Again, our, our goal is for live instruction with some asynchronous during that time. And then on Wednesday, all of our students in the district would be involved in asynchronous instruction. And then we would switch the groups for B students to go to school on Thursday and Friday with A students home virtually. Next slide, please. This is a sample elementary schedule. We've taken the times off because we want our families to understand right now, we will really have to be flexible as we allow the transportation and operations offices to really set the tone for when schools will start and when dismissal will happen. So we need to have that flexibility by school. In addition to that, we want you to be able to see that we would have a full day of instruction with two or three classes before lunch and then two or three after lunch, um, leaving time for intervention and also leaving time for social emotional learning and lessons. You can also see here that recess um, would occur, but we would have to ensure that it is staggered throughout the day and that we would maintain the dis distancing for safety. You can see here again, Wednesday is that asynchronous day of instruction, and then the B group would do the same schedule at the school building while the A students were home. Next slide. This is the middle school schedule. We've taken, taken an eight period day and broken it into two days. So middle school group A students would have their first four periods on Monday, and then we would have the next four periods on Tuesday. We do recognize there are some secondary schools that have a fifth period, while other fifth periods are lunch. So schools would need to be flexible in their scheduling. We also, again, want to remind you that the special education and ESOL services would be built in throughout uh, the week. Next slide, please. Our high school schedule is slightly different. You can see that we have three groups instead of two in order to get all of our students into the building and maintain the distancing. This shows a three week schedule and over a three week period of time, high school students would be in the building for a total of four times. You can see that the students would be alternating in person with one uh, periods one through four, and then they would be home with their virtual uh, synchronous or live instruction on the next day with periods six through eight. Again, that asynchronous model on Wednesday. We want to really stress and be very transparent with you that the high school schedule is probably the most challenging schedule because we have master scheduling is very complicated at the high school level. And we of course want to make sure that we are meeting all of the high school graduation credit requ requirements. And so we recognize that with this schedule, we have a lot of work to do to ensure that students would be able to receive all of their courses. The other thing that we want to put up front is that with all of these schedules, but particularly with high school, it really will, um, the decision about whether or not uh, certain teachers who teach certain classes um, coming back to the school building will determine the student experience. It is very possible for a student to go into the school building and have a class or two where they are taking that class on their Chromebook based on whether or not the teacher is available to teach that class in the building or at home. So those courses that um, where you may find only one or two teachers, particularly your elective courses or your higher level courses, 
um, may be areas that we really have to think very carefully about. Okay, if you can move on, skip actually to the next two slides, the next one, please. Now we share, we're sharing with you our virtual only learning models. If you can go back one slide to the elementary schedule, you can see here that elementary students would do, and this is at home, five days a week, Monday and Tuesday schedule where students would have class meeting and then two classes before lunchtime. And then they would have two classes after lunchtime, also keeping opportunities for the social emotional learning and small group or intervention time. You can see even with the virtual schedule that we would leave Wednesday for asynchronous opportunities. And then they would have the same repeating schedule on Thursday and Friday. We've left times off because at this time we are still um, negotiating time. But what we really want to make clear is that this is a longer um, in instructional experience than they experience in the springtime with the continuity of learning. And then our final schedule is the middle and high school virtual only schedule, which looks very similar to the blended model where students would be uh, in periods one through four on Monday and periods five through eight on Tuesday with that asynchronous time on Wednesday and then a repeat. Finally, we just, I just want to end um, with this last slide to just reiterate again that um, we are prepared to move into a virtual only model for all of our students uh, if needed. So at this time, I'm going to go ahead and uh, turn it over to Dr. McKnight. Thank you, Ms. Hazel. Uh, Ms. Rubin, you may proceed and then we will end with Mr. Turner. Alrighty, thank you, Dr. McKnight. Good afternoon, um, everyone. Uh, I'll be presenting on Be Well 365, um, the mental health and wellness supports that are available to students and staff members, um, which is really significant and important because one of the things that we're critically aware of is that um, when our students are well, uh, physically, psychologically, emotionally, then we see the results of that wellness in how they perform both academically and socially. And the same can be said for our staff members as well, especially given our current state of the pandemic with COVID-19, it is critically important that we factor in and be intentional about staff wellness so that our staff members are available to provide the level of instruction that we would like to see and know that they're very capable of doing for our students. And so the Be Well 365 model around the recovery is uh, extremely intentional about that. So first up, what we have on our next slide, you'll see is um, our recommendation for the purchase of a district-wide social emotional uh, learning curriculum. Um, many of you may be familiar with the fact that under the pandemic, our pandemic response for social, emotional, and psychological well being was that we worked together um, school psychologists, counselors, um, a variety of central services staff, school based teachers as well, um, pulling together a Montgomery County Public Schools SEL curriculum, which was always. Um, a component of the planning of the Be Well 365 work. Uh, with this, we don't expect that we will deliver a canned curriculum. However, we're looking at research base, what suits our um, community, our students well, and making sure that we match up with the cultural proficiency of all of that. So that is intentional work that is currently on, on, ongoing. Additionally, the creation of a social emotional screening tool that will support our schools in identifying students that are referred for more intensive, those tier two and tier three interventions. We understand that our counselors and psychologists currently have um, caseloads where we want to ensure that under the um, 
the tenuous circumstances that those students that require more intensive services have that and then the schools are equipped with a tool that assists them in identifying those students appropriately. And certainly for all of that, what is the professional learning that needs to happen and take place so that our, our staff members feel comfortable and equipped, knowledgeable, and how do we build the efficacy of all around the support of the social emotional learning and well being. And so on our next slide, we're talking about uh, mental health, wellness, and supports for staff. Um, as I mentioned earlier, this is extremely important. Many of our staff members are very familiar with the services, um, the resources offered through our employee assistance program. However, we are looking to intentionally make those widespread available, make sure that everyone understands what's available there, um, creating a library of easily accessible, translated short videos on a variety of topics to make sure that they're right at hand touch for our staff members. There are numerous classes that are already offered around health, wellness, and also the medical plan offerings that we have that are really robust in our system. How do we make sure that everyone is aware of those and know how to access them? Virtual learning opportunities on mindfulness practices. One of the things we were really proud of was lifting up the mindfulness moments, which were televised across YouTube and a variety of platforms and making sure that the mindfulness is available for students as well as staff creating the space for staff to recognize the support that they need to receive during this distance learning piece. And so the understanding that the Be Well Work really functions as a wraparound support to the entire district response. So once we finalized and we have things in place, the work is to make sure that we're supporting everyone in getting the things that they need. Definitely working across office with our union representatives to make sure that everyone has an understanding of employee needs. How do we build that confidence under the current um, pandemic and our response? How do we ensure that individuals are comfortable? You've heard a lot already today about the physical workplace and how that may look. And then what is the support that we're providing when those issues arise? And certainly, and, and I think probably most importantly at this time, I think Dr. McKnight led with that, is this concern and our response to the uh, cultural well-being of everyone um, that has been exasperated. It was always there, but now it's at the forefront. And certainly we understand the connection between that and the pandemic. So making sure that we're working closely with the equity unit to ensure the culturally responsiveness of all of the resources that are provided and the supports that are provided to students and staff. And finally, what is our communication plan around this? Um, for the Be Well 365, it's important for us uh, to make sure that students, staff, our community members understand that we are in different spaces, but we, you know, it's the same caring MCPS. We're all in this together. And so our campaign will be around establishing that communication that really convey, conveys the concept of we care, we want to reassure our families and students that they feel valued and heard. Um, one of the things we've already lifted up during the pandemic and we will continue is our virtual parent academy, making sure that that's a platform and a venue for parents to get their concerns heard and answered. Um, our development of various video clips, video chats, and multiple languages, making sure we have those tips, strategies. So if you're not sure about how to use the online platform, how do we support that? And just making sure that we elevate and solicit the voice of traditionally marginalized communities so that the input is gathered and everyone feels as though this response they can see themselves in the response and hear themselves in the response. Um, so this is a tidbit. Um, I would like to mention that we will be coming back on August 25th to discuss more around the Be Well 365 work and expound upon some of these things in more detail. So with that, I will turn it back to Dr. McKnight. 
And Mr. Turner, at this time, you can close out with the communication plan. Thank you, Ms. Rubin. Good afternoon. Thank you, Dr. Knight. Thank you, Ms. Rubin. So our next step in this process is to ensure that all MCPS community members not only understand, but are fully engaged in this initial framework. The voices of our stakeholders are so critical to this work. As Dr. Wilson shared, we had 300 plus uh, stakeholders from our community working on developing this initial framework that include dozen, uh, dozens of administrators and community members and over 100 teachers really digging their hands into this work and helping us come up with the, the best uh, possible ideas that we could. Again, this is just an initial conversation, but it, it really took the effort of the community to get us where we are. Feedback on this framework is going to be so critical moving forward. It helps us refine and revise our work. More importantly, responses from families and staff will help drive our operational strategies. Can I see the next slide, please? To do this, we are engaged in a targeted multi-language, multi-platform approach. This includes Twitter and other social media platforms, advertisements, emails, phone calls, direct outreach, neighbor to neighbor outreach, mailings, text messages, and so much more. Um, it's going to kick off. It's already kicked off, but it's uh, going to go in a high year tomorrow. We'll have a press conference tomorrow morning for the media, and we'll be having a community conversation, a virtual community conversation, tomorrow at 6.30, where we'll answer questions from our staff, students, and families. May I see the next slide, please? So here's a summary timeline of important dates ahead in this process. The staff fall recovery questionnaire will go out next week. The family registration window will open July 27th and go through August 7th. Staff will uh, return to the Board of Education on August 6th to present an update on this initial framework with more details and more information as we go through this process. We will post a final plan to the community on our website. And then finally, uh, we'll come back to the Board of Education on August 25th, and school will open August 31st. May I see the next? Thank you. Uh, so we need to hear from our community. We have already received more than 4,200 responses from our community through this feedback form, plus thousands we're catching via social media and emails and other platforms. This is so important to help us shape our work. We want to hear each and every one of your voices, and we have staff that are reading each of these responses because we know there, there could be a nugget of information here, an idea that we can use to incorporate into our work and to make this plan better for all of our community. So we ask that you go to www.mcpssubmitfeedback.org to submit your feedback about this initial framework. We really are committed to doing the best we can to serve our community in this difficult time. And so I, I welcome and we welcome all of your feedback and we want to really thank all of our community for their contributions to date and looking forward. Uh, with that, I'll turn it over to Ms. Evans to begin the discussion and we welcome your questions. Thank you so much for everyone that presented today. Um, I wanna be respectful of Dr. Gale's time. So we'll start with questions that board members have for Dr. Gale's before he has to leave. And then we'll begin with Mrs. O'Neill. I see your, your um Yes. Well, uh, first I wanna thank Dr. Gale's for taking the time to join us and also for all your efforts in helping to keep Montgomery County healthy and safe. Um, you know, there's been a lot recently published uh, American Academy of Pediatrics saying kids need to be in school and then issuing a clarifying statement about following local health conditions. Uh, there was also a study that said children are not great vectors or transmitters of the disease. Given that our staff are not children and that children don't go home and live independently, they go home to parents and grandparents, you know, uh, all the plans revolve around mitigating risk. This is ever evolving information. I, I personally know of a three-year-old who had COVID. What, what is your recommendations on, in this arena about, the, about children transmitting the disease? Sure, thank you for that question. Uh, so children can transmit the disease. 
uh, they can be carriers of it. Um, and uh, we didn't think so. Uh, back some months ago, we thought it really, you know, most of our evidence was saying, you know, it's older folk who are most at risk. But the evidence has shown that children can not only catch it, they can have, although it's less common, they, have, they can have complicated uh, treatment courses. And we have seen some pediatric COVID related fatalities. No, that said, so I, and I, what we've also noticed is that over the last few weeks, that the number of cases have actually skewed to younger populations. And so we know that there is risk of transmission in that population. Again, it's not, a, it's not maybe as large as others, but there is risk. Um, and I think that becomes real because as you pointed out is it's not just looking at risk of transmission from kid to kid. It's, we also have some adults in the room uh, in terms of teachers and other staff, and we have to keep people safe. Now, I'll give you an example. So my mother may not want me to tell her real age. However, <laughs> she is at an age that she can retire. And she's an educator and she's in the school system. And so we're going back and forth in terms of uh, she's in Virginia. And so, you know, the Virginia schools are continuing to make their decisions. And so we're talking about the risk of her going back. Um, and, you know, those are some hard conversations because, you know, I don't know if she necessarily was ready to retire, even though she can. It's a reality um, given her, her age and her, her risk. So I think I, I say all of that to say that. You know, particularly from our perspective, we do acknowledge that kids can transmit the virus. Uh, and because of that and other information, as we find out, you know, we will continue to provide that advice and guidance uh, to Dr. Smith and Dr. McKnight and the rest of the team as they think through their plans. Thank you. So I'll go in the order as we're seated at, as if we're at the table. I will ask Dr. Doctor questions from Dr. Gales. Oh, no, I, I don't have any questions. Thank you for the presentation. Thanks for being with us today. Okay, thank you. Ms. Vesper. Thank you, Dr. Gales, for joining us today. And thank you for um, your leadership in all of this. I have enjoyed uh, seeing you be out in front communicating with our public um, almost on a daily basis, and I appreciate that. Um, some questions uh, you mentioned. Um, you mentioned the county uh, reopening. We're in phase two right now. Mm -hmm. If it were, if today were August thirty first, would we be able to open schools according to the guidelines? I guess my question is, what um, what triggers uh, the opening of schools or the closing of schools? Uh, health wise sure so um, thank you for the question um, I think what 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 is going to trigger reopening schools are the same factors that we look at moving forward in terms of reopening other other aspects of society um, I think you know there was a quote from Governor Cuomo in New York from his press conference today that said you know children shouldn't be necessarily guinea pigs in terms of if we're not opening up other things we shouldn't rush to open up that and so I think we have to look at reopening schools for in-person uh, contact in the context of how we're reopening other things so for us I think it's, it's the larger framework so where we would if today we're August 31st and we are where we are we would still be in phase two. We would not be moving to phase three um, for the reasons that I laid out before. As you know, we continue, even though, yes, we have, I, am, I sleep better having daily case totals of 60 as opposed to 300. Um, but at the same time, that means we still have a long, we have a ways to go in terms of driving that number down even more. Because what you have happen is, now, I will say we have, compared to some of those states where we've seen significant incre increases in cases recently, we do have some stricter protocols in place in terms of the face covering mandate and some of the other strategies that we have in terms of enforcement. But you see the evidence of when you do even still have smaller pockets of virus in communities, if you open up things too quickly, it can spread really quickly and, and get out of control. So that's why we are, um, 
working to push the number down even more so we get it as as, as minimal as we can uh, before we talk about moving to phase three. Now, I will say I've been a part of calls recently where there are folks on the other side of the spectrum that say, hey, we're out at 300, we're at 60, let's go. Let's go, let's go to phase four. Why aren't we moving forward? Uh, but as it relates to school and safety, uh, reopening of schools would be looked at in the you know the same context of reopening those other aspects and moving to a phase three or phase four approach. So we would have to be in a phase three to open schools uh, in our in our staged capacity. I think I'm not. I think the the. The, the guidance from the state is that, well, let, let, me, let me rephrase that. So because phrases are different, so you know, we've moved from phase two and it doesn't match up with the governor. I think the perspective is that we would see more significant and sustained improvement in numbers overall that indicate lower burden of virus in our communities that would allow us to feel more comfortable that opening up schools, the risk of having a case would be significantly small. And so whether you call that phase three or phase four, depending upon the conversation, that would be the criteria that we would be looking at uh, to move forward in terms of opening up different activities. Um, one thing that has been um, suggested, actually I've seen in other countries, is the use of face shields versus face masks. Um, is that something that uh, you recommend? Um, do, do you have to have both in order to be safe? I, I know it's, uh, you know, for children that are learning to read or language is still being developed, it's very important to see lip movement. Mm -hmm. And so I just wondered where, um, what recommendations you had for our school system in terms of the use of face shields, or is that not being considered um, locally? Well, I think the conversation is, you know, when looking at those nuances for special groups, you know, where there may be special circumstances to do that, I think everybody's open to discussing those. Traditionally, face, face shields have been reserved for you know, individuals who may not be able to wear traditional face coverings, um, and in particular reserved for those who are in uh, employment type opportunities or spaces where the contact may be more sustained and a higher risk of transmission. So for example, medical personnel working in clinical settings. Um, and so if it's not traditionally something that's been recommended in the general public in terms of our interactions with person to person. Um, but I do think that, you know, in, in our conversations that I've had with the team, you know, if there are strategies that are, you know, open and may offer some some you know better results in terms of enhancing the education experience as well as maximizing safety i think you know we we would look into that from the public health perspective and provide the guidance to the mcps team accordingly thank you uh, my final question is about testing mm -hmm. um i'm concerned about the fact that uh, children or, or younger folks don't often express symptoms and so we might have uh, we might have uh, young people with COVID in our schools, but it may not be so obvious. Um, how what's our capacity for testing? Will we be able to test if a family wants to get tested once a week? Uh, will we be testing children? What can you tell us? Uh, what, what, what does the future hold in terms of uh, our testing capacity? Well, I'm happy to report that I, we don't necessarily have to talk about the future. We can actually talk about where we are now uh, in terms of some of the testing opportunities that we have available. Um, so we, there's been guidance that has been put out uh, by the CDC to recommend uh, provisions and criteria for individuals who are asymptomatic. Uh, we actually released a memo to our providers at the beginning of May and the state followed up in mid-June with additional guidance to provide so one, if you have a private primary care doctor, you should be able to go and get tested there. Um, even if you are asymptomatic, there's guidance to, to help providers along with that. Um, in any of the county sites that we have available, we have a number of permanent sites, and I'm saying permanent because they're not permanent test sites, but they are you know, standing venues um, that folks can access. And we also have created a number of opportunities where we're standing up pop-up testing venues throughout the county that people are able to go and test, whether they're asymptomatic or not, they don't require a doctor's note or referral. And so those options are available uh, to folks now. 
And in addition to that, they are including self-collection uh, kits that are less invasive and may also be uh, more easily usable for kids in the pediatric population, as opposed to getting nasopharyngeal swabs. I would encourage uh, those test sites are a part of our coronavirus website, county website, that has provisions that has the schedule there uh, and directs people in, in terms of how to register and take advantage of those opportunities. Thank you. Um, so Dr. Gilson, I have to leave pretty soon. I want to just make sure everybody can ask a question. So I just want board members to be mindful of your, of your colleagues. So I'll go to Mr. Asante and then to Ms. Dixon. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Dr. Gales, for your presentation. I know it was very informative for me. And uh, I was wondering, in the event that a student were to um, contract the virus, uh, what action steps do you think then the school itself and the school system would need to take with the student? Would everyone in the school need to be tested or just everyone in the class or what would have to happen for that? Sure, Nicholas, that's an excellent question. Uh, so it would depend. <laughs> that's a very good. It would depend on the situation. Uh, so first and foremost, how it would happen is uh, the health department and the disease control team would get uh, a note to say that, yes, there was a positive case in the school, whether it's a student or a teacher or a staff member. Um, I will say sometimes that it happens that the school may find out before we do. They may, you know, hear about it or the staff member or student may contact the school and the school will call us. Um, I will I will confirm this for sure. I am confident if MCPS finds out something that between Dr. Smith and Dr. McKnight, I will know as soon as possible and we will be huddling to consult and provide guidance. Now, what will happen beyond those informal conversations is as part of the contact tracing component, there will be an investigation to determine where the student or staff member was, which classroom, who they were around, what types of interaction, what spaces they utilized during their time there. And then there would be an assessment to say, okay, based upon that information, we have decided that these folks are considered to be high risk. They need to be quarantined for a period of time, recommend them get follow-up testing. And if there is a space, for example, that a person was in, you know, there may be a recommendation to do cleaning of that space. But the idea of closing an entire school would be dependent upon the level of interaction um, that the, in, the individual had across the, the school. Um, and it's, you know, if it's determined that only a classroom of students are high risk, then they would be given guidance. Uh, you know, anyone in that space would be given guidance for quarantining and not the whole school. But if there was evidence to see a significant portion of school staff and students involved, then yes, that decision would be to close the entire school down. Thank you. Ms. Dixon. Thank you, Mr. Sante. Ms. Dixon. So uh, thank you, uh, Dr. Gales, for joining us uh, today. I, ju I just have one question um, to see if maybe you can just review for us um, what, what symptoms should be presenting themselves for someone to go and get testing, tested. Well, one of the biggest symptoms is not having any symptoms at all, actually, uh, nowadays. Um, and with the availability of testing and the provisions for those who are asymptomatic, uh, you know, you don't necessarily have to have any to, to prompt getting a test. Now, that said, there are still a host of symptoms that are common that we call, you know, COVID-related symptoms. So, and, and some of those mix up with others. You know, for example, I have uh, significant allergies and so every time I feel my allergies being exacerbated, I have to take a pause. Um, and fortunately, every instance, it's been strictly allergies. I'll be very clear about that. Um, so, you know, things like congestion, uh, respiratory symptoms, shortness of breath, um, coughing, fever, chills. Um, there has been report um, probably halfway into this that there may be some gastrointestinal involvement because there were folks who had COVID-19, who had less or no of the respiratory system uh, symptoms, but had some diarrhea type symptoms that prompted them to, to get evaluated and they turned up positive. Um, so those are kind of the constellation of the traditional systems that you know typically are associated with COVID-19. So would you recommend that everyone get tested then? Or, I mean, what you, you said, you know, asymptomatic. Um, 
you know, other than those symptoms that you mentioned? Um, well, it's tricky with a universal recommendation because part of the challenge is, is you get, if you get a test today and test negative, you're, it's a point in time test. So you could go out, you could leave, I could go to Silver Spring right now and get tested and the result comes back positive and says it's negative and go, what's today? Today's Tuesday. And on Thursday, go somewhere, come into contact and catch it. And so I think that's just the thing that we have to remind folks of. Um, and to the question someone mentioned being tested on a regular basis. So for example, some of our first line responders who are constantly potentially exposing themselves, we do recommend or there are recommendations that they get tested more frequently. So it's it's one of those things that it's good, you know, potentially to know your status and certainly now testing is more available, but we caution folks to understand that it's a point in time test and doesn't necessarily say, hey, I'm negative, so I don't need to wear my mask anymore. I don't need to quarantine. It's like, actually, no, you need to continue to do that because a negative test doesn't change your risk profile in terms of coming into contact with it in the future. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you, Mrs. Spondrowski. Yes, so I too will thank you so much for your time and the work that you've been doing with um, our superintendent and our central office folks um, on this. Um, most of my questions have pretty much all been asked already so um, by my colleagues. So I'm only going to um, just make one little point. Um, I think you mentioned something about fall sports, um, assuming we're not going to be having fall sports. But there are things like that and mm -hmm. every one of the questions that my colleagues have just asked you that we're getting hundreds of emails about, as I'm sure you are as well, because um, I see you copied on a lot of them. <laughs> but um, <laughs> but um, I would like to, I would, um, would be hopeful that maybe we could put together some sort of frequently asked questions page that would maybe even include um, that you could do collaboratively with MCPS for our parents that could go out that might even include things like this clip of our questions, because honestly, you've touched on so many things that we've heard from people, it would just might be an easier way of kind of getting that message across. So that's not really a question, but. <laughs> I'd be happy to help. And I, I, I'm laughing because I think back to when we were doing, uh, Dr. Smith, I don't know if you remember it when we were talking about that other taboo subject about bringing in uh, uh, <laughs> safer sex methods in schools and we did some town halls to answer questions. Yes. Yeah. Um, so this is a little different tech topic. <laughs> Um, but, you know, I think that could be something I'd be happy to work with you all and our team can put up something together. And I would, would venture to, I know we talked some when we did the site visit about uh, engaging students in terms of messaging around it, you know, particularly yeah. thinking about masks. And uh, I, I know my, my niece is going to kill me. So behind me, this is my Zoom window that I do interviews <laughs> in, and my nieces and nephew are behind me and they get mad and the pictures up in the back. <laughs> But we were talking, my niece, who's, who's just turned 15, um, talking about messaging and what does this mean? You know, you're a high school student and this is what you're used to. You know, how, what's this new normal look like for you? Um, and I think we, it, it's a great opportunity to, you know, one, to, to listen to what they're feeling, but then to also um, use them as, as ambassadors to talk with others and share that message with, with their peers. Yes, I completely agree with you. So thank you for for your help with that. Thank you. Um, if I could. Sure. I just don't want to miss the opportunity to say publicly to thank you to Dr. Gales. He's been a great partner since he first arrived in the county on many different issues. And certainly the very first night a case was announced in Montgomery County on the 12th of March. Or I guess it was the week before that, the 5th. It was March. a week before, March 5th. I won't forget it. March and we were on the phone with you, and I just, yeah, I'd be remiss if I uh, didn't say publicly thank you for what a great partner he and all the folks he works with have been for us. And Ms. Wolf wanted to make a comment before you left. I know you're in a rush and you got to go. Okay. No, I'm, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to defer. I know he has to go, and my comments have been, my questions have been okay. answered. Thank okay. you. Yes, likewise. And thank you to Ms. Magoski for the idea of the frequently asked questions. We just really appreciate your partnership from the very beginning. And um, get some rest. So I hope you can. <laughs> but thank you all. Thank you all, not only for the opportunity to speak with you all, but for working with you all during my time here and during this time. Um, I know it's hard because we always hear from the people who have complaints about what we're doing. But to the folks at home, 
your your school system team is working hard. And again, they have been, as Dr. Smith pointed out, they were have been working on planning and coming up with strategies before we got a case in March um, to try to keep kids safe. And they've been con they have consistently been committed to that and have been a joy to work with. So thank you for the opportunity. And if we can be of any help, you know how to reach us. Thank we you. appreciate it. Thank you. So at this time, what we'll do is we'll have board members ask questions um, of the presentation, uh, the other parts of the presentation that we heard, and then I'll just go in the reverse order. And um, if we could just ask one question, I'll come back around, everybody, you can get all your questions answered, but we just kind of keep it going a little bit and ask one question, that would be great. So I'll start with Ms. Wolf. Any questions you have on the presentation that we heard regarding operation, curriculum? No, I'm going to pass at this time. I might have something later. Thanks. Okay, Mrs. Mondrowski. Sorry, I had to do the unmute thing. Um, so um, just kind of roughly, I have a lot of questions about, you know, the this proposal and everything, and I know it's a work in progress, so I'm not going to ask a ton of questions. I do want to clarify one thing, and that is about, like, I, I hear a lot about the fall sports, for example, um, and instrumental music. And it's, if we, we can include it in the frequently, those things in the frequently asked questions. But um, I do know that parents and students are waiting um, to get uh, definitive answers on that. And I know that everything can change one way or another, but if we can address those type of things soon, that would be very much appreciated by a lot of people I know. Um, with that, I'm going to not ask any other questions um, because I'd like to take this time to um, ask uh, Dr. Smith and his staff if they could um, officially put together um, a look at a proposal that I'm going to make. Um, and I, I want to start um, by first saying that just to clarify, this is not about me or us. Um, not caring about everyone's health or anyone's health or well-being. I volunteer every week at our schools, handing out weekend food sacks for students and families. And it's not easy with the mask and gloves as an adult. So I totally understand people's concerns of how it will be for our children. Um, it would be extremely helpful if the governor were to say, no one is going back to school as of yet. Or if the governor were to say, everyone should be back in school full time. However, um, shy of that, I believe that we have to assume that it's okay uh, following these strict and taking strict precautions. Um, I am not a health expert, so we need to rely on their expertise for guidance. But we also, um, we need to be filling, fulfilling our responsibility to do everything that we can to make sure that every child is getting the education that they need and they deserve. Um, I have a, um, little write-up of my proposal that I will email to all of you, send to all of you. Um, I've spoken to all of you guys um, about it briefly, but so for the sake of time, I'm just going to touch on some of the highlights and then I'll send you the more detailed stuff. Um, but what I'm asking um, Dr. Smith and his um, staff to look at would be um, a return to school proposal where um, all secondary students would be 100% virtual so we could utilize the elementary and all of the elementaries and all of the high school space to house our elementary students full time. Um, for the elementary students, um, I would suggest that we would start with our youngest students first, um, filling the elementary schools. So, and then, you know, like the fifth graders and then would be in the high schools and going down till it's full and whereas the kindergartners or what would be in the elementary schools because of the designs of the classrooms and all of those kind of things. Um, again, I won't get into too many of the details of how I envision it working because I will send all of that to you. But um, then um, we would utilize all of support staff or anybody um, who is not teaching at the time to support teachers uh, while they're in the schools teaching. And um, all of the lessons would be able to be um, I, I wanted to call it live stream, but I understand there's a difference between actual live streaming and videoing, um, like Zooming and stuff. For the secondary grades then, I thought we could use, I would like information about if we could utilize middle school space to attend school in person on a limited basis. So for example, on Mondays, grades six and seven could attend, Tuesdays, grades eight and nine, Wednesdays, 10 and 11, 
um, et cetera, kind of just on a rolling thing or even every other day if they need that time to clean. Um, again, that's something that would be up for discussion. Um, access and opportunity, you know, the reason, um, one of the things that I feel very strongly about is that we need to be taking advantage of the fact that um, we are doing live streaming um, lessons and virtual lessons. We are offering it already as 100% of an option. So this would basically open up the opportunities for us to uh, support online learning um, or virtual classrooms, I should say, not online learning. There's a difference. But virtual classrooms from a for full day school curriculum. Um, and it opens up the opportunity for all high school students to take courses that might not be offered at their school, but are offered in other schools, and they could take them virtually. Um, if lessons are recorded, um, students could watch when it works for them, if that's at night or whatever, as long as we can figure out how to do the attendance aspect of it. Um, I have stuff on here about specials. Uh, another point that I thought I would want to just mention is as far as before and after care that potentially um, before and after care could be housed in all four of the large spaces at each of the 25 high schools. So those spaces being the media center, the cafeteria, gym, and the theater. Um, it wouldn't be as many programs as we've had in the past, obviously, but it would be 100 available um, programs potentially for families to take advantage of. Um, and then the students would attend the um, the elementary students would attend the high schools for which their elementary school's feeder patterns go into just as far as planning for space. Um, special education and CTE students participating, or students participating in CTE courses and certifications would have priority for utilizing the necessary spaces to ensure that pathway is not interrupted and or delayed. Um, and then, like I said, I'll send you guys more of the specifics, but just a few side notes you know, making sure that we're supplying all of our staff with the mask and gloves and hand sanitizers and stuff like that. Um, utilizing outdoor space as much as possible, whether it's for lunch, science classes, physical education, or anything else. Um, men making sure that mental health staff is, you know, available to help um, with our students who, when they're in the buildings, have the opportunity to talk to them. Um, I agree with a lot of the feedback that we've gotten based on the rapidly changing conditions of this pandemic. The phase in should be based on the health conditions of our county and not necessarily on a calendar, which I think we've, MCPS has done a great job of conveying that that's the intention. Um, this is Madrasky, I hate to cut you off. Yep. Three, four, we do have recess coming up. So you said you were gonna send what you have to them, but I think you've pretty much read it all, right? Did you, did you want to yeah. arrive? No, nope, that, that's fine. Yeah, yeah, I can. It's just, you know, I just wanted us to be able, I'm hopeful that the superintendent could come back to us by the end of July um, with what something like this could potentially look like so that board members could have a chance to um, talk about it and stuff before the next board meeting. So we can send it to him and he can figure out if he could get it done in addition to everything else they have to do because we're really concerned about reopening school. So send it, you could email it and then we could hear if it's something that we can have done since we're putting it in, it's, what was that, two weeks, a week? So just go ahead, email it and then we can figure out from there. Dr. Smith, did you want to? Sure, um, well, it would be a tremendous opportunity cost. That's really what it would come down to. So this would take, we, we've actually looked at a lot of the things, Ms. Madrasi, you, you, that you just referred to, and uh, they are incorporated into our plan, like PPEs and many of those other things. Uh, as we think about this, and I don't know what, what we know is we're gonna start the this, this school year with all uh, virtual learning. We, we, we know that at this point, uh, unless something very strange happens because uh, you know, that that's just where we're headed to start the school year that way. The question is how long will we maintain that system as we look at just all, all the context that Dr. Gales just laid out, what, what's possible in the weeks as we move into September and into the fall. So when I say it's an opportunity cost, it would take, a, you know, to come up with a fully developed model would take uh, literally hundreds and hundreds of hours by a very large number of staff members 
And so if you'll send it to us, we'll get back to the entire board uh, within okay. the next few days with a response to see if you want us to go forward and build out a model like this or not, um, okay. and how completely you would want us to. Um, yeah. This will generate a, a, a very different set of responses. I, I think you've all been getting, as I've been getting a lot of them recently, the response to this framework we put out that said ninth graders would be the first to return. And now the pushback on that is the 12th graders should be the first. <laughs> right. And hundreds of folks. Or juniors. Mm -hmm. And yep. so, yeah, juniors and seniors or, mm -hmm. you know. So uh, as I said, when I opened this, there are a tremendous number of different needs and interests and perspectives mm -hmm. in this. And at some point we're gonna to have to choose a model that we're gonna start with, that okay. we'll start the school year with. And we know that it's highly likely that it will be a virtual learning model because even if parts of the state move forward, Dr. Gales was just very clear that other parts of the state, including Montgomery County, are somewhat behind the rest of the state in cases, although they're seeing resurgence of cases in some of the less populated areas now. Right. And so uh, send it to us and we'll send okay. back a response to uh, um, to you, Ms. Madarowski, and to the entire board on uh, some of the issues, and then we would want the board to tell us that you would like us to commit the resources and time necessary to do that, uh, but that would be a tremendous opportunity cost in standing up what we've got to stand up, whether it's hybrid or virtual. Right, yeah, no, and I appreciate that very much, and I want, I'm not trying to make things more complicated. Um, I just, you know, we just, I we just kind of got the opportunity to go through this proposal last week. So it's just, I was just trying to think of ways that um, to kind of simplify things and address everything. I know, like you mentioned, there's no, there's nothing here that's gonna make everybody happy, um, you know, completely happy. So I appreciate the work that you're doing to do your best to address all, everybody's needs. So thank you. Okay. Thank you, um, Ms. Dixon. So um, I want to thank Dr. Smith, Dr. McKnight, um, uh, also uh, Nikki Hazel, and uh, Dr. Wilson, uh, Rochelle Rubin, uh, Essie McGuire, and uh, Derek Turner for the presentation today. Uh, I do want you uh, all to know that I've been praying for all of you and really praying for us as a board as well, uh, that we would all be imbued with the wisdom of Solomon. Uh, the work that you have done has been incredible, uh, time consuming, complex, and um, I'm just glad that you're all there to do it. Um, so I wanted to uh, just mention that uh, I have been very surprised. Um, in fact, you know, as a board member, our mailboxes have been burning up. I mean, literally burning up with uh, emails uh, from uh, teachers and staff about, um, you know, how they don't want uh, to return to school. Um, we haven't had a super, um, and that's also on the BO email as well. Um, we haven't heard uh, a lot from, uh, you know, folks who think that we should open school uh, in school with uh, students. So, um, and I support, uh, you know, the virtual uh, opening of school uh, that you've planned for the beginning. So my question to all of the teachers who have written to us um, and, you know, and they have, it, I mean, certainly, um, I would say, uh, cause for concern uh, for their family, for relatives, um, their own health and the children's health uh, as well. But my question would be, would they be willing to um, teach virtually from their classroom? Would they be willing, and I'll just throw this out, um, would they be willing if we were able to uh, provide PPE, um, you know, uh, face mask or shields, uh, you know, the cleaning and the social distancing, 
they would be hopefully maybe the only one in their classroom and be willing to teach based on the student schedules, uh, you know, from that perspective. I, I just would be interested in that. They would have everything they needed in terms of the Promethean boards, not having to set up, um, you know, a space at home uh, where they have, um, you know, other people there as well. Um, so whether that might be an option where, you know, we don't have to bring students into the schools, the students are at home, but the teachers would report to work and work from uh, the school. And then, you know, there would be all sorts of other opportunities for them to receive training, um, you know, the attendance for pay purposes, uh, you know, would I think be made simpler uh, as well. I mean, I think it's clear that, you know, we can't do what we did from uh, March 16th through June 15th. Um, you know, I think everyone worked as hard as they could or the best they knew how to pull everything together. But I think, you know, we can agree that uh, in terms of what our students received, that was a bit uneven. And so this way, if um, they were willing to go into work uh, and teach from their classroom virtually, and I don't know how long that would be, maybe nine weeks, maybe a semester, uh, you know, we, we just don't know what the pandemic is going to do and, you know, whether things are going to get better. But, um, you know, it seems to me that that would alleviate um, some of the issues related to transportation and, um, you know, and might make it a little more structured in terms of the students knowing, well, this is what our schedule is. This is when, you know, I will see my teacher. So I just throw that out. Um, so maybe they'll write to you or, um, you know, uh, let us know uh, whether that's something they think could be done and that they could be safe doing it that way. So that's my only input right now. Thank you. And Mr. Asante. Uh, thank you. I wanted to start off by thanking everyone for their presentations. Like I mentioned earlier, they were very informative. And I think it would be great if uh, some of the videos that were shown in the presentation could be sent to us as board members so that we could push them out into our channels. I know that would clear up a lot of um, misinformation for a lot of students. But uh, I was wondering what the synchronization between the blended model and the virtual model would be, like with the two sets of students be on par and would you be locked into one model or if you wanted to switch, would you be able to catch up to the other model? There's been a lot of conversation, Mr. Asante, about this. Um, and uh, we, our goal is to make sure that it's absolutely comparable. Uh, if we go into a hybrid model, uh, and some students are in an all virtual and others in a hybrid that would be absolutely comparable. We've also talked about the idea that families may say, I'd like to, you know, I'd like to move into the hybrid model when it's available and then realize a month or six weeks or whatever into that. And so we're, we're planning for that. I would add the caution though, that given the, it'll, it, it, it appears that it will all be limited numbers of students that we wouldn't be able to add somebody to increase the number beyond what it should be in the physical area. Uh, you know, so we, if, if we had a full classroom at College Garden uh, of the, the number of students that are allowed to be physically distanced in there and that we can handle and that somebody else wanted to come in or 10 students wanted to come in, we'd have to have an orderly process for that to happen, uh, much like a change of school assignment. and. So, but we are we are thinking about that and working on that issue as we move forward. And, and while I have the mic, Ms. Evans, I just want to say to Ms. Dixon, I very much appreciate your uh, expression of concern for the staff and me, and I appreciate the prayers. Thank you, very much appreciated that. Thank you. So now we will hear from Ms. Silvestri if she has a question. Uh, which question to pick first? Um, I think one question that I have heard parents wonder or about is um, um, if I am in group A and I go to school 
This is the elementary level. I go to school Monday and Tuesday in person. What, what, does, what does my child do Thursday and Friday? Can I expect uh, synchronous teaching and learning on Thursday and Friday with the same teacher just remotely? Or will I be doing homework and uh, doing lessons on my own? Could we start with that question, please? Thank you, Ms. Avestri. So as we've been planning out this framework, We've acknowledged up front that there are some times in which uh, our teachers and students won't be engaged always in uh, synchronous instruction. However, we have been uh, also having discussion about on those outside terms, how on those times in which the classroom teacher is not working directly with the class, uh, planning for those opportunities to be, be chances for students to follow up, get individual support with their teachers to support the learning that happens in the classroom. We've also been talking about and uh, planning to get more information on many of the programs that we have engaged in school buildings with, um, you know, Kid Museum. I, I mean, there are a host of partnerships that we have, really pulling those partners in to have a discussion about how those programs and things can be supported virtually or in other spaces during those times in which we uh, are not, or students are not engaging directly with the teachers to support that. Uh, so those are some examples of things that we've been discussing as we build out the framework and how many partners will be informed of and uh, having us think about that. Ms. Hazel, if there's anything that you or Dr. Wilson would like to add. If not. <laughs> so if I'm hearing you correctly, uh, for the elementary school scenario, I'm having synchronous teaching and learning with my teacher of record on Monday and Tuesday only, if I'm group A. I, I, we are looking to have more than just Monday and Tuesday. We want to have more opportunities for sequence instruction. In order to make that work, we are going to need all hands on deck. So we are, are having conversations about the fact that we have lots of staff in buildings who are not necessarily teachers of record. And they will need to help support instruction in a lot of these areas. So we are working through how this can work so that students who are home virtually have more synchronous time than just the two days. Okay. That's Thank our goal. You. Thank you. Uh, Ms. Evans, I have more questions, but I'll wait till the end. Okay. I'll come back around to you. Thank you so much. Dr. Daka, comments, questions? I'm sorry. It takes me so long to find the microphone. It's okay. Um, I want to I want to thank uh, Dr. Wilson, Ms. McGuire, Dr. Rubin, Ms. Hazel, and Mr. Turner, and the rest of the staff for all the work that they've done and all the thoughts they put into this. It was meaningful. It's fairly clear, and uh, it's a monumental task. And what I really am happy about is uh, a question that I asked before: How many of our teachers are going to be involved in the planning or were involved in the planning. And I think you've answered some of that uh, with teachers and principals. I think at one point it was 100 and now it's like 350, uh, unless I got that wrong. But the more that we have in different schools, I think is important because we keep getting from uh, staff members, well, we weren't involved, we didn't know about it. And this way, if we could just at least let people know where which schools these persons come from. I don't know whether we could actually use their names, but <clears throat> if we knew which schools the other teachers could um, and the paraeducators and whoever else could contact the principal and find out, you know, what, or at least give their input on it and uh, at least know uh, why the, some of the decisions were made. So that's all I wanted to say. All right, thank you. Mrs. O'Neill. Yes, um, first, Ms. Mondrowski raised the issue about fall sports. Fall sport practice begins August 12th, mm -hmm. and I know that some parents have received emails about um, physicals, and I know that sports is sort of guided by the Maryland State Athletic Association, but can we put out some quick guidance to parents, are fall sports happening or not? Where are we? Because I think people are 
you know, sort of in limbo about that right now. And um, the other thing is, uh, I know Ms. Mondrowski raised the issue of her proposal with me yesterday, and I expressed a concern because of the high school level. I know that Fairfax County looked at using high school space for elementary students, and they rejected that. I, I saw a lot of faces of our staff members as she was talking, just their chins dropped because Literally, you guys have put in hundreds and hundreds of hours on this proposal. Is it perfect? No. I, you know, no matter what we do, some group is going to be unhappy. I think every group has lost some learning. I, it's fine, consider it, but I don't want you spending hundreds of hours on this. I want you spending hundreds of hours perfecting what you believe is the best plan. And some of the items I know, Essie, when we visited College Gardens, you spoke to the fact that you've ordered masks and hand sanitizer. Some of those proposals, or some of those items in her proposal have already been thought out, they're there. But I have real concerns about the ideas of elementary kids moving to the high schools, we know the bathrooms are not appropriate, especially for the youngest learners. Whatever you do, if you think it's a great idea, then turn that ship around suddenly. But we've got to have our act together. We've got to perfect whatever we're doing. I have one question that's an operational issue. Um, I've heard a lot like, recently because of the airborne nature of the virus and the issue several authorities have said school systems need to up their ventilation systems put in HEPA filters and we have a lot of old buildings you know we have every year we have complaints about air circulation etc you know have we have we looked at this I know you know we've got seven weeks before school starts have where are we on that so i can i can dr smith no please answer that and then i'll respond to the athletics question oh okay thank you i was i was gonna jump in on that one as well but actually oh, i uh, <laughs> well i i think well you may have a better update than i do but i do know that um you know certainly have representation on the um, Maryland State uh, Association and they are meeting regularly to look at the sports guidance as you were saying um, Mrs. O'Neill and we do not have a different answer on that right now um, but we are continuing to work through that and we will as you're saying work with the state and national um, sports associations to get that clarity and to have that schedule. So at the moment, what we're doing also is just preparing internally and working across offices with stakeholders to make plans so that so that the sports um, can be ready as well if that guidance comes down from the state so that they will have those practices in place to move forward. Um, so that I do know that they are working on and, and Jeff Sullivan is really leading a great effort to, um, to, to again, keep that work moving and keep those plans moving. Um, in terms of the, I just wanted to say one thing about the capacity of elementary school students, and certainly we can take more of a look at it, but we do know that it would take um, certainly all of our elementary schools, all of our middle schools, and probably then some of our high schools as well to really accommodate every elementary school student in this seat every day. And again, that's really just because of how many students we have, which is a lot, um, and also because again of those distancing um, guidelines that we're following. Now that's just math. That's not, you know, obviously there's there's more analysis that can be done there, but that I just sort of wanted to give a sense of, of the preliminary analysis that we have done on that. Might just help give a little context that, um, you know, really that's, um, that's a, uh, it's just a large group and it's a large group to accommodate um, across all that space again if we're if we're really looking at the distancing guidelines. So just as a preliminary look, um, that's that's what we found with that. Um, and then on the air handling um, uh, systems, I really would like to turn it over to Seth Adams, uh, our Director of Facilities Management, who 
can speak much more uh, eloquently about air handling systems than I can, but we certainly are very aware of this as an issue and, um, and, and understand the concerns and thoughts about that. And, and thank you, and great question, uh, Mrs. O'Neill. And it is one that uh, we have been researching. Um, similar to hand sanitizer, we have started to purchase um, many more filters, uh, different types of filters. Um, and we are uh, confident that, you know, majority of our schools have the equipment to, uh, to, to meet the guidelines that have been published by uh, some of the engineering officials. So uh, we are doing an assessment to make sure, you know, every school can meet the guidelines. And that's not just around air conditioning and ventilation. That is across the board from a facility perspective. But yes, this is a high priority area. Um, and we are, we have already begun the purchasing of, of supplies to meet the, uh, to meet the requirements. And, and I'd like to just share some information about the athletic program, Ms. O'Neill, for everyone. All of these systems at the state, and as recently as last Wednesday, we talked to the state superintendent and all the superintendents together, all of them are running on two tracks. Imagine two trains going down the road. One is, if things get worse, and just as Dr. Gale said, and we have to slow down and back up. And the other is, as we can implement and open, that we're able to do it and prepared for that. So at this time, there is no clear decision from the uh, MSDE and the Athletic Association that governs all athletics for high schools in the state of Maryland. Uh, they put out a lot of information uh, more than a month ago that said, assuming that we actually get to open in a new way, we would open on this date and we would do this. Uh, but Jeff Sull Sullivan is staying in very close touch. He and I trade information after these meetings and I copy my colleagues here on the screen. And so if we can open safely, we'll open according to whatever restrictions and constraints are in place. If we're not allowed to open, we're not allowed to open. And, and that's a health and safety issue. That's not an educational issue. All of these things have a health and safety component um, to it. And I, you know, I, I really appreciate what Dr. Gale said about having allergies. I have terrible allergies every day of the year. And I've realized recently that even if I'm just out walking across the parking lot and there's someone down on the sidewalk as I walk to get in my car and I sneeze three or four times, they look at me like you have the virus. And it's done something to all of our psyches. And so we've got to keep that in mind that, you know, my allergies drive me bananas, but they are allergies. They're not COVID-19 so far. And I actually did have a test so that I could be in proximity to my two-year-old grandson who has tremendous health restrictions. And at that moment, I did not have COVID-19. I have no idea if I do now, but I have no indication that I do. And I have a been anywhere that I should. So I just want everybody to keep in mind the complexity of all of this and the uh, fact that we're always operating on with two ways of thinking. Be ready to open whatever we're allowed to open. Be ready to back up or maintain the status quo as we're required to maintain what we're doing now. That's really how this is all operating. But thank you, Mr. Adams, for that explanation about HVAC. Ms. O'Neill, do you have another question? You're, you're on mute. Oh, were you talking? Ms. O'Neill, you're still on mute. So, um, Ms. Wolf, I saw your, um, saw you go on mute. No, no, I, I did want to say something. I wanted to thank you for the work you've done on the plan. And like, um, Ms. O'Neill said, no plan is perfect. I know we can and may need to make some adjustments in the future. I just wanted to respond to um, Ms. Mandrowski's um, suggestion. I think that at this time, it's gonna be very difficult to take away staff to focus hours of work on trying to look at something new when we have spent hours with groupings of different constituents coming up with a plan that is scientifically based. I don't wanna take our focus away from looking at learning loss of our students and getting them to a point where we can provide a full educational program 
starting in September. Um, Ms. Dixon had a very interesting idea. Uh, I did notice that some of our teachers have expressed, uh, have questioned, I shouldn't say, they have questioned whether or not it's fair for some teachers to be able to work at home and others to be working in the building. But I just want to remind us that our focus needs to be on educating our kids and looking at what they might have lost between March and June. And if we need to make adjustments to the plan, we can make adjustments to the plan. I just think that parents have to know something and to start coming up with a whole new plan is gonna be problematic because it's gonna push back the date that we get something out to the public. I know uh, my family is waiting to find out what school is gonna look like in September so they can make their plans as are many of our parents good or bad, we have to come up with something solid and get it out to them. Yep. Thank you, Ms. Wolf. Um, Mrs. O'Neill. Uh, yeah, I just briefly, this weekend I heard uh, Larry Kudlow, the president's chief uh, economic advisor, the whole conversation for the last week or so has been about the reopening of schools. And Larry Kudlow said, it's just not that difficult. And the governor of Florida said, if you can open Walmart and K and Home Depot, you can open schools. Obviously, many individuals don't understand how difficult it is. And especially when you're dealing with health and safety, life and death issues, the educational loss for our children has been difficult. But we have to always follow the science and be mindful of the health and safety. Okay. So I'll go to Mrs. Smondrowski and then Mr. Asante, and I'm making the assumption that board members do not want to break, so we can finish up this area and go right into our next um, item. If that, that's fine. Everybody, okay. So, Mr. Asante, I mean, I mean, Mrs. Smondrowski, I'm sorry. So, um, I, I know a lot of teachers have uh, expressed concerns about if they're teaching and we're doing, um, and then their kids would be home. Is there? Have we um, talked at all about? whether or not they could bring their children into the schools with them and maybe have like an area where someone was watching them. Um, I just, that's just something that uh, several teachers have asked about. We have spent uh, many, many hours discussing childcare, including before and after care and the need care, child care needs of our staff. Once again, the challenges are that when we're restricted on the number of, of students that we can have in a building, that uh, you you wind up with a situation where you don't actually have enough space for everyone okay. even to be there two days a week, and if they, you know, they if they don't match up with uh, the pattern that is in a specific school, then it's it, it just the complications of it are uh, immense. Um, I certainly I could ask Ms. McGuire to phone you because she's explained them to me many, okay. many times. If you'd like okay. to talk at length about it, but it, it's a lengthy conversation. Okay. Because uh, we've been searching for, we have, all of us, every staff member you hear from has real empathy for the child care. Oh, I know. It's huge. Yes. Yeah. Our mission is education. And so that's the first thing we have to work on. I 100% agree. I said that in the beginning. Um, and I hope not for any, you know, that no one thinks for one minute that I'm not appreciative at all of the time and everything. I was just trying to keep open options and stuff like that. But I know we've got to not, obviously, um, we need, parents need to know what's happening sooner than later. So I understand that. Mr. Asante, and then we'll go to Ms. Dixon. Uh, thank you. I just wanted to echo a sentiment earlier that was mentioned by Dr. Smith with uh, the sequencing. I know this is subject to change, but I've heard from a lot of students saying they'd prefer if um, upperclassmen were to return to school first if we do return, especially because of um, college applications and things like that. But I was also wondering, are there like any plans right now for the grading policy for this upcoming school year? Or is there is that in discussion what grades will look like if we'll continue with the pass fail system we had for uh, continuity of learning or if there'll be a new system in place? The expectation, Mr. Sante, is the grading scale would be our usual Montgomery County Public Schools grading system and that we would go forward with that. Um, 
whether a student is is in virtual or in hybrid or uh, you know at some point hopefully uh, back to full operation of a school building but that we would use uh, the the spring was an emergency uh, response and a crisis response and we expect school to look and feel much more like school uh, this coming year it's not what everybody experienced before March 16th but certainly as many of you have made the point the in-person, whether it's through this screen like you and I right now, or in a room appropriately physically distanced, that it feels like the interactions and the experience of school for our, for our students and families. Thank you, um, Ms. Dixon. And I'll just say this, uh, you know, um, I'm, getting I'm getting a barrage of texts, like you just can't <laughs> break. <laughs> like, so. Well, I just wanted to take uh, that just... back. Yeah, I just wanted to say, um, you know, that the teachers are watching us and uh, I have about a dozen or so emails um, that I forwarded to Jack and Monifa and Janet uh, so they can see them. And I have a text. Uh, one of the things the text says is, you know, just about the child care of teachers' children. Uh, but uh, it was a question and, uh, you know, get responses from them. You know, it's, you know, mixed in terms. There's some that would be glad to do it and others that don't want to. But I think, you know, hearing from them, uh, you know, is just uh, important. And uh, so, yeah, uh, good. Share yours with me, too. Uh, I'd love to hear what they think about it. So if that is all the questions, it's about 4.15. Well, we'll just take a 15-minute break, come back at 4.30. I just want to be respectful of um, Human Resources Department. They're going to come back and they're going to give their presentation after our break. So we'll just do a 15-minute break. Stop your video on mute. Don't leave the meeting. And we'll be right back in just a moment. Thank you.
we are back from our recess. Thank you for your patience. At this time, we are at um, on our agenda. We're at item seven, and I will hand over the discussion um, to Dr. Smith to introduce the discussion topic and the, and the presenter. Thank you. Absolutely. First of all, I want to say hello to my colleague, Dr. Statham, who I worked very closely with for not quite four years, and because we've all been socially distanced, I've only seen you online, but it's good to see you, and I hope you're <laughs> Uh, Likewise, thank you. Right? Uh, we're gonna, we want to discuss the vision for human capital management and OHRD. Uh, Montgomery County has a long, long history and tradition of hiring very good people. In fact, oftentimes sitting with the staff, you feel like you're in the room with everybody who got straight A's. And that's a compliment to this organization and this staff. At the same time, the world continues to shift and we have to shift with the world. And we have the re very real um, need and desire as a staff and as a community to have a workforce, especially in our classrooms and administrative offices and schools, to that represents the diversity of our student population, which is the world. And so that's going to require that we do our work differently. Um, you know, and teachers and principals and front office uh, support staff and the people who work in the cafeteria and who make sure the building is well maintained and safe and secure, they can all make a powerful difference in a, in a student's life. I had a, a bus driver, I rode the bus 45, me, 45 minutes each way for uh, much of my life. And I had a bus driver who was incredibly kind to me for many years uh, as, as a student. And I've never forgotten uh, that individual. I had two teachers, though, who really are, to some degree, maybe a large degree, responsible for the first steps of me being able to sit where I am today, because they saw something in me that I did not see in myself, and I couldn't even acknowledge was there, and, and they were, I want to call them by name, Art Fuller and Ann Clark. Uh, I know Mr. Fuller has passed away, because uh, I was aware of that, and, and part of that when that happened. I'd love to find Ann Clark and tell her thank you. They make such a profound difference. And so whether we're virtual or face-to-face, -face, we have to be able to attract, get their attention, recruit, get them to consider coming here, induct, get them here and get them into the Montgomery County public school system, and then retain the people that we hire for every job and for our uh, teachers. Who, and our teacher leaders. Those are significantly important efforts. And so the reimagining of the uh, Office of Human Resource Development, uh, the idea of what is human capital management and how does it work, all of these things matter. We've made some great strides in the last few years, and we have a lot of work to do in this area, especially around earlier we talked about the technology infrastructure that we want. We also want to connect with those institutions that provide, um, that provide the preparation programs for teachers. And we also have today as part of this presentation, one of our own uh, organizations that is affiliated with the school system right here with us today to talk about specific and, and really focused work on making sure that we're doing what we need to do to bring people here, uh, whether they're community people coming into the school system or they move across the state or nation, and then have a really good environment for them as they come here to do the work that is so critical. So we're putting a particular focus on um, our work around uh, human resources. And I'm gonna turn this over now to Dr. McKnight so that she can uh, work with the staff to walk us through the different bodies of work. And I would have to give a shout out to Lance Dempsey, who uh, just left us a couple of weeks ago, and, and I worked with her for four years. And I know uh, Dana Edwards is here today, and she's been invaluable, as is Yolanda Stanislaus and many other people in that organization. And now uh, with Dr. Nixon joining them, it's a really good effort to move forward. So Dr. McKnight? Yes. Thank you, Dr. Smith, um, and I, I, I support his sentiments exactly. We started this work uh, back in the fall of this past school year, uh, just really thinking about reimagining the Office of Human Resources and, 
and uh, Ms. Lempsey, Lance Dempsey was a big part of us starting that discussion and figuring out where we wanted to go and, and starting the engagement with community stakeholders. And I know that Dr. Nixon will pick right up there and be as involved as she's very much aware of who the MCPS community is um, as she had the opportunity to work in the system for years. So with that, we welcome Ms. Nixon and most importantly, thank our staff who are here, who are on this call. It has been an absolute pleasure to work with them. As a deputy superintendent, I must say I'm so excited about um, this human resources office being uh, within my office because they do touch all parts of the system in so many ways. And um, to be able to elevate the work that they do and to sit here today and talk about it <clears throat> is absolutely a privilege to, uh, to just get a, a look at where we are and where we're going. So I'll go back to the fall because as deputy superintendent back in the fall, I charged our human resources offices to really think about a process and think about data that was available that we could utilize to start assessing our current practices, structures, and focus of the Office of Human Resources through the lens of equity as we service a school system that is large, quite frankly, the largest in the state. And we have so many employees that we have to hire and serve to support the ever-growing population of our students. And that within itself makes us stand out in terms of how we have to be strategic in being able to manage that large demand um, and just to sit and start to have a conversation about how do we strategically look at our practices, processes, and structures to be able to continue to do that now and years to come um, lended many thoughts and ideas for us to build off of. And the question that we really focused on is, was the office poised and ready to attract, recruit, hire, onboard, develop, and retain a highly qualified and diverse workforce? That takes us right back to the anti-racist system audit that we talked about at the very beginning of this board presentation, because developing the workforce and who we bring into the workforce has much to do with how we even begin to send a message to our students about who they are and making those connections and so much of what we do. So it's critical for Montgomery County Public Schools to be as the largest employer in the county and in the largest school system in Maryland to really focus on the instructional needs of every single student at the core of what we do. And it's important to complete this introspective analysis with a group of school leaders, um, staff within schools, community stakeholders, and everyone who can help us just go through a process of reflection to really think about every asset, every facet of MCPS, and quite frankly, how we can have open, honest conversations to evaluate these processes and structures to think about how is it currently meeting the demand and the desired state of human capital management in MCPS. So with that, consequently, we've engaged our school system employees, the employee associations, community stakeholders, and reimagining HR. And we have solicited secure representation from many groups, many who have been involved in the deputies advisory group as well, to help us think through this. And so during this presentation, you're going to hear a number of things. One will be about the four work groups that reflect the key bodies of work in OHRD, which are critical to supporting the increased academic and social achievement of students while simultaneously accomplishing the work to attract, recruit, hire, onboard, develop, and retain a highly qualified workforce that really can meet the needs of our students. And that goes beyond just our teachers and our administrators in our building, but also our support professionals, um, you know, and also it includes teachers and administrators. So really just the gamut of all of the workforce that exists in building MCPS. The four work groups I, four work groups I do want to highlight for you as a big part of this project are one, employee talent acquisition and recruitment. And that's to focus on our recruitment efforts and how we build that to be more robust to create that diverse workforce. Employee onboarding and induction, that's clearly important going back to the anti-racist school system audit. We have to think about what it is that we want to train our current employees on and all of our employees in which we onboard to reflect the values of Montgomery County Public Schools as they come on board as employees in all facets of the system. Employee talent development and continue to think about how we create those pathways for all of our employees to move into other professions within our system, especially when we can predict what those professions are going to be that are, uh, that we need to prepare for in years out. And of course, employee, uh, of course, employee retention. And that gets at what makes people want to stay as employees in MCPS? How are we supporting and providing them 
with everything that they need to be successful so that they feel like they're in a supportive environment to do well at the work and the way that they contribute to their work in MCPS. So it's a goal of our work group that we're going to have open and honest conversation about the current state. We're going to analyze data and identify what's working and what needs to be enhanced. Also looking at what doesn't exist in our structures that we should consider moving forward and what needs to be discontinued, quite frankly, that we may have had that worked at a point in time and how we organize things in human resources, but we need to evaluate. The work groups are being asked to be innovative, think outside of the box, and to come back with recommendations that work for our current and future state of human capital needs in our school system. So the recommendations that are being generated from the work groups will be presented and prioritized to be brought back to the board in November of 2020. So Ms. Dana Edwards, the Director of the Department of Certification and Staffing, and Dr. Yolanda Stanislaus, Director of Professional Growth Systems, are project leads for reimagining the OHRD work and, we begin, and they will begin this presentation with updates uh, from their work groups from their respective departments. And they have been leaders of this work and have really been champions of going out and getting the input of so many um, that will allow us to be as innovative as possible when we think about what the re recommendations are that are needed for our system. And like I said, I know Dr. Nixon will join right in in that work. Um, as I know, this is her first week, but she's already been working with her team and are excited to work with them around this and all of the work that they are doing. In addition to that, you're gonna hear an update from Dr. Statham in her new role as the Higher Education Workforce Liaison. Dr. Statham uh, moved into this role in February, getting a head start on how we can begin to build partnerships and relationships with universities that will allow, allow us to be able to work with them to matriculate students coming into MCPS as possible applicants. So we are grateful for her for leading that charge. Um, at that time, I know COVID-19 has, you know, had some impact in a number of ways, but she has been creative and have been, you know, reaching out to other partners uh, that have been recommended to us to really think about how, how is everybody approaching this work differently amidst COVID-19. Dr. Damon Harris and Dr. Uh, Daryl Howard are building our network of diversity through our bond program project. We'll discuss how they are collaborating with OHRD to attract, recruit, develop, retain, and empower men of color as employees, starting with mentoring our youth and supporting both internal and external men of color to stay in MCPS or join MCPS as a potential uh, uh, employees within our system. And again, that has been a, uh, an opportunity that in which I really appreciate in terms of working with them. Dr. Howard, I gotta say, sent me an email <laughs> weeks ago that really just warmed my heart in terms of during COVID-19, the outreach has not stopped. He was sending send me an email sharing that they had met with a group of young men within our system who are our current students um, and really reaching out to them to think about, you know, their future and how they can consider ways that they can impact education now. And that's actually how we make the movement before we actually have to respond to a need. Thinking about who are our potential teachers of the future, administrators of the future, and they're sitting in our classrooms. And you know, oftentimes our students who are thinking about ways to contribute, and we can't wait until they've graduated and they're figuring things out. Let's plant that seed right now. So I wanted to just say they have continued with that work even during this virtual platform, and we are deeply appreciative for that. So at this time, I will no longer stop them from sharing the great work that they've done. I will turn it over to Ms. Edwards um, to begin. And I want to thank the team for all the work that they've done thus far. Ms. Edwards. Thank you, Dr. McKnight, and good afternoon, everyone. As shared, I am Dana Edwards, and I serve as the proud director of the Department of Certification and Staffing. And on behalf of our office, I do want to thank you for the charge and giving us the opportunity to really look at the work that we're doing pull back every single layer and ask ourselves some really intricate and tough questions and to do it with the commitment um, and the collaboration of our stakeholders. Um, we are looking at not only the reimagining of our office, but I will also share information with you about the future work, um, the current and future work associated with employee recruitment and hiring. As Dr. McKnight shared, we are strategically taking an introspective look and an extremely deep dive into our practices and structures. The individual needs of all of our students and our families must be met, and we can only do this with an equitable approach to how we recruit, hire, 
onboard, develop, and retain a highly qualified workforce. The four work groups that you see in front of you it, um, will be our method of really doing this and really grappling with how we'd like to see ourselves moving forward within the future and making those strong recommendations that will come forward. We take a look at the next slide. It was critically important to us to make sure that we engage and collaborate with a variety of stakeholders. With our stakeholder groups, it's given us an opportunity to have multiple perspectives, to have candor and divergent thinking. But the biggest thing that we've seen from our work groups is this true commitment to really identify what is happening, what is not happening, and how best to develop solutions and new structures. I do wanna thank our work groups because they have been committed through three of the sessions that we've had to really looking at data, sharing key solutions, and really talking about our current as well as future state. Our work groups will be together through the end of, set, the end of September and will continue to work together to be able to provide recommendations that you will see in November. If we take a look at the next slide, please. As we come together as work groups, which you can see from our stakeholders um, and what we definitely learned is that to date, this chart, chart shows the emerging patterns um, within each of the different work groups. We see talent acquisition and recruitment, onboarding and induction, talent development and retention as the key bodies of work within our office. Though they may be separate, they are definitely interconnected. And when we sat with our work group members and really asked about our current state, where we wanted to go, and the data that we needed to look at, these were some of the ideas that came out of our initial discussions. The font that you see in red actually shows you some of the patterns that have come up. The patterns that we see in two or more work groups um, that are definitely coming out that really just promotes the fact that this is interconnected work. Two areas I do want to highlight that we're seeing is that we definitely need to have a data-centered approach in order to look at what we want to do and how we want to do it and really examine our employee turnover data. In addition, our work groups also want to take an opportunity to delve deeper into the candidate selection process and why employees come and why employees may not choose MCPS. And we definitely need the engagement of our students. Though they were not originally listed as one of the stakeholders, we see them as a critically important voice to be able to help provide us a roadmap of our next steps and what we'd like to do. Um, as shared earlier, our work groups will continue to meet together, will continue to grapple with these wonderfully hard issues, and really have some candid conversations about how we want this office to form and be situated in such a space that we are meeting the needs of all of our students and families and preparing ourselves for um, our coming uh, future that we have um, here in MCPS. Our work with our OHRD work group groups has provided a great platform of ideas and future resources to infuse, especially with our initial approach to employees, um, to recruitment of employees having to drastically change over the last several months. As you can imagine, our focus has primarily and always been on in-person opportunities that allow for discussion and relationship building. A great piece with the work groups is that we're focusing on every employee group and not one subset of our employees. Prior to COVID-19 coming, when we focused on attracting and recruiting employees for MCPS, we did so through monthly interview fairs. We have recruitment events for our paraeducators where we partnered with Identity. We also have partnered and recruited directly at Lincoln Technical Institute for many of our maintenance facilities. And a, a space that we were most proud of is that we hosted very um, strategic events where we invited African-American and Hispanic uh, candidates who are, uh, who are teachers or who are interested in teaching, where they had an opportunity to have conversations with district leadership. 
We did that through an evening with MCPS and our candidates were able to hear directly about who we are as a district, see themselves grow within our district and to understand the importance and how equity looks not only in the sense of the word, but how it looks within the classroom and the professional development opportunities. We also hosted um, um, at Bus Boys and Poets, where our president of the board, as well as our deputy superintendent, were able to engage with future educators and share the work that they collaboratively do so that our teachers could see how our district leadership really wraps their hands around the importance of the education of students. And again, where is that thread and that understanding of what equity looks like within our system and how it sounds like and what they could feel as they would come on board. In each one of those um, different settings, we did have um, repre uh, representatives from our bond group who were able to attend and speak to our teachers, as well as from Hispanic Alliance that, was, that were there as well. And taking a look at the next step slide, when we um, entered into the pandemic, it really forced us to be even more strategic and present ourselves in a totally different way. The one thing with recruitment is that you have to make yourself present and you have to make yourself memorable. We definitely want to be remembered and our entire spring recruitment schedule was halted for in-person work. We then started to engage with some of our universities through virtual opportunities, whether they be in classroom seminars or through virtual fairs. We also had the opportunity to host a collaborative Zoom call with our Department of Professional Growth System, where we focused on growing your career in MCPS and the support that you could receive um, in MCPS as you make the decision to work with us. During that call, again, we did focus on male teachers as well as Hispanic teachers and African-American teachers as well, focusing on inviting our partners in bond and the Hispanic Alliance to be able to share the affinity groups that we do have available as our teachers come within to our system. And we also continue to support our career path, our supporting services to teacher pathways and continuing to recruit actively for our programs for our, our supporting services employees. To date, when we take a look at our current hiring class of teachers on the next slide, please. As of July 9th, our data shows that we've hired approximately 757 teachers. This is kind of a, a record for us at this point in time in the year um, with the number of teachers that we hired. And if you look at the ethnic diversity of the class, we have about 33% of our incoming class in terms of um, diversity within the Asian, African-American, Hispanic teachers who are coming to our system for next year. This is a 5% increase from where we were last year and about 180 of our who are coming into MCPS at this time have identified themselves as multilingual as well. We also are most proud of any, any employee who of course went to MCPS and is returning. And if you take a look on the right, these are our top 12 schools with our graduates at this point in time who are coming to us. We still have a month and a half left and we are not finished with school um, still being, um, with school not starting yet. So we definitely have some work to do. Um, one of the key areas um, in looking at the next slide, please, is that we will continue to be strategic with our approach in terms of how we want to engage our diverse workforce and making sure that we maintain them. Anything we do, one of the, the things with the work group is the end result is always going to be about retention. And that starts when we start to attract them, when we talk about MCPS, when we hire for MCPS, but we have to do it on the forefront. The work that Dr. Statham is doing is critically important as she engages many of the locations that we have not traditionally been able to get to. And she will talk about some of the work in which we'll have virtual opportunities for many of our hisp um, historically black colleges and universities, our Hispanic serving institutions, and we definitely want to begin to build the relationship with our Black Greek letter organizations on many of our campuses to be able to lay the foundation for the coming year. 
Earlier in the board meeting, we, we shared the appointment of our supervisor for strategic recruitment, and he will have a definite role he plays in really rounding out the work that we will do, not only for the remainder of the summer, but also going into the coming year to make sure that we are definitely building our workforce, not only for making ourselves present and and um, building relationships with universities, as well as with partnerships and businesses, as well as solidifying our place in the technology realm as well. But he will also take a look at making sure that our pipelines in which we are doing with our universities, we have the right pipelines and we have a constant flow of future employees coming into our workforce. We definitely want to make sure we retain and some of the efforts that we have shared during our recruitment that we're most proud of is we do have a summer institute with Bowie State University where our conditional teachers are able to go for a week and gain courses towards certification. And we are looking at how we really retain the recruits that we have um, hired over the past three years from our recruitment efforts from Puerto Rico. And so we're utilizing our teachers who we've hired from Puerto Rico um, to really be able to really make sure that our teachers feel at home in MCPS and see MCPS as a place in which they would like to stay for many, many years out. As we prepare for the coming year and we continue to do our work over the summer, um, when we take a look at the next slide, we want to make sure that we stay engaged, of course, um, and you will hear some of this work um, when Dr. Statham shares. We also are continuing to host virtual sessions, and we will have some with um, Bowie State University in the next two weeks focusing on the alumni, as well as recent graduates that are with that, that university, and using MCPS alumni to talk about their work here in our system, what it means to be a graduate of an HBCU and coming to MCPS, and how people can now make connections with people that are here. And one of the places that we are definitely proud of for the coming uh, semester is that we will definitely, we've had some time to work with Bowie State over the last year and do um, some very large visits to the school. And we will be hosting approximately 10 student teachers coming up in the spring. And we have definitely made um, a great collaborative effort and work very, very closely with the university to support our future as well as the relationships that we have with them. At this time, I will turn it over to Dr. Yolanda, Yolanda Stanislaus, who will share more information um, about the Department of the P Professional Growth Systems, the current work, and the work that they are doing to continue to support the development, as well as the onboarding and induction of our employees within the system. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Edwards. Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you so very much for having me today. Uh, I'm Yolanda Stanislaus. I serve as the proud director for the Department of Professional Growth Systems. Uh, if we can pull up the slide, that'd be great. Thank you. So you can see on this slide, this is, this is basically what we stand for in the Department of Professional Growth Systems within the Office of Human Resources and Development. We as a team are committed to the continuous growth and improvement of all of the staff that we serve in Montgomery County Public Schools. And we do this because we know that we want to retain a very highly qualified and diverse workforce in order to best meet the needs of the students we serve. We don't do it alone. We have a wonderful team of people within the department and the office who work diligently with internal and external stakeholders to make this work come to fruition. Next slide, please. This is an example of, of some of the work that we've done within the Office of Human Resources and Development and within the Department of Professional Growth, just based on what currently happened with COVID and in response to it, uh, our department had to pivot pretty quickly. And in doing so, we know that um, we are about to induct several hundreds of our new teachers, new uh, support professionals, and our new administrators. So usually we do a face-to-face. -face. Obviously, in this time, we're not going to be doing that. 
So we are moving to a virtual platform and we've moved to a virtual platform to best meet the needs of, um, of inducting all of our new employees. Next slide, please. So we know that uh, you only have one time to make a good first impression. Um, and all of the stakeholders have been absolutely dedicated to ensuring that we do just that. Um, over the course of these past few months, the hiring continued, as you heard Ms. Edwards say. Um, we've continued to hire new teachers, new support professionals, new administrators. Um, for our support professionals, we quickly moved to an asynchronous model for our orientation for our support professionals, where we have been inducting and um, providing this, this ongoing um, self-paced orientation for our support professionals, maybe two or three sessions per week. So that's been going really well. They're able to make connections with employees um, who are currently here and uh, other supports within our district. So that is available for our new employees. We also moved to um, in, uh, a virtual platform for our teachers. Just recently on June 23rd, we had an opportunity to have our first virtual platform for our um, schools, Arcola and Roscoe Next. Those teachers started early. We were able to have our virtual uh, induction for those teachers. This was a great opportunity because it gave us a chance to see how it worked. We were able to get some real live feedback from the teachers um, and the staff who facilitated. And we're using that in order to prepare for our August event for teachers where we're going to be welcoming close to a thousand new teachers in our district. And within that, all of our new teachers will take all types of curriculum trainings and other courses. We partner with our association. They do a training as well. Um, one of the trainings that is, is critical to all of our new teachers once they um, induct and then come into our system, we have a course, a three hour course, that's called Creating Conditions for Success Through the Lens of Equity. So this is an opportunity for us to share exactly what our uh, goals are for the system and the district. We look deep at implicit bias. We worked very closely with the equity unit in building this course for our teachers. And um, this is something that we are committed to and we ensure that every brand new person gets this particular course. Uh, we also have um, an induction that's going to take place for our administrators this year as well. All of our new administrators will partake in an online induction uh, so that they can get to know the people uh, form their own cohort and have individuals that they know they can go to in any time of need. So we're really excited about the quick pivot that our department made in order to ensure that we're meeting the needs of our new employees as they enter the district. Next slide, please. There are three critical goals that truly drive the work of the Department of Professional Growth Systems. One, we are absolutely committed to this kind of one-on-one -on -one coaching and mentoring support that we provide to new, new staff, some new staff and veteran employees. Um, we really engage in developing the capacity of staff in a multi-tiered approach. Some of it is through coaching, some of it is through professional development opportunities and training sessions. And we, we use data in order to ensure that we're creating learning opportunities that best meet the needs of the people that we serve. So we as a department truly stand on these three critical goals in order to continue to move our work forward. Next slide, please. Thank you. So for an example, some of the professional development courses that we offer and some of the supports for our administrative and supervisory new principles. Our consulting principles, we have two consulting principles that support all of our brand new teachers. Over the course of the years, we have had in our system a new principal network. And this is just a wonderful opportunity of learning for our new principals to come together four to five times a year and we engage in 
very strategic leadership moves um, and we just engage in the learning together. Uh, so this year, we're really going to look very deeply at change theory and using change theory in order to inform your practice. Uh, this year, we're really excited about the fact that for the first time, we are, our consulting principals will be supporting our year two principals as well. So we are going to have a new principal network year two cohort, where we will pick up where we left off with them last year and really delve a little deeper into change management and change theory, all with the goal of sustainability through the lens of equity. So we're, we're excited about that. Um, the new learnings that, that are going to take place this summer, I was actually engaged in one this morning, one of our first cohorts this morning took place, and that's a first. Usually we, we just work with our, our um, clients one-on-one, -on -one, but this time we decided that we're also going to work with them and offer training opportunities as well. So we have a summer learning series that's taking place for our new principals uh, within our system. Next slide, please. Thank you. For our support professionals, over the past year, uh, we, over the years, it's continued to grow. But this past year, I think we kind of broke a record. We were close to offering 170 courses, training, sections for our support professionals. And we were really getting some great feedback. We use that feedback to say, is this a training that we want to continue? Is this a need? Um, a lot of needs assessments going out just to see where people are and what the needs are. Uh, so we offered those, obviously. Uh, we had to pivot based on what our current state is regarding COVID. So as a result of that, um, many of our facilitators shifted to an online learning platform. So we continued with several of our classes over uh, the last few months. And this year for the first time, usually we have not done this before, but we are getting some really great feedback, is we're offering six summer trainings for our support professionals. We have one training that's called Building Resilience Amidst uh, COVID-19, How to Find Great Calmness, Strength, and hope during the pandemic. Another one, because people are still looking for pathways to uh, other and new positions, uh, getting the job, success interviewing on Zoom. So we are definitely trying to meet people where they are. Um, our teacher staff, we have many uh, opportunities for learning for new teachers and for veteran teachers. But we are super excited about this course here that says new. Um, this came out of a need. It was based on the fact that once we were launched into the continuity of learning and the online platform, we quickly understood that the need for teachers to engage their students differently, um, we, need to, we needed to just help them through that process. Uh, so my consulting teachers came together and created a course that, that we've called uh, Becoming an Engaging, Equitable, and Electric Online Educator. So far, we have facilitated three sections of this course, and we are looking at opportunities to possibly leverage the, the work um, or this course and offer it to even more teachers and more staff across the district. Um, within this course, there's an activity that's called the COVID walk. And it's an opportunity for the participants, the facilitator asks the participants various questions just pertaining to their current state and situation. And um, after they answer the questions, they, they get a value or, or, or a number at the end. Um, that number is an indicator to the participants that people are in different places when we're talking about this journey that we're on together. Um, and what it has what it has done is provided them to reflect on their practice and how they meet the needs of the students that they serve, knowing that students are in different places of, as well, as well as their colleagues were when they did that exercise. So that's one way to kind of really start peeling it back and looking at equity 
um, and the work that we do to ensure that we're meeting the needs of all students. But this course also provides all of these wonderful resources that Montgomery County has provided for our teachers. This is a way for us to share some of these resources with them because the class is broken out. It's a secondary and elementary. It's truly targeted for those groups. So it's it's been, we've gotten some really great feedback from it and we're, we're looking for us to continue that good work with, with the teams and, and with the teachers. Next slide, please. I'm, I'm happy to report that our leadership development unit um, has joined our OHRD office. We are very excited about that. The leadership development unit will be a part of the uh, of my department. And this year, and I think these numbers are climbing a little bit, but this year we're supporting 23 principal interns, 19 first year assistant principals and 47 second year assistant principals. They can, the team has continued to provide training. Matter of fact, I was at one of their trainings a few days ago uh, with principal interns. And it just, it's just, even though we're on this virtual platform, the learning continues. This this team, we're working together, so our leadership development unit and our consulting principals, we are working in collaboration with one another because what we want to do is ensure that we're creating a learning trajectory and a, a learning progression, really, for our aspiring principals all the way through to our principal year twos. So we're looking at what kind of um, kinds of development that we're offering, what kinds of learnings that we're, we're providing our, our, our um, new leaders and ensuring that we're creating a true learning progression so that they're successful as principals when they, when they um, are able to have their own school one day. So we're excited about that work. Next slide, please. So once again, our department is just truly dedicated. The work that we're doing with the reimagining, um, allowing us to really peel back those layers and look at what's working and then some areas of growth for ourselves. That's one thing that we stand on in our department. We understand the importance of being reflective in our own practice. So we're continuously asking for feedback. Um, we continuously provide feedback, but we use feedback not to stay in one space. We use that feedback in order to feed forward. So with the work that we do, we're continuously thinking about opportunities for people our core goal is to meet people where they are and grow them to the next level. We do this because we are all here and all committed to ensuring that the students that we serve in Montgomery County Public Schools gets the best of what we have to give. So thank you very much for allowing me to share a little bit about the work uh, within our department. And I will turn it back over to Dr. McKnight. Thank you, Ms. Edwards and Dr. Slanasas for sharing all of this uh, information about the work that's been happening in your office. So you've heard some of the innovative strategies that have been put in place around our Office of Human Resources and Development that's been implemented this year and how we are planning to continue to move forward based on that learning. Our next two presentations also reflect innovative partnerships that, were form that we are formally developing and are continuing to nurture. Um, Dr. Staten will next share her goals and results in working with university partners uh, before COVID and how she's made adjustments and are working through COVID. And then Dr. Harris, who's one of our current principals at Wheaton Woods, uh, and again, Dr. Howard, who is a, a, uh, per, a staff member working in our equity unit. We're excited to have them both as leaders in MCPS. Also talk about the bond program and how it aligns to MCPS's strategic goals and additional priorities um, that we've discussed in this presentation. So um, we will continue on and I will at this time turn it over to Dr. Statham. Good afternoon and thank you, Dr. McKnight. Um, I, I'm very excited to share the work uh, that I've been doing. I am Kimberly Statham, the Higher Education Workforce Liaison for MCPS. Um, in January of 2020, Dr. McKnight envisioned a project that would accelerate the diversity hiring in MCPS. You've heard a lot um, 
uh, about our efforts in the past, and we want to really strengthen and boost those efforts. The strategy was to assign uh, a senior level leader to focus solely on this work. And primarily that the strategy is to develop the uh, relationships with colleges and universities so that we can increase the number of teachers of color in MCPS. So on March 1st, uh, 2020, I officially transitioned from uh, the Chief of Schools and the Office of School Support and Improvement to the Higher Education Workforce Liaison. Next slide, please. So the primary goals are to attract and recruit uh, teacher candidates nationwide, uh, primarily from minority serving institutions, uh, including historically black colleges and universities, or HBCUs, and Hispanic serving institutions, or HSIs. Um, again, the, the second goal is building partnerships with institutions of higher education. And what's important to note is this work will yield long-term benefits for MCPS diversity hiring efforts over the next few years and into uh, the future. Next slide, please. So with respect to the recruitment strategies, uh, Dr. McKnight mentioned that um, there were the pre-COVID strategies and then when COVID hit, uh, we all have had to be nimble, we know that. And so initially um, in, a, in preparation for launching the initiative, I uh, initially reached out to uh, 43 um, minority serving institutions that had quality teacher preparation programs. Um, and then in March of 2020, I attended a, a, a conference of the American Association of Colleges for Teacher Education, and also attended uh, the Branch Alliance for Educator Diversity luncheon. And fortunately, I was able to get that done before COVID hit hard, because those are, uh, organizations that have really been helpful to me in terms of establishing a network of people, not only at the university level, but organizations that have long-standing relationships with the deans of education and the career coaches in those institutions. So of course, early March, COVID became an issue um, and the universities began shifting their focus, much like everyone, our school system had to do the same thing to closing um, their campuses and creating virtual and online uh, programs for their students. Um, and the communication was not as frequent uh, with, with the partners. However, I continued my outreach. So I accelerated what I would, was going to share uh, with the students face-to-face -face and the faculty face-to-face -face and sent links to uh, MCPS sharing information about our great county, um, the quality, its, its um, reputation for uh, many, many years, and also shared that uh, in order for us to better serve our students, uh, we are really serious about diversifying our teacher workforce. I also sent uh, teacher testimonials, which was very powerful. Um, the teachers mentioned how that really struck a nerve because it gave them, um, and or pre-candidates actually, gave them uh, sort of a, a glimpse of what it would be like to teach in MCPS. I also sent a QR code where the students could enter their own uh, information and um, also submit their applications directly to OHRD. Next slide, please. So the recruitment strategies continue. As I mentioned, I had to pivot. Um, um, and we do have ongoing work over the summer. Um, Ms. Edwards mentioned that we are collaborating. While my work is specific, um, it certainly um, is related to the work of OHRD and is supportive of that work. Um, so over the summer, um, we will continue uh, speaking with the schools and really get a, getting a sense of their reopening uh, plans. Um, are they going to be all in person? 
online, hybrid. Also, it's important for me to understand what their student teaching formats will be uh, over the next school year. So I'll be increasing more relationships with our Hispanic serving institutions um, and expanding our list of uh, HBCUs. Um, I'll also be working with the larger universities and Ms. Seth mentioned this, um, really getting a sense of who their Black and Latino uh, presidents of their student union are and also connecting with the um, Alumni Association presidents of, of those particular groups. So I'll continue working with the deans and career coaches on scheduling uh, virtual recruitment fairs. Uh, we really want to work with them very closely to get their listservs so that we can um, communicate directly with the students. What I've learned over the past, um, this past spring and summer is all of the universities, they have their own protocol for sharing student contact information. So of course they, they get permission from the students. Um, some move at a more rapid rate than others. So I'm pretty persistent about um, making sure that we have that information. Next slide, please. So here you see a list of 22 colleges and universities from 15 states uh, that have responded and are very eager to establish a partnership with uh, Montgomery County Public Schools. Um, and you'll see that they uh, are all over um, the, the nation and I certainly can't wait to get out there and travel uh, to meet face to face. Again, we do the best that we can virtually um, and through Zoom and WebEx but there's nothing like face-to-face -to, -face to engage with folks and get them uh, excited about MCPS. Um, the other thing that I've learned about some of our larger universities is that they have focused on diversifying their student bodies and, um, so, and also dedicating faculty to ensuring that those students um, find good places uh, to teach. So those are great places for me to be um, recruiting as well. Next slide, please. So here you see a list of some of the organizations that I've engaged with. Uh, the American Association of Colleges for Teacher Education, or AACT, and I have to say, probably the Branch Alliance for Diversity and Education have been um, the closest working partners so far. Um, and they have served as a great resource. And in fact, they, um, particularly AACT, uh, e has invited me to participate in their WebEx um, meetings and, and sessions. And I've learned a lot about how those in higher ed are dealing with COVID, um, but also it's given me a, a good understanding of how higher education works. And that's important um, to me as uh, I learn about um, leading in this space. And so I'm very grateful to them for that. The other thing is that um, the CEO and founder of the Branch Alliance for Diversity and Education um, is a former Dean of Education at Hampton University. So she's given me a lot of wonderful feedback on the initiative and some perspective and insights on how we can strengthen our strategies, how I can do that, how I can have deeper and, and um, stronger outreach to those universities. And one of the things that she stressed was that in order to have a partnership, um, we, it has to be mutually beneficial. So um, we are, are looking at ways that we can provide uh, support to the universities. One of the strategies was um, they would love to see um, perhaps some virtual instruction, uh, uh, classroom instruction. So of course we would have to work through all of the protocol and, and, and that sort of thing. But the, the key is that in order to have this, this partnership, uh, we need to make sure that, that we're adding value um, to the experience as well. So interactions with the universities and organizations were very helpful in generating interest in MCPS. Um, we had a list of 120 
three pre-candidates who expressed interest in applying uh, to MCPS in early March. However, due to COVID, all of those students were sent home. Um, and many of them accepted teaching jobs in school districts in their hometowns, or they um, accepted teaching jobs um, in the partnering districts um, of the universities and where they student taught. Um, but of course, I continued um, my efforts to, to get them interested in MCPS and, and really uh, emphasizing the fact that we have a lot of support systems in place um, to help them get settled. Um, but, um, you know, understandably, there was some apprehension about finding a new place to live in a new city during a, a pandemic. So um, the applicants who did follow through um, were those who were returning to the Washington DC metropolitan area or, and or were getting married. I met some folks who, who had gotten married to someone uh, in the area. So um, I will continue my outreach efforts, uh, of course, over the summer and into the fall. And at this point, I believe I turn it over to our bond partners. That is it. Thanks, Dr. Statham. Good evening, everyone. My name is Damon Harris. I am the principal of Wheaton Woods Elementary School, and I represent Wheaton Woods everywhere that I go. I'm also here to speak about the Building Our Network of Diversity project. We, we like to call ourselves the Bond Project. Um, and we can start with the slides. And Bond, the Bond Project began back in the fall of 2013, where Inger Swimson, who was at the time directing certification and staffing, She's now the assistant principal at Churchill, um, or an assistant principal at Churchill. But back then, she started to notice, like, hey, something's not right in terms of the way I'm seeing the, the black male teachers come and go within the system. And she noticed that there were some issues around guys who had been successful in other spaces, transferring here to MCPS after they had been places for six years, seven years, double digits, then they get here, and they stay for a year or two, maybe three, and then they're gone. Um, and she brought together a couple of us in central office at the time, Troy Body, who we know is still the director of equity initiatives, Dr. Brenda Delaney, who, who was at the time the um, instructional specialist for higher education partnerships, Dr. Gail Epps, who was at the time the program manager for new teacher induction, and, and me at the time I was a consulting teacher. And we just started brainstorming around the issues that we thought we were seeing and what supports we thought might need to be put in place. Um, and then once we sat around the, the conference room table and had a, had a thorough discussion, we decided we needed to push this more, vigor, more vigorously and more formally. Um, so what we did was we did some research around the issues of male educators of color nationally. And we found that there was a national issue. Just like MCPS, there were about 2% of the um, teacher, teacher workforce that was black men. So once we sort of thought through or did the empirical research there, we came back to the local context. And around the spring of 2014, we started doing some focus groups with veteran black men in the system and new black men in the system and having conversations around the typical things that, that you might think. So why'd you come here? What challenges are you facing? Why are you staying here? What supports do you need? Those types of questions. And we really came away from those conversations thinking guys needed a connection. So we started with a mentor program for black men in the system during the summer of 2014. And we have since grown to do a lot more than that. Um, we, we wrote a white paper again back in 2014 that we shared with um, the director of the Associate Soup for Human Resources at the time. We wrote a blog for uh, American uh, Institutes for Research around some of the things we were thinking to get some feedback from some other types of people. And everything we, we found out there, every person we talked to, everything we found and everything we read indicated the need for a network of support. Um, and we can go to the next slide. And this, these next two sentences 
they really boil down our theory of action um, to, its, to its purest distillation. If school was a better place for boys of color, the more of them would want to be teachers. And if school was a better place for men of color, the more of them would want to stay teachers. Um, that, that is, we're going to share some stuff about what we do, my colleague, Dr. Howard, but that is the why that we do this. And we've since grown our space to consider not just black men, and we did that maybe two years, to all men of color, because we certainly noticed that our Latino brothers were going through similar circumstances. So we wanted to make sure that we provided a support network for every, every man of color in the system. And later, Daryl will tell you about the boys of color that we work through too. If you wanna see our story in a nutshell, we have not found a better, a better set of spokespeople than MCPS students. So a group of students from Blair High School a few years ago did a documentary that is now on YouTube called In Isolation, Male Teachers of Color. And that really speaks to who we are and what we do and why there's a need far better than, than I could do. Uh, but with that said, I'm gonna turn over the microphone to Dr. Howard, who can share some of the things that we do. You're on mute, Dr. Howard. Yeah, if we could, if we could go to the next slide, please. And good, and good afternoon, good evening, everyone. Uh, my name is Daryl Howard. I am a uh, instructional specialist in the Equity Initiatives Unit. Um, and um, I'm gonna tell you a few things that we have been involved in um, since Damon kind of set the, the, the context for, for the work that we do. Um, as an initiative, Bond has four pillars for which we organize our energy and our efforts. Um, we, as, as Damon mentioned, uh, we, we feel as though 2% is not enough in terms of workforce diversity and male educators of color. So we've made that not only a local endeavor, but a, a national one. So if you meet one of us, we're probably talking about the, the need for workforce diversity in, in education. Um, and to that end, some of the ways in which we've been involved in MCPS, at least around recruitment, um, where we're advocating for increased hiring of male educators of color, uh, we participated in the evening with MCPS events. Um, we served as ambassadors in, in both the inaugural year as well as the second year of this event. Uh, we've represented uh, with MCPS at various recruitment events, um, including Bus Boys and Poets with uh, OHRD and, and Ms. Evans and Mr. Durso and Dr. Knight. Um, so we're always thinking about how can we continue to um, to elevate the, the need for more male educators of color because we know that not only students of color benefit from male educators of color, but also um, all of our student body gener uh, benefits from the male educators of color that stand in front of them. In terms of development, um, we are always thinking about how can we increase the capacity of the educators who are part of the, the bond network. Um, and we're doing that through professional development, presentations and scholarship. And what that looks like is we have a quarterly meeting um, every school year. Um, and what we do in those meetings is not only is it a time for fellowship, but it is a time for us to share some, some best practices. And we have what we call a mini PD. So we'll do something along the lines of, of standards, something along the lines of culturally responsive practice, something new that we as educators are bringing into our classrooms or spheres of influence um, that we feel is valuable to share with other members of the, of the bond project. Uh, we've also presented um, across the country um, at the AASA conference, National School Boards Association conference, Council of Chief Staff School Officers conference, Council of Urban Boards of Education, um, most recently invited to Texas Education Agency Grow Your Own Summit, Delaware Department of Education, ASCD, and a number of other uh, uh, local 
state and national education organizations. Um, and we feel that that is a great way for us to continue to, to develop in our craft and again, share those best practices on a, on a, on a larger stage. Um, most recently, um, we've been involved in a little bit of blogging. We thought it was a good idea for individuals not only to be able to stand in front of, of individuals and present, but also to share uh, those practices and experiences in writing. Um, some of us have done some official publications as well as we've written a new white paper for the Bond Project that was uh, published in 2017. If we can move to the next slide. Thank you. In terms of retention, um, as Damon mentioned early on, this, this group was primarily about mentoring, ensuring that there were veteran male educators um, partnered with uh, new educators to the district. And we, we still continue with that practice in unofficial and official um, ways. Uh, we are always, uh, at the beginning of the year, we are always a presence at the new educator orientation. We feel it's important to, uh, to attend those events, both the elementary and the secondary um, NEO events and make sure that we just welcome people um, to MCPS, shake their hands and let them know that we are here to support them and, and help them maneuver and, and, and work throughout the, uh, throughout the school district. Uh, we also have a bond summit, uh, which is every fall. And what it is is a panel discussion where we have a number of different stakeholders come in. Uh, we've had Board of Education members uh, come in. Um, last year, uh, Ms. Evans uh, shared. The year before, um, uh, Ms. Ortman Faust participated. Um, we have principals and different folks in central office and at the state level come and share their perspectives on workforce diversity and um, any types of, of, of policy implications around, around uh, that work that we are trying to, to elevate. Uh, we have been in unofficial contact with the em employee assistance program. Um, there have been several times in which uh, Damon, Inger, myself, we received emails and, and folks from that office reaching out to ask us to support um, individuals who were having uh, tough times in the, in the district. And most recently during COVID, um, we thought it was important to practice some self-care with our bond network members. And we created a, um, not only a, a weekly check-in, but it turned into a book club uh, where again, we could improve our, our, our craft as well as do some self-care. And that led to uh, a recent presentation with the MindWorks uh, Collaborative uh, talking about self-care and male educators of color. And lastly, uh, this is a new pillar for us, the empowerment. We just uh, included that this year. We thought it was important to be able to um, think about student and educator agency. Uh, we wanna disrupt some systemic inequities that exist and advocate for equitable access to educational opportunities. So what that looks like, our number one way of, of empowerment um, is through our Bond Academy, uh, which we have every year in the spring, and we have approximately 25 presentations all led by uh, Black and Latino men who are part of the, uh, the school district. And we it's open invitation to anyone in the district, but it allows an opportunity for not only um, them to present, but for other individuals to um, to learn what, what it feels like to have a, a, a male educator stand in front of them. The empowerment has also led to us having um, individuals who have become Teacher of the Year and, and Washington Post Educator of the Year, uh, Michael Williams and Kenneth Smith. We've had individuals such as Damon Harris become uh, Distinguished Service to Public Education Award winners. Uh, most recently, uh, John Howard and myself have been selected to serve with the Maryland State Department Education um, Task Force for elevating the achievement of African-American boys and um, a project that we're pretty proud of right now as Dr. McKnight mentioned at the very beginning is that we've been doing forums with young men across the district and over the last three weeks we've held what is called the Bond Virtual Learning and Leadership Summer Institute and so 
This is a program in which we are focused on social emotional learning, uh, cultural identity, leadership, and current events. And we, we, we just understand that um, during this time of COVID, during the time of, of racial unrest that has taken place in our country, we knew that if we needed a space to talk about these things, we certainly needed to, to provide a space for our young men. And that really takes us full circle to what Damon mentioned about um, our theory of practice. If, if, um, if school was a better experience, experience for children of color, then maybe more of them would want to be teachers. And through these positive interactions, maybe that is what will occur uh, with the young men who are part of our institute. So that concludes our, our portion of um, speaking to the Bond Project. And I will now transition to Dr. McKnight. Dr. Howard, Dr. McKnight, can I say one thing? I just want to underscore something I think that Dr. Howard and I might have glossed over, that the work that Bond members do, including the work of Daryl and myself and Daryl and I, are, are often voluntary. So we all have day jobs. We're all just committed to this cause. Um, so we, when we go out to speak, we support the young men. Like oftentimes, there, there are no, there are no pay benefits for that. We just get the benefit from the work. Thank you so much for your for those comments, uh, Dr. Harris. And I'd like to thank Ms. Edwards, uh, Drs. Stanislaw, Statham, Harris, and Howard for modeling effective communication, collaboration, coordination of the work to support school staff and students. Um, I, one of the things we wanted you to get from the presentation today is that while all of these are different efforts, they're all connected in some way to an overlap in cause of what the system desires to accomplish. Um, as I kept saying, we want to develop, recruit, retain, <laughs> I mean, there's no way to do all of that without all of these entities working together and coordinating their work to do just that and to make it meaningful for all of our employees in the system. So I'd like to thank them for sharing examples of what that looks like. Um, and our work together will definitely support our goal of, of continuing to do that in the system. Before we begin with the board discussion again, I want to, um, it's great to have Dr. Nixon on the line. Dr. Uh, Ms. Lempsey's, Ms. Lance Dempsey started this work uh, you know, as the leader of OHRD and, um, you know, I just look forward to us to being able to continue it. And I'm really interested in getting comments from the board as we move into our discussion and your thoughts around reimagining efforts and um, how we can further support this work in MCPS. So with that, I'll turn it over to you, Ms. Evans. Thank you. We've had a really great day of presentations. I want to thank all of our presenters today. And I'm going to start um, with Dr. Daka to ask um, questions, comments, and then we'll go around the and then I'll go around each board. Well, thank you. Um, I just, oh, I'm just so pleased that the uh, information that we're getting about hiring and retaining is really important and really uh, looking ahead. Thank you, Ms. Edwards and Dr. Stanislaus, and uh, I've had the pleasure of working with you on scholarships, and you're so very organized. Dr. Statham, it is wonderful to see you again. I've known her since she was in high school, so it's a real pleasure. And Dr. Harris and Dr. Howard, uh, the kind of work, your, your accomplishments are really impressive and so very helpful, and the kinds of things that you want to do uh, are really important uh, for our students, especially ones that really need the role models that you're providing. And I know you're doing a program this sum summer. And I also want to say welcome to Dr. Nixon, uh, who's taking on uh, human resources. Uh, I do have a human resources kind of question. Uh, at the hiring, do we tell people that they may not always be at the same school uh, well, anyhow, that's a question. And the, and the reason I did that was that we had that report from ERS where um, novice teachers and veteran teachers uh, are, well, novice teachers are in the schools that have the most needs and then the uh, veteran teachers are somewhere else and can we mix them up and how are we going to do that? And I think we're working with MCEA on that, but I do think it's important for people to know that they are not always going to be tied to the same school. But thank you for this opportunity. 
Thank you, Dr. Doc. And I know Ms. Edwards wanted to say that that is definitely an effort that we're working on with our associations. Um, we brought forward and talked about that being a, a shared priority that we all have. So I appreciate you for elevating that. I know I was, when uh, Ms. Evans and I were recently at one of the recruitment events, we had uh, uh, some folks there who represented dual certification in a number of different areas and actually came in having the desire to work into different schools to get different experiences to really figure out their niche. So um, I'll let Ms. Edwards just, just speak to that because I do know that they, they have some specific circumstances in which they work with new staff around that. Thank you, Dr. Doctor, Daka and Dr. McKnight. Yes, we do share with employees as they come in that sometimes where you start off may not be where you end up. Um, what we try to do is really think about and conceptualize, is this employee a great match for our school system? And looking at their characteristics and being able to really look at what we're looking for in terms of our employees, as well as working with um, professional growth systems to be able to support them in any way as well when they work with their consulting teachers, as well as when they go through new educator orientation. As Dr. McKnight said, we often have teachers who come to us who are dual certified or tri-certified and really are trying to determine what they want to do and often find themselves between two locations. So they start to see the best of both worlds. Um, you are correct in terms of thinking about how we diversify the, the years of experience of our employees in many of our high need schools. And we are working with our associations around that. But I also do want to bring up that within our work groups, um, we will definitely have to be able to tackle that question. As Dr. Stanislaus and I've worked with our different work groups, we continually keep the focus and come back to looking at how we look through that equitable lens. Um, and we still have some, some things that we do need to do. So we do you bring up our system priorities when we are to happen? Okay, thank you. And Dr. Doctor, do you have any more questions? Or was that was that it? Okay, okay. So now we'll go to Ms. Sebastian. Okay, I don't hear her, so we'll come back to her. We'll go to Mr. Asante. I just want to thank everyone who gave their presentation. It was very informative, learning about the human uh, resource aspect. And I also wanted to especially um, shout out uh, Dr. Howard and Dr. Harris for the work that they're doing. I know as a uh, student of color, a male student of color, I haven't had teachers who have looked like me, and I haven't had um, I haven't seen other male students of colors in a lot of my more accelerated classes. So I really appreciate the work that you're doing, and I hope. I'm excited to see where that work will take the system. Thank you, Mr. Asante. Ms. Dixon. So uh, thank you very much. I'm just wondering if we could get a copy of the slide uh, presentation. Uh, I do see that we are uh, making some, uh, well, moving the needle. Can, can you hear me? Can you hear me? There's a slight echo that we can hear. Oh, you okay. Yeah, so no, I see we are making uh, some progress in terms of hiring uh, more teachers of uh, color. Um, I, I would love to see that, uh, you know, um, total about 50% uh, and then, you know, 50% uh, of the teachers being white as well. I think we're still up in the 60s there. But I'm just curious, um, you know, about the recruiting that we're doing. Um, so, you know, living in the DMV, um, are we uh, casting our net and uh, taking a look at schools? So, for example, let's say in D.C., um, recruiting at Trinity, AU, Georgetown, George Washington, Howard, uh, UDC, uh, and then uh, certainly in Maryland, uh, the University of Maryland, UMBC, St. John's, Bowie, Morgan State, among colleges. And then uh, in the past two, um, I think we've talked about this when we have talked in maybe some of our three by threes, um, 
you know, with Dr. Uh, Smith, but I think very close by we have, um, you know, a consortium there, uh, two and a half hours away at Bryn Mawr, Swarthmore, Haverford College, University of Pennsylvania, and Villanova. And the great things about those colleges are that uh, they have a big uh, international student population as well and do uh, a great job, I think, of uh, recruiting students of color. So I'm just curious about, um, you know, our recruitment efforts and, um, you know, how, how those are going and whether we've reached out, uh, you know, to students in uh, those colleges. And then also, uh, I see that, you know, we have the Puerto Rican uh, collaboration, but what about some of the English speaking um, countries in the Caribbean and, you know, um, whether we could get some uh, teachers of color from uh, those, some of those nations down there as well. Thank you, Ms. Dixon. Um, you bring up some great points. Um, as I shared earlier, our recruitment schedule was only halfway done this year. We got up until about the first week of March and then the floor fell out on us and we had to find other ways in which to um, engage with our colleges and universities. Every year we pride ourselves in being able to visit at least twice a year every HBCU within Maryland, DC, Northern Virginia. Um, in addition to that, all of the schools that you mentioned originally around where do we recruit, we actually go to all of those schools and we have, um, I want to call them more informal partnerships where we're either speaking to seminar classes, we're focused in with the alumni of the university, but really with those coordinators who are working with many of the student teachers and also looking at the STEM programs because those continue to be critical needs areas for us. The only school that we did not visit in your initial grouping was St. John's. Um, but we, um, for the fall, we did make in-person visits. And then for the spring, we engaged many locations, either through virtual seminars where we were able to go into those student teaching courses. We had some schools um, such as Morgan State who hosted a virtual opportunity for us. And then there were some schools who were more focused on, they just needed to provide the experiences for their student teachers and determine how to close. So we, we wanted to be respectful, but we still engage with the students in those particular courses um, so that we were memorable and that they knew that we are still hiring and interested. The Pennsylvania schools, we have not done as much direct work with them, especially with the schools that you mentioned with those diverse populations. So it does create an opportunity for us. The one thing that we do have to do intentional about with our recruitment um, that we have been able to do is to really look at the return on investment and determine the best way to really infuse with those uh, colleges and universities, whether it be in person, um, online, or whether we are directly emailing specific students at those locations. Um, the, the Caribbean students also brings up a good location for us to be able to look at. We had focused on Puerto Rico for the last couple of years, primarily because the schools within Puerto Rico are in a true immersion bilingual environment where right. teachers are doing, you know, specifically what we have within our schools. And so it created an opportunity to have professionals who are already doing this and are masters at what they do with our with their students from K-12 and to bring them to MCPS to be able to continue to just um, really make our system stronger and with the fabric um, of who we are as a collective unit. Um, so it is time for us to take a different look. Um, we had only focused on, um, I think it was St. Thomas, the one year uh, where there was a weather-related emergency within that particular area. And we were able to hire about maybe three to five teachers 
um, during that time, but our direct efforts have been with Puerto Rico. We have a great opportunity with our supervisor strategic recruit coming in to be able to really expand the network and to be able to look at locations where we have not had an opportunity to tap in and really to see the needs of teachers as well as the need for people to possibly relocate depending on how the school system is structured and are just looking for a different opportunity. All right. So, and if I could just leave you with um, one other uh, little nugget for thought. Um, so when I was a teacher at Springbrook, uh, going to Springbrook, um, the new teachers were given a professional partner. Uh, that was another teacher who was on the staff, someone that you could go to, um, you know, just to ask questions, uh, usually in your department, uh, not anyone who evaluated you or anything, but that you could talk with about uh, anything. And I think it would be wonderful for new teachers coming in to have a professional partner, uh, you know, maybe of the same ethnic group, but it's not necessarily, that's not necessarily the case. Um, uh, the one, the teacher that I had, uh, we're still friends today. Uh, she's retired now, living in Lewis, Delaware. But um, it was just wonderful to have someone that you could go to and talk to and uh, who didn't, uh, you know, evaluate you in any way uh, like that. And, and I think that's one of the ways to retain people, uh, you know, as well, uh, because, you know, those friendships that are made at the school, in the schoolhouse, uh, they do endure over time. So thank you very much. And uh, I look forward to seeing, uh, you know, as I said, some movement in terms of uh, diversifying the teaching force. Thank you, Ms. Dixon. I did want to interject one comment based on Ms. Dixon's question. A part of this reimagining is she posed a question around recruitment in those particular areas. Right now, we don't have recruiters. Kind of hired one today, <laughs> appointed one today. And we have Dr. Statham who started just a couple of months ago on how we build those partnerships. But essentially we have staffers who have been recruiting. And so a big part of us looking at our structure and processes really focuses in on how do we meet that human strategic plan measure in a current structure like having our staffers really do the recruiting um, has been an area that we've looked at. So thank you again for raising that mistake. Right. Yeah, I think I, I can remember doing some recruiting for MCPS going to the University of Pittsburgh when I was an assistant principal, I think at WJ. Um, so, you know, uh, get your principals and your APs and, uh, you know, I know this all takes money, but uh, I, I think it's really an important piece. Thank you, Ms. Dixon. Um, Mrs. Swanowski. Yes, so thank you all very much for the presentation. Um, first of all, it's great to see all of you um, this evening. Um, I really am so grateful for this work that you're doing because it is so, so important. Um, I can never say enough about um, how fabulous our bond program is, our project is, uh, program. Um, they frankly are a model, in my opinion, for the whole country. And um, uh, we attended a presentation at NSBA um, with them and I was talking to them about um, their budgeting. And I know again, as to Ms. Dixon's point, a lot of these things take money, but it would be great if we could help support them in continuing to um, help with the recruitment stuff. And I loved, um, Ms. Dixon's uh, idea about bringing, but the um, the partners and the um, for staff partners. Um, I want to just really quickly ask about um, in reference to our growing our own type of process and what we're involved. I'm I'm sure Dr. Statham remembers and some of my colleagues. I don't know. It was like five or six years ago. Um, we were working with uh, Dr. Zuckerman and Dr. Navarro and stuff to try and pilot a. a grow your own workforce thing. Um, and we had talked about um, providing, trying to just come up with a way where we could provide scholarships for some of our students. Um, I frequently visit um, ESOL classrooms and um, in talking to the students about what they wanna be and all of that kind of stuff, the ones who have, many of the ones who have 
indicated that they'd be interested in teaching um, have also indicated that they didn't see it as a reality because of not being able to afford to go to school. Um, and so um, I know that I think it's the um, Mount St. Mary's um, does some sort of program where they offer a scholarship up front, which is what these, because it's not a payback scholarship wouldn't work because it's about having the money to actually go. So they would, it would be a upfront scholarship and then it would be a return on the investment type of thing. So they commit, the students commit to, I think it's five years and they might not even do this anymore. This was years ago that I heard about this program, but, um, and, you know, then they commit to working in the system for a, an extended amount of however long the system would determine. Um, I'm just curious if we're still considering anything like that or looking at anything like that or working on anything like that. I can respond to that, Ms. Smodorowski. The sure. most uh, dynamic, we have two actual parts of that. One is through our support for our support professionals. And we've been doing a lot of work and that's really grown tremendously. And then also in the last three years, we've been growing our relationship with Montgomery College. Uh -huh. So three years ago, two, eight students graduated with an associate's degree and a high school diploma. A year later, you know, in 19, uh, 14 graduated. This year, almost 50 graduated. And if we stay on the path we're on now, over 1,100 Montgomery County public school students will graduate with an associate's degree and a high school diploma simultaneously in 2023. And awesome. we've been designing uh, programs that will lead them into teacher uh, preparation programs if they're so inclined. Um, and so that's been part of that work is creating that also creating the Teacher Academy of Maryland uh, programs across our high schools. We had a few small ones, but we're trying to build those. So it's a much more vibrant uh, career path in our in our high schools too. Well, that's good. Yeah, I, I'm appreciative of the work with the CTE, um, trying to develop a pathway for us to um, have teachers. But um, I just I I always worry about the funding aspect being. But I, I forgot about the AA partnership with Montgomery College because that's phenomenal. It saves a lot of money um, and opens doors yeah, for. It, it, opens tremendous doors for our students. Exactly. To, to go there, basically. Yeah, exactly. I do just remember that back back then, the chart that, um, one of the slides that showed the chart of where the uh, our high school alumni that are coming back to teach for us, um, I, I remember that we looked at trying to target the bottom half of the schools that had the fewest um, to see if we could spark some more interest in, in that kind of stuff. So um, I just always was very hopeful that that kind of thing might take off. But so I'm just replanting it in our minds. <laughs> but thank you very much for the presentation and for the work you all are doing. Thank you, Ms. Wolf. I wanted to thank you for the presentation. You really covered a lot of material. Um, the recruitment, it looks like it's going very well. The um, training is very clear. But for my, my concern has always been retention. It's very good to hire people every year, but we've got to retain them, particularly if we're trying to improve our diversity numbers. And I was wondering when we will get a report on the retention for the last, last year. I'm particularly interested in those that we hire in the same year that they decide to leave. Ms. Wolf, I know a big part of what we were looking at in this uh, whole work of reimagining is one to delve into looking at who are those people that even the reasons that, uh, as you brought forward, that, that influenced them leaving, and how does that then change what we should in our retention plan? We're coming back to the board um, in November to actually make recommendations. We'll actually bring that back and make recommendations about what we're going to do to inform that through the reimagining work um, for OHRD. So um, I know we've talked about a number of things like exit surveys, but how do we figure out who those groups are? Most importantly, what's the workforce in which we see that happening more often than not, um, you know, depending on the role, because that also speaks to, well, if, there, if we see more influx happening in a particular role in our system than another, 
what are the conditions within that that influences that. So that will be a, a, a part of what we bring back to the board as it falls under us uh, pulling back the layers of, of that work as well and what it um, implies for our moving forward. And I hope you're gonna tie that to the climate of the school that you're looking at. Um, I know it's very hard to get that good, get good information from new teachers on that, but I also think it's important to get information from them, particularly if they they leave in the same year. Right. Um, I don't know, and I'm pretty sure you do do some sort of exit interview, but could we get some information about what you're finding out from the exit interviews if you're doing them? Hi, and as you said it so eloquently, Ms. Wolf, this is also a part of the <laughs> anti-racism uh, audit that we do because I'm, I'm sure in that work there will be things that come up in which we have to look at what the impact is in all rules in MCPS. So yes, to answer your question, absolutely. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you Ms. Wolf. I'm going to go back to Ms. Silvestre. I skipped over and I want to make sure she has an uh, opportunity to comment. Ask Can you hear me? Can. Okay, great. Um, um, thank you for the presentation. Um, I wanted to ask for some follow-up data. You don't have to answer now, but um, the percent increases are for the current year, but I wanted, it's always helpful to see how it compares to um, previous years. So if you could give us um, the data on the diversity hires for the last five years, um, that would help us to see where the trend is going. Um, I had also heard that the retention of teachers that come to MCPS from out of state is not good. So if you also have this five-year data for um, teachers that came to MCPS from out of state, what states and um, what their retention rate is, that would be very helpful. Um, I'm very um, interested to see if there's a report or any recommendations that came out of the reimagining work group. Um, I appreciate the slides with uh, some of the information that was shared today, but if you have a report or a set of recommendations, I would, I would appreciate um, looking over that information. Um, the same with the uh, Grow Your Own that Dr. Smith uh, mentioned. Um, I know that's that's a dual enrollment program, if I'm not mistaken, and um, just wanted to have in writing what Dr. Smith shared in terms of the numbers um, and how many are actually pursuing degrees in education. Um, the the list of schools that are uh, we're hiring teachers from is actually kind of surprising. I mean, not, none from Blair, that's that's very surprising. Um, so anyway, I'm a big proponent of Grow Your Own. So um, just wanted to better understand what we're calling Grow Your Own today. I recall what Ms. Mondrowski mentioned from five or six years ago where we were actually talking to our own students about going into education and helping them get funding, uh, financing for that. I'm not saying that's the model, but um, you know, she's talking about ESOL kids, and I wonder how many ESOL kids are actually benefiting from the, our current grow your own, um, grow your own efforts. Um, so uh, that's a lot. So um, I'll stop there. Thank you, Ms. Silvestri. This, uh, the reimagining work group is actually still very much in session. We'll be bringing all of the findings and recommendations back to the board in November, and I believe it's November 10th that uh, we will come back and we will, of course, follow up and share um, some of those data points or all of those data points that you mentioned and requested. Okay, thank you. Mrs. O'Neill, I didn't forget about you. Yes. That. Thank you uh, for the presentation and thank you for persevering through this very difficult recruiting season. Uh, who knew that reimagining would include dealing with a pandemic and its description? Um, Ms. Uh, Dixon pointed out about uh, te new teachers in a building 
having someone, uh, a relationship. And at one point we were doing stipends for mentors in buildings so that, you know, uh, not only did teach new teachers have a consulting teacher, but they also had a mentor in that building because, you know, especially if you're new to Montgomery County Public Schools, new to teaching, all of those supports really help. And I, I do recall one young man who came to, to us from Penn State and he talked about his friends from Penn State going to other school districts and having the experience of crying in the parking lot at the end of the day because they felt so isolated and alone. So, you know, the consulting teacher is one tool through the professional growth system, but also having a mentor, a buddy in those buildings. Um, and particularly like the bond project is so incredibly important, supporting our males of color who are particularly isolated. So thank you all and, you know, keep up the good work and hopefully the pandemic gods will turn the corner with a vaccine and more sufficient treatments. Thank you. Mrs. O'Neill, just to share, we do have a, a relatively robust uh, mentoring program still in place. Last year, we um, supported over 750 teachers and we had about 693 um, mentors. So we do have that uh, program in the building where the teachers do, those mentor teachers, they do receive a stipend. They not only receive a stipend, but they engage in training as well. Uh, we have uh, uh, one credit course that we offer, a three credit course that we offer, and we also offer forums because we just feel it's very important that they have the skill set to coach others. So we do have a mentor program in the building. Not every brand new teacher gets a mentor. However, uh, they do get a consulting teacher. Um, and we have been known that if, if someone says, you know, I, I think this person would also benefit from a mentor in the building, we provide that as well. So we, we're certainly wrapping our arms around our new teachers um, because we do want them to be very successful. Good, thank you so much. I'm happy to hear that. You're welcome. And, and Ms. Evans, if I, if I could just add one, one quick sure. about that, because I want to make sure that while uh, Dr. Howard and I are here, that we make sure we, we emphasize the importance of considering race and gender with the parents of mentors. And I know Ms. O'Neill and Ms. Dixon both um, alluded to that. One of the, the line that gets us often, that, that we say often, is one of our guys, Brian Cadogan, who's now took sabbatical to go teach in Dubai for a little bit. But he, he says, my, my district assigned mentor is a great person. Like she's very knowledgeable. It's, it's beautiful. Our relationship is beautiful. He said, but my district, my district assigned mentor can hear me, but she can't feel me. And I need to be in the space where people feel me, which is just a different thing, which is why we are, we push so hard for the work that we do. Thank you. Dr. Howard, do you have anything to add to that? I, didn't, I, I saw you kind of lean up. I didn't know if you wanted to comment. I was just thinking about uh, uh, Mr. Asante's comments earlier about seeing people and connecting with people in a certain way. Um, and that, that's, that's why I started smiling. Um, and it, and since, since you offered me the opportunity to just say a word, um, speaking of putting leaders in front of individuals, um, I would love to uh, have Mr. Asante consider being our keynote speaker for our uh, virtual institute's uh, final program. So I'll just ask him to think about that in this moment so that some of the younger student, young men in our school system can see him as a leader and hear from him as well. Very if Ms. Evans. Add, I'm sorry, go ahead. No, I was just gonna say, Ms. Evans, um, you know, this professional partner that uh, the teachers had was assigned, I think by the resource teacher and the principal and it wasn't something that they paid for, you know? I mean, I don't you think you should have to 
pay for something like that. And once again, it was someone that was not, you know, well, didn't get paid, but, you know, they also didn't uh, evaluate you in any way. It was just like, you know, you could be yourself. Uh, it's like, you know, he said, hopefully somebody who can feel you, who you are, you know, and you can develop a friendship. Thank you, Ms. Dixon. I heard some voices. I don't, I don't know. I can't see everybody. We have two screens. So um, hopefully I'm not overlooking someone who wanted to speak. I was going to just jump in there and just say thank you to everybody that came today to present. I really appreciate um, all of our speakers, all the hard work that everyone in the system does on a daily basis, and in particular during COVID-19. I'll start with um, Ms. Mrs. Edwards and Dr. Stanislaus. You know, I you've been trying to, um, uh, working to reimagine and be creative in trying to recruit um, new educators or just um, a diverse staff in particular. I did enjoy coming to Bus Boys and Poets um, a little bit ago. And then uh, shortly after, like maybe a couple of days after, I was in the airport and one of the individuals that was there to, um, come to our recruitment event, had recognized me in the airport, stopped me and talked to me for a minute. They caught me off guard. I wasn't for sure who they were, but when they explained that we had just um, had the meetup at Bus Boys and Poets, I told them, very nice to see them. I hope they would, you know, come to MCPS, a great place to work. So I just want to commend you all for just being so creative and trying to think of, you know, new and innovative ways to go out and to attract um, people to come to MCPS. You know what I wanted to ask real quickly, because what I do know is that every year I do do come to NEO to speak to the new educators. We do the elementary um, uh, teachers and then we do secondary. What is that going to look like? I know we're doing it virtual, but it just seems so mind boggling that you all having to put this together um, virtually for over 800. I want to say there were 400 teachers at each level. I could be off some, but just give us a little bit of an idea what that will look like and how will you break all that up. All so, so we're, working, we're working very collaboratively with um, various offices. Um, the curriculum office, our office, equity, um, our directors, and we're really uh, looking at what are the courses and what are the hours uh, that we're going to provide for our new teachers. So there are a certain number of curriculum hours that the teachers will engage in the learning based on their grade level or their content area. So we're looking at that schedule right now. Um, it won't be a back-to-back -back like what you would find in a traditional setting. It will not be okay for six hours we have people sitting in front of a computer, um, you know, engaging in synchronous and asynchronous learning. Uh, we are breaking up the schedule to provide people with an opportunity to take a break in between and come back refreshed so that they can continue to engage in the learning. So we, we have um, over uh, approximately three days of onboarding that will take place. I'm happy to say that this year for the first time, we, we always had a third day for our special educators um, to engage in a, another level of learning just based on all of the paperwork and the work that they have to do uh, to support students. But this year we're also providing that same opportunity for our ESOL teachers as well. Uh, so they will have an additional day of training Training on that third day. So we're, we're just looking very closely at the schedule. It will not be back to back because we know adult learners do not learn that way. They need some time. They need space. They need to move around and come back to it. Um, so my team and I are working closely with uh, the curriculum office to ensure that we're meeting the needs of what they need to do. And of course, all of the other needs like the training that's done. Uh, we have a training that we offer uh, from MCEA offers a training and then we do our um, our training around equity work and we offer professional growth systems training as well. So really it's almost like saying we have an A day, B day um, and we do a little bit of a flip flop to ensure that we have enough facilitators to support both the elementary 
uh, group and also the secondary group. So uh, we uh, we look like a duck in water, but you know the 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 <laughs> they they're they're, they're uh, paddling pretty quickly underneath. Um, but it's it's coming along really nicely, and it's only we're only able to do that. Uh, because of the coordination, communication, and, and those efforts from all of the stakeholders involved. So yes, we will be inviting you um, to, <laughs> to share some opening words. And I'm working closely with Chris Cram, and he's actually coordinating with his team and my team. And um, we're going to ensure that you are there to greet. Uh, we're inviting all of the individuals that we always invite to do a welcome to our teachers and we'll create a video and that will be up for teachers to review um, in between their trainings or at the start of their training. So we're excited about it. Okay, well, thank you in advance for all your hard work that I know you will um, put into making that a great effort for all of our new um, educators. and. Yes, and so thank you, Dr. Satan, for your presentation as well. Appreciate you. Haven't seen you in a while, right? Good to see everybody on Zoom. And then to Dr. Howard and Dr. Harris, thank you for all that you do. So in addition to working for our system, you do this volunteer work on the side. Um, can we just talk a little bit how we plan to um, include Bond to try to help? I know we talked about they code, they, um, they attend NEO. Um, orientation this year that'll be different because we won't have all of the resource tables that are typically there or will you have that online I'm not I'm not sure how that looks but um, you could but just how are we going to when I think about um, what bond is doing they do the I've attended the bond academy i know they've held it a couple times at argyle middle school which is the school that sierra just graduated from so you know time permitted i tried to get over there and it was a you know really great workshop that was open to anybody um, that could come and get some valuable professional development from a variety of educators higher educators of um, higher from higher um from our colleges nearby, universities, as well as um, people that devote a time in this, that are devoting their, committing their time in the school system. So I just wanted to know how we were gonna do that. And then I wanted to ask Dr. Howard and Dr. Harris, wasn't there a, some talk at one point in creating um, a bond network for our female um, educators of color? Did we do anything with that or no? We let Ms. Stanis, Dr. Stanislaus talk first about how we might fit, bond might fit within new NEO this year, or should we talk? Sure, I, I can just share a little bit. Um, with all of our partners, um, bond being one of them, we are asking each of our partners to share information about their organization, links, videos, things like that, so that we can have it in the electronic uh, binder that we're creating for our new teachers. So they will have that at their fingertips. Um, another way we were thinking, we're, would be to do like little vignettes um, that we would post on the new educator website so that um, if they're interested and want to know more information, they would see a small video clip from like a commercial in a sense from um, the, the individuals who run that particular organization. So we're definitely keeping our partnerships, you know, all of those tables that you see in the traditional setting of NEO, um, they're just basically going to be virtual tables now. Um, it is important that we keep those partnerships going. They are extremely meaningful, not only to uh, new teachers, but to all of us. And um, it's important that we, we let out new teachers know what resources outside of you know their schools and and just the trainings what other resources they have and other people that they can tap into um, for support so actually the the that request has already gone out to our partners and I think they have until Friday to get some information back to me for the electronic binder uh, so we're looking forward to having them as an active member um, in the NEO work that we're doing for our teachers this year. Okay, great. Thank you. Okay. And then in terms of the support network for the uh, ladies of color in the system, back in the fall, when we've, we've gotten um, requests for consideration for those, for that group, 
um, ever since we started. Uh, but we, because we said we don't want to run, we can't run that group. It has to be something that's run by the ladies. Um, sure. We provide a space of, of support, of companionship, um, of some technical assistance. So most recently in the fall, uh, November, I believe it was, we, Dr. Howard, um, Thomas Ryan, who's assistant principal at New Hampshire State Elementary, and I hosted uh, a group of ladies to share with them that opportunity um, in my, at my building in Wheaton Woods. And there were 45 ladies um, who showed up and we had a conversation. There were three ladies who said they, um, who sort of stepped up and said they were gonna take the, the steering of this group from there. I don't wanna say their names here because I'm not sure where, where they stand in the space. Um, there's, but I know that that work is being considered. And I think they're building the infrastructure behind the scenes um, before the pandemic. The okay. other part that is uh, there, Dr. Howard and I talked with some ladies who started, um, some Latinas who started a group called Cafecito. Um, and they, it's like a, a coffee group. And they meet regularly also um, and talk about and think through ways that they can support each other and partner with groups like Bond. Okay. Okay, great. Well, thank you all for the presentation today. We've enjoyed you. It's late, so we'll let you go at this time, and we will go on to the next item on our agenda. Thank you all. So we are at item eight, consent items. If there are items that board members want to pull, please let me know. Otherwise, I'll ask for a motion. Okay. Mr. Asante? Yeah, I just wanted to pull um, 8.2 and ask a quick question about that. Okay, so what we'll do is we, we'll pull 8.2, but can I get a motion to move the rest of the block? You're on mute. Move in block 8.1 and then 8.3 through 8.13. I second. Move and second it. All in favor by show of hands. And that is unanimous. Okay. 8.2. So uh, I'll just say that 8.2 is the um, California Network and Communications Telecom Program. So just so that you know the background, it is a new annual contract for the purchase of wireless mobile services and devices from T Mobile. And it's to be used for staff and students during the remote instruction. So essentially it was added for um, remote instruction purposes. Does that answer your question for 8.2? I also wanted to know how many devices would be received with this contract. Um, I'm not sure of the amount of the mobile devices, but we can find that out and certainly get back to you on that. That, that would be great. Thank you. Ms. Dasa, this is Jack Smith. This, this is to provide connectivity for students, right? It's the, it's the MiFi devices. Right. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. So I, I don't know the number. I'm sorry. The, uh, Mr. Asante, I think they are about $200 each. Um, and they come with, uh, I believe, two years of service, typically. That's what I know we were working with in the spring when we handed about uh, well over 6,000 of them out across the yeah. system. So we'll send a follow-up on this so everybody in the board will get it, okay? Is, uh, is this an increase from the amount that we had in the spring? Yes, it, we're going to continue to increase this summer because it's our intention to make sure everyone has what they need before uh, August 31st, first day of school. All right, thank you. Okay. Sure. Okay. If there are no further questions, then um, can I get a motion to move item 8.2? Uh, move 8.2. Is there a second? Second, this is Carla. Okay, it's been moved and seconded all in favor by a show of hands. And that is unanimous. Item nine is next on the agenda. On the agenda is items of information. So just for informational purposes, um, at item 10, Board of Education items, if I can get a motion to move items 10.1 through 10.3. Uh, 
I move items 10.1 through 10.3. I second. It's moved and seconded. All those in favor? And that is unanimous. And now we go to um, 10.4, the student member of the board education committees. And of course, I'm trying to pull it up. My, um, or my, my um, iPad just died, of course. I just read, I just need to read it. Hold on. Okay. So we have a the appointment of the student member of the board to the board committee, whereas the Board of Education Policy Committee is composed of not less than three board members serving staggered terms of three years, and whereas pursuant to the board policy, BFA policy setting, the board may appoint the student member of the board to serve as a fourth member of the board's policy committee, and whereas former student member of the board, Nathaniel Tenby's term on the board's policy management committee expired on June 30, 2020. Former student member of the board, Nathaniel Tenby's term on the board's strategic planning committee expired on June 30, 2020. Whereas student member of the board, Nicholas Asante, would like to serve on the board's communication and stakeholder engagement committee until his term ends on June 30, 2021. Now, therefore, be resolved that the student member of the board, Nicholas Asante, be appointed to serve as a member of the board's policy management committee. This term ends on June 30th, 2021, and be it further resolved that the, co the composition of the board's communication and stakeholder engagement committee be modified until June 30th, 2021, to allow the student member of the board, Nicholas Asante, to serve as the fourth member of the board's communication and stakeholder engagement committee until his term expires and be it further resolved that the student member of the board was Asante be appointed to serve as a member of the board's communication the committee until his term ends 2021. So if I can move, a, move approval. I second. Move all in favor by a show of hands. And that is unanimous. Welcome to the committees, Mr. Asante. So at this time, we are at item 10.5 for new business items. If what has a, a new business item to bring forward, this, this is the time to do so. Should I go first, Madam President? Yes, Ms. Dixon. Thank you. Um, <clears throat> I'd like to uh, offer this resolution uh, on behalf of the Board of Education. Um, uh, on uh, examining student achievement data for English speakers of other languages, ESOL, and uh, Latino student achievement. Uh, we know we have had work groups in 2017 and 2019 on recommendations on uh, ESOL instruction. Uh, and this resolution is not intended to dismiss the work that has already been done on ESOL instruction, but to signal the board's belief in the urgency of the task before us on the need for improvement in ESOL instruction and Latino student achievement. Whereas approximately 18% of the students enrolled in Montgomery County Public Schools, MCPS, received ESOL services during the 2019-2020 school year, and Latino students represent approximately 32% of the total student population. And whereas during fiscal year 2020, direct expenditures used to support the MCPS ESOL program totaled $83,410,452. This expenditure does not include indirect support costs 
such as overhead transportation, general education, and other related costs. And whereas ESOL students, and more specifically, limited proficient, limited English proficient students have struggled to attain proficiency on state math and literacy assessments and continue to underperform as compared to their English proficient peers. And whereas the MCPS Latino student population continues to underperform as compared to white, Asian, and African-American students overall, including a lower graduation rate. And whereas between 2017 and 2019, MCPS work groups conducted research on ESOL instruction at the elementary and secondary school levels and acknowledged that the uh, longstanding educational me methodologies and models that have been used for the delivery of ESOL instruction may not be tailored to suit the needs of the current ESOL student population. And whereas it is imperative that MCPS continue to build on the findings and recommendations contained in the studies conducted by these work groups and implement them to improve the ESOL program and Latino student achievement. And whereas the Board of Education is committed to educational equity, the academic achievement of all students and the prudent expenditure of public funds. And whereas the Board of Education is interested in exploring innovative educational models to more fully support the immediate academic achievement of the ESOL and Latino student populations and the most efficient investment of resources to support these programs. Now, therefore, be it resolved. Pull my light over here. The Board of Education directs the superintendent to convene a commission of stakeholders to one, review all aspects of the current ESOL model, including student achievement outcomes, and review the findings and recommendations of the work groups referenced herein to, term, to determine what is working and what needs to be improved. And two, conduct a thorough review and analysis of the data related to Latino student achievement, review and update benchmarking data that compares the MCPS ESOL model and its student achievement outcomes with models used by comparable school districts and make recommendations to improve student achievement for both student populations. Be it further resolved that the board, of, board recommends that the superintendent hire an outside expert at a cost not to exceed $50,000 with specific expertise in ESOL instruction and Latino student achievement, who will coordinate and facilitate the work of this commission and provide an external review of the MCPS model and outcomes. The work group shall take the last name of the expert and be known as the expert's last name, Commission on ESOL Instruction and Latino Student Achievement. The, commis the commission shall be comprised of the following stakeholders. One, MCPS central office, ESOL and curriculum staff. Two, six individuals appointed by each of the three employee associations. Two members from each association representing elementary, middle and high school levels to serve on the commission. The commission shall also include parents, students and stakeholders nominated by community groups that have de demonstrated effectiveness in serving the needs of the ESOL and Latino student populations. Be it further resolved that the commission shall review the current literature and best practices regarding the needs of English language learners and Latino student achievement and shall issue a final report of findings and recommendations. The board requests that the report be issued by March 31st, 2021, which may be extended or delayed if necessary due to ongoing COVID-19 health concerns. And, and the report should be in both English and Spanish. The Board of Education will receive annual updates on the implementation of the recommendations 
and the commission members will be invited to attend and testify. That concludes the resolution. I'll second that. I have to move approval. Oh, I thought she was moving the approval, sorry. Oh. She had to remove approval. <laughs> so it's been moved and seconded. Um, okay. Is there any discussion, any comments, questions? Okay. Seeing none, it's been moved and seconded all in favor, show by show of hands. And that is unanimous. Thank you. Uh, so I have another um, resolution that I'd like to move. Go ahead. You said you're going to read it. What did you say? Oh, I, I was. I didn't know if you were. No, I, no. It's go okay ahead. for me to go. <laughs> yes. Yes. Okay. Not soon. So I do have a re have a resolution that I would like to move um, forward on behalf of the board um, of education. Um, this is really. Um, all about equity of access and opportunities for all students. Um, I've worked closely with uh, the Black and Brown Coalition and uh, comes from a lot of feedback from a lot of um, stakeholders. Um, there are a couple of um, a, um, amendments, um, friendly amendments that I'd like to propose. Um, and there's a couple, uh, two typos of that I'd like to fix if that's okay. I don't know exactly what the um, procedure is for that. Anyone? Okay, I'll just, I'm gonna offer an amendment and then that- um, Well, the, hold on, can I ask you a question? Can I ask you a question? So you sure. have to offer an amendment, but- I'm, I mean, I can read it the if, way it is, but there's a cup there, I just, as I was rereading it, there's, um, a couple of I, I'm I want to make an amendment to the last sentence most well, specifically. It hasn't been read into the record yet. Okay, that's why so I was saying read, do I need to read it the way it is. Whatever it is you want to change, read that into it now, and that becomes the resolution. As you haven't moved anything yet. There's nothing out there in the public record. Okay, so, so I can just read it the way I want it to be then, right? Yes. Okay. Perfect. Okay. So then um, I would like to all read the, go ahead and read this. Um, it's uh, the strategic expansion of distance learning capabilities to increase district-wide access to unique teaching and learning opportunities. So whereas on March 12th, 2020, by order of the Maryland Governor Lawrence J. Hogan Jr., all Maryland public schools were ordered closed. And on March 30th, 2020, he issued a stay-at-home stay order closing buildings and facilities. In accordance with these orders, Montgomery County Public Schools converted its instructional delivery from an in-person model to a distance learning model. And whereas on May 6, 2020, the Maryland Governor Lawrence J. J. Hogan Jr. and the Maryland State Superintendent of Schools, Karen B. Solomon, announced that all Maryland schools would remain closed for the remainder of the academic 2019 2020 school year. And whereas Montgomery County Public Schools mounted a tremendous effort to ensure that students had access to technology necessary to the delivery of instruction, distributing more than 83,912 Chromebooks and 6,383 MiFi connections since June 2020. Online learning continued in Montgomery County Public Schools until June 15, 2020 the last day of school for students. And whereas Montgomery County Public Schools had the opportunity to experience delivering distance learning at the elementary, middle, and high school levels using multiple platforms and both synchronistic and asynchronistic instruction, and students had the opportunity to become familiar with remote learning. And whereas equity and access are values of the school system and essential to our mission, and distance learning offers the possibility of providing more equitable access and opportunities to instruction. 
And whereas the experience with implementing the continuity of learning plan provided many opportunities to explore innovative ways to provide instructional content in a remote environment for thousands of students, these experiences can serve as a springboard for integrating technology and remote learning into the school system's standard operating procedures. And whereas Montgomery County Public Schools has received a significant amount of stakeholder input from students, parents, and staff about the effectiveness of various components, approaches, and delivery methods, now therefore be it resolved that the Board of Education direct the Superintendent of Schools to review the effectiveness of various components, approaches, and delivery methods, and identify how the current distance learning infrastructure and institutional learnings can enhance the school system's ability to efficiently offer students district-wide access to unique teaching and learning opportunities as it returns to the traditional functioning, and make recommendations to the Board of Education for increased and innovative use of distance learning to increase access and opportunity, including, or opportunity to all, including, but not limited to um, virtual learning. And that's all. Is there a motion? Oh, I thought it was, I. Oh yeah, so is there a second? I second. It's been moved and seconded. Is there any discussion? Ms. Yes. Can make a comment. Yes, you can. I, this. I, uh, I actually think we need to delay on doing this about this motion and evaluation. You know, we are we are not returning to uh, in person learning right immediately. We know that there were a lot of stakeholders who were, who were very unhappy with our program this spring and it was built, you know, we turned on a dime and had to stand up a program. I think there are many opportunities because, you know, like we shouldn't have snow days in the future, but, you know, they've taken some lessons. We heard it in the presentation about reopening of schools. We know that we're gonna have the first week, at least virtually. We know that we have summer school going on right now, virtually. I think that we need to delay doing such an evaluation until a bit later. I don't know when that is. I think there are lessons to be learned. I think we should also look at what other districts have done, but I want us focused on building an effective program in the event that the, we don't move from um, phase two to phase three or four. And I, I, I just think I'm gonna abstain because I don't think now is the time to do this. I, can I just clarify something? Because I think maybe, I don't know if it's the wording or if I didn't explain. This is actually about virtual learning. It's not, I mean, this is about how, so what we're doing right now and what we're getting ready to be doing with, you know, I'm specifically even um, hopeful. The reason I wanted to do it now is because we're going to be starting the fall virtually. And we, who knows, we could, it could end up being a long time virtually. I, I don't know, but that's what this is. Was, you know, I so. understand that it's about virtual learning. Okay. I understand. And, you know, I understand it's about taking lessons learned, but I, you know, it takes staff to do this and they're focused, you know, they, I mean, I had a conversation with Ms. Silvestri about how much better the summer program is going. Mm -hmm. And so I, I want to wait. I'm not going to, okay. I'm not prepared to start with this evaluation yet. Okay. Dr. Dr. Smith oh. respond quickly? He can. He will. Okay. Dr. Smith. Smith. Let's stop. Do you want to respond before Ms. Wolf? Ms. Wolf? I, I just wanted to second what uh, Ms. O'Neill said. I do know that it was the intent and we had requested before that they come back with some sort of evaluation of the virtual learning program, but they need a little bit more information than they currently have. So I think the timing on this is not really good. That's it, thank you. Ms. Dixon. 
No, I was just going to say, um, uh, Rebecca, did you have a time frame in mind when you wanted that? Um, well, in discussing it with um, with Dr. Smith and, and staff, um, I'm leaving it to them to, it was more of a, got, you know, an idea, an opportunity for them to look at what's working so that when we go virtual in the fall, um, there would be the potential for more access and opportunity for all students and um, the ability for all students to be able to participate in courses that they might not normally have had the opportunity to do since we are going to be starting virtually. I, I was just going to say that I don't see any any possibility. The resolution references the current infrastructure and there essentially was no infrastructure uh, you know, uh, in March when we started this. And what we did in the spring was very much a crisis response. We're beginning to try and build out an infrastructure to start August 31st. The summer continues to be a lot of different uh, systems. And we're trying to bring those together to create a cohesive uh, uh, program for students, you know, each week, whether they're in a a virtual environment or a hybrid environment. Um, and we know they're all going to start for some period of time in a virtual environment. So I, I would think until at least the second half of the year, we'd have no capacity to do this because we're creating the first thing. And this is an, a request uh, for us to look at the first thing and see where there are opportunities to expand it and refine it. And so first we have to build it and make it work and tweak it. And, and it's frankly consuming the staff and um, it, it's uh, it's consuming lots and lots and lots of hours. And I, I worry about my staff's capacity to keep operating at the level they're operating at right now all the time, every day, every night, every weekend. And it's a problem folks. So I would say the second half of the year is when we could probably begin to do this realistically. So I don't want you to pass it and expect that we're gonna have something for you in September, October, even November, while we're trying to do what we're trying to do right now. But it is obviously your decision. Those are my thoughts. Well, I think one of the things that um, uh, Ms. Mondrowski is trying to do is um, see how we can use um, <clears throat> you know, virtual learning to increase the number of courses that students might be able to take, uh, you know, at different schools and things like that, which I think is, uh, you know, a good goal. Maybe um, what we should do is uh, table this until, uh, you know, we have gotten through all the work that you've done to prepare and, you know, because I mean, you're still learning as you go along with all of this, what's possible, what's not possible. And, um, you know, wait till, I guess the pandemic is over. <laughs> and I don't want to be misunderstood. I think it's a great goal. Right. I'm yeah, totally I think so too. Goal. I'm just saying, yeah. I see no capacity to get it done during first semester. Right. Of this okay. Year. That's all. Okay. All right. This is O'Neill. Yeah, I mean, I think I think the resolution needs some more work because I think it's not totally clear about that aspirational goal. I mean, I do think, you know, we're, we've talked about, you know, if you're taking multivariable calculus in one school and it's not offered in my school, uh, that I should right. be able to access right. it. Okay. It's not explicit in this resolution. And just as I, I said, know, I the other issue it. about remote learning for snow days. So I think the resolution needs some assistance. I think the evaluative purpose needs to be done, deferred until a bit later so that we're not distracting the staff. I, I would suggest that Ms. Mondraski Move to table. Re retract the motion for now, continue sure. to work on it and possibly bring it back to the full board, like in October for action to evaluate a bit further down when things have settled down. Got it. Okay. So it's been rescinded. Um, the next item on our agenda is item 11, which is 
informational summary. This is for informational purposes. Um, a, a motion to adjourn. Um, uh, Ms. Evans, uh, yeah. since it's now uh, going up to seven uh, and we've been on since nine this morning, um, I just wanted to mention, am I mute? No, I just wanted to mention very quickly, um, you know, we have all of the retirees. We got a list of the retirees. And just to say thank you to all the people who have retired in Montgomery County. And I wanted to just single out uh, three who've worked like for 37.9 years. Ellen Brinsco, who taught science at Paint Branch, and then two at White Oak Middle School that I know who were just fabulous. Margaret Geyser Klein, who taught for, or well, she was a secretary and business or financial assistant uh, for 49.1 year. Wow. And uh, Sandra Woods, who taught PE for 49 years. I mean, anybody who does, you know, over 40 years, you know, 30 years plus, um, you know, we just appreciate you all. So just to say thank you to all our retirees, uh, really sorry that we couldn't have an in-person celebration. Uh, because I actually like the food that we serve there too, but uh, you know, uh, it's. Uh, but congratulations to all of you. Thank you, Ms. Dixon, for acknowledging our retirees. It's a good uh, move. Adjournment. Second. I second. Been moved and seconded. All in favor? By raise a hand. And that is unanimous. And so, have a good week. We'll see everybody later. Joining us. Uh,